For a knight to ascend to the esteemed rank of master, they must shatter entrenched stereotypes, often wielded like ancient swords in the realm of tradition. Enter Joshua Sanders, a legendary spear knight renowned as the great hero across the vast expanse of the Igrant continent. With valor unmatched, Joshua swiftly quelled the civil unrest plaguing the Avalon Empire. Yet, his tale takes a tragic turn as he falls victim to betrayal, poisoned by those he once trusted, his own superiors. In his final moments, surrounded by those who orchestrated his demise, Joshua implores them for answers. They reveal a twisted logic, citing his fervent devotion to mana, an energy diametrically opposed to the holy power revered by the empire. Such clashes within the body spell doom for ordinary souls, yet Joshua, fueled by his singular passion for spear mastery, clings to life. Confounded by the treachery of his superiors, Joshua's aspirations were never tainted by ambition for the throne. His only desire was to showcase the magnificence of the spear and alleviate the stigma of his birth as a concubine's son. As the echoes of civil strife fade into memory, Joshua finds himself in the company of Emperor Caesar von Britain, the stalwart guardian of the Avalon Empire. With a heavy heart, Joshua confronts his betrayers, seeking understanding amidst the tumult of his betrayal. It is then that Evergrant, master of the Tower of Magic, steps forth, shedding light on a darker truth. He warns of existential threats lurking in the shadows, threats so profound that even the newfound peace following the Civil War cannot shield the Empire from their malevolence. In the Emperor's pursuit of dominance, Joshua emerges as an obstacle, a force to be reckoned with. Even seasoned martial artists, honing their craft over decades, pale in comparison to Joshua's innate prowess, his mere presence casting a shadow of uncertainty over the Empire's ambitions. But Joshua can completely cover that massive spear, the size of two people, an aura. How many foes has Joshua slain with that spear? Evergrant further states that surpassing aura, a long time ago, he knew that Joshua had surpassed another wall. Suddenly, Joshua feels agonizing pain in his chest. When Evergrant thanks Joshua for everything up until now, stating that if it weren't for Joshua, they wouldn't be here today, he genuinely expresses gratitude. As they bid farewell to Joshua and leave, seeing him on his last breath, Joshua shouts from behind, saying that this is not the end of everything. Then, we see a magic explosion circle under Joshua. Shocked to see the magic explosion circle, Joshua thinks that at this speed, he only has five minutes at most. Frustrated, Joshua thinks that it's pointless. The legendary Spear Knight, once a title of honor, now feels false. Ultimately betrayed by his longtime friend, Joshua believed in, he now feels like just a second-rate knight destined to die namelessly in this forest. As Joshua tries to escape the range of the magic explosion circle, he senses mana from his spear named Lukia, the red spear known as the Grim Reaper of the battlefield. Trying his best to reach for the spear, Joshua thought that a special strength would be hidden inside it, but to think Lukia would reveal that strength in this moment. At that moment, Joshua couldn't think clearly. He simply tries his best to reach his spear. When Joshua finally reaches the spear, the magic explosion circle reaches its limit and explodes, causing a huge blast that even makes a massive hole in the ground. Now, in the Land of Knights, the Grand Duke of the Avalon Empire, Joshua Sanders, meets an empty fate that contradicts his fame as the undefeated Spear Knight. The scene shifts, and we see a kid waking up on a farm. It's Joshua. Confused about what's going on, Joshua wonders how he should have died in that explosion. Then Joshua runs outside and sees himself in the water reflection, realizing that Joshua's body has gotten younger. When Joshua checks his surroundings, he realizes that this is where Joshua lived in his previous life. Joshua thinks that he has returned to the past. Realizing this, Joshua smiles and thinks that another opportunity has come to him. In Joshua's previous life, because of Caesar von Britain, Joshua was killed. But in this life, things will be different. As Joshua was getting happy about getting another chance, three knights come to Joshua asking why Joshua isn't cleaning up around the horses as they told him to. Joshua recognizes these three knights. They are the Agnes Duchy's troops, the centurions Ralche, Lloyd, and Gort. Lloyd, with a serious expression, tells Joshua that he should answer when someone is talking to him. Ralche tells Lloyd that he has forgotten that Joshua can't talk. So of course, Joshua wouldn't be able to answer. Hearing this, Joshua thinks that he pretended as if he couldn't talk since he would get hit more if he opened his mouth. Lloyd looks around and says that he hasn't seen Lucia for a while. Ralche tells Lloyd to be quiet because what if the Duke hears about this, as the Duke looks after that maid Lucia once in a while. Hearing this, Joshua remembers his mother, Lucia, the exclusive maid of the Agnes Duchy. 
Joshua is the illegitimate child of the maid, who was held by Duke Agnes. Because the troops knew about that fact, they tormented Joshua, who had noble blood, venomously, and felt some kind of vicarious pleasure, especially these three who were in front of Joshua. Joshua had pledged to surely take revenge on them one day. Lloyd says to Joshua that he needs to see Alicia for some reason today. Ralche tells Lloyd to stop talking, as what if someone hears him? Lloyd tells Ralche not to worry as there is no one else here at this remote stable excluding this kid. Lloyd says that Duchess Vanessa said that even if they get rid of Lucia and this kid without anyone else knowing, then Duchess Vanessa would take responsibility. Lloyd says that right now is the best timing, but Lucia isn't here. They both say that since Lucia isn't here, let's play around with this kid. Hearing these three talking about his mother, Joshua, filled with anger, thinks that he has no intention of letting these bastards go who have insulted his mother. Joshua tries to channel mana into his hand, checking if he can still use mana. The way that Joshua performs the mana technique he learned is different from the normal ones before he regressed. The mana technique that Joshua discovered at the ancient ruins with his favorite spear, Lucia, allowed him to reach the peak quickly due to its amazing impact that could shake the world. The important thing is that the mana technique that Joshua practiced had a completely different operational method. This technique isn't done by accumulating mana in the mana hole located under the abdomen, as is typical, but by using the mana scattered in the surroundings. It's not limited by a small plate called the mana hole. Instead, it absorbs mana with the whole body. This technique also concentrates the mana where it is needed to burst it out in an instant. Joshua didn't go through the process of forming a mana hole that everyone who uses mana typically undergoes, and he skipped the process that takes others' years entirely. So, there is no helping Joshua's fast start as a mana user. Gort tells the others to surround Joshua and beat him up, expressing that his anger is going through the roof just by looking at Joshua's face. As Gort gets ready to attack Joshua, Joshua closes his eyes and starts to gather mana. Seeing Joshua standing with his eyes closed, they think he's scared. But in reality, Joshua is trying to gather a handful of mana to make a move. Before Joshua regressed, it took him 10 years to move this fistful of mana, but in this life, Joshua already knows how. Then, as Gort goes to attack Joshua, before he can strike, Joshua uses his mana fist and punches Gort right in the stomach, causing him to fall to the ground after taking the punch. Both Ralche and Lloyd are shocked to see this. Joshua, on the other hand, after using the mana fist, feels something sticky and disturbing in his abdomen. As Joshua feels the sensation under his abdomen, which should be completely empty, he is sure that it is something he couldn't feel before his regression. Seeing this, Lloyd comes forward, taking out his sword to attack Joshua. Joshua thinks that it's too dangerous to go against a trained soldier with a young physique wielding a longsword. However, if Joshua can knock out Lloyd, who is advancing towards him, then there is a chance that Ralche won't attack him, as Ralche was the most cautious out of these three. Joshua tries to use the mana fist one more time. As Lloyd charges at Joshua, Joshua quickly ducks Lloyd's attack and uses his mana fist once more, punching Lloyd right in the face, which knocks him out. Surprised to see this, Ralche thinks that who knew that a kid who can't even talk was hiding such power. It could be a coincidence once, but twice? Joshua, on the other hand, starts to feel intense pain with only using this much mana. He thinks that Ralche, someone who was promoted all the way to Centurion, has more than just skills. So, Ralche is no better than Lloyd and Gort. But even someone with Ralche's skills is dangerous. However, Joshua knows that he can't show Ralche his weak state. With a serious expression, Joshua tells Ralche to pass on this message. Ralche is shocked to hear Joshua talking. Joshua starts to walk towards Ralche and tells him that from this moment onwards, anyone who insults Joshua's mother, including Ralche, with Joshua's name on the line, Joshua will take them down. Scared to see Joshua like this, Ralche starts running. As Ralche leaves, Joshua starts to feel exhausted and falls to the ground. Then the scene shifts to the palace, where the workers discuss the rumor about a kid in the stables beating the crap out of three centurions. One worker says that young Master Joshua defeated three centurions even though he is five years younger than Master Babel. Something doesn't feel right. Another worker dismisses these rumors, saying they are all exaggerated. How could a kid who was abandoned by his family a few days ago possibly beat three centurions with his bare hands? The worker speculates that if the rumors are true, then the standings of Duke Agnes's children in the succession may change. Even if Joshua's skills are recognized, he will never be able to defeat young Master Babel. 
Another worker agrees, stating that young Master Babel is a mana user now, whereas even the great Duke Agnes, who is now a master, was 16 when he became a mana user. But young Master Babel is only 14 and already a mana user, indicating that he must be an outstanding genius who will surpass even Duke Agnes one day. So who could ever compete against young Master Babel for the succession? It's simply impossible. Then, as the worker turns, he is shocked to see Joshua. With a serious look, Joshua tells the worker to go and inform the Duke that Joshua Von Agnes has arrived. The scene then shifts to Duke Agnes's office, where Ralche is also present. The Duke asks Ralche about his affiliation, and Ralche responds that he is from the 29th Battalion. The Duke instructs Ralche to bring the armor to him. As Ralche hands the armor to Duke Agnes, the Duke is surprised to see that Joshua is the one who damaged it. The knight named Chiffon warns the soldier to think carefully before answering and threatens that any lies will not be forgiven. Ralche assures Chiffon that he has not spoken a single lie. Hearing this, Duke Agnes asks Chiffon for his opinion on the matter and then asks how old Joshua is. Chiffon says that Joshua is nine years old, and the Duke is surprised to think that Joshua destroyed a suit of armor made of orc leather at that age with his bare hands. Well, it's possible if Joshua used mana. Surprised, Chiffon tells the Duke that this is impossible because there has not been a single case of someone being able to use mana in a real fight by the age of nine in the continent's history. Even if young Master Joshua turned out to be an unprecedented genius in history, one must at least be a highly talented beer rank knight to cover their bare hands with mana. So, Chiffon simply cannot believe that the nine-year-old Joshua was able to successfully achieve that. It seems more likely that these people were scared of others finding out that they were bullying young Master Joshua and came up with a nonsensical excuse with their good-for-nothing brains. Chiffon says that if the Lord allows it, then Chiffon will drag this man outside and teach him a lesson in public to fix their troops' deteriorating discipline. Scared, Ralche says that everything Ralche just said is the truth. Hearing this, Chiffon tells Ralche to tell the truth, or Chiffon will take him down right now. Scared, Ralche stated that he have told nothing but the truth. But before Chiffon could act, Duke Agnes stops him. Chiffon says that they cannot leave Ralche be after he spread a rumor. Duke Agnes says that they will discover the truth once they meet the person in question. The Duke says that it's about time he met Joshua for the first time and that he will go and see Joshua himself. Hearing this, Chiffon is surprised to see that Duke Agnes will meet with Joshua personally just to see the son of a concubine, as Duke Agnes has never even shown such interest in young Master Babel, who is known as the Empire's greatest genius. The Duke asks Chiffon where Joshua is, and Chiffon says that he received news that Joshua has arrived at the palace, so Joshua must be inside the first floor's waiting room. Duke tells Chiffon to lead the way as they leave the office. Then the scene shifts to the Agnes Palace corridor, where Babel sees Joshua. Frustrated, Babel doesn't understand why Joshua is here. Babel asks Joshua what he's doing here, but Joshua doesn't listen. With a dark aura surrounding him, Joshua looks at the picture of the current emperor of Avalon, Marcus Van Britten. Whenever Joshua sees this portrait, anger surges from deep inside him. Caesar Van Britten, Joshua thinks, that he will definitely take his revenge. Thinking Joshua is ignoring him, Babel lunged towards Joshua with a clenched fist, but Joshua's reflexes were swift. He intercepted Babel's punch with a deft maneuver, seizing it before it could land. Babel is surprised to see Joshua's strength and aura emitting from him. Babel thinks that the rumor of Joshua beating three soldiers must be true. However, Babel thinks that he won't go down without a fight. But as Babel is about to attack Joshua with mana, the Duke comes in with Chiffon and asks Babel what he and Joshua are doing. Surprised to see his father, Babel quickly kneels and greets his father. Duke Agnes asks Babel what he was doing, and Babel says that he and Joshua were exchanging heartwarming greetings. Confused hearing this, the Duke turns his attention to Joshua. Seeing Joshua not greeting the Duke, Chiffon gets frustrated and tells Joshua to mind his manners. Duke stops Chiffon, saying that his gaze is filled with spite. Seeing this, Joshua thinks that seeing the portrait reminded him of that emperor, and now the anger boiling inside him is about to explode. Joshua realizes that this isn't good, as Duke Agnes doesn't easily let go of people who show hostility before him, especially if the hostile person in question is his child. To Joshua's surprise, Duke Agnes tells him that if he is calmed down, then he should come closer to the Duke because Duke Agnes wants to personally check whether Joshua truly used mana or not. Babel is surprised to hear this, thinking that this lowly Joshua can use mana. Chiffon says to the Duke that it's pointless. The Duke tells Joshua to come closer. 
Surprised, Joshua thinks that Duke Agnes is one of the five masters of the vast empire, and Duke Agnes is far more sensitive to mana than others. If Duke Agnes finds any abnormal symptoms in Joshua's body, then Joshua's plans will go down the drain. But to Joshua's surprise, the Duke comes and grabs Joshua's hand to check whether Joshua can use mana. As Duke Agnes was checking if Joshua could use mana, Joshua thought that if the mana-sensitive Duke Agnes found something that Joshua didn't know, then Joshua's plans would all have to be adjusted. But to Joshua's surprise, Duke Agnes couldn't sense any mana from Joshua. Hearing this, Babel smirked, thinking that Babel knew, as there was no way Joshua could use mana. Shaphan said to Duke that of course there shouldn't be any mana from the start. Duke replied to Shaphan that he wasn't talking about the mana hole because as a human, there should be at least some basic mana, even in civilians, and even mere monsters have mana. But in Joshua, Duke Agnes couldn't feel any mana at all. Hearing this, Shaphan thought about the fact that there was no mana, which meant they were no different from an undead that moves with demonic power. Shaphan said that perhaps there were cases where some were naturally born without mana. Shaphan had heard stories about that. Duke Agnes said that rather than natural, there was something where the mana hole should have been, some sticky, bad energy that the Duke felt. Duke said that for now, he would watch over Joshua with a smirk on his face. Hearing this, Shaphan intervened and said that it didn't make sense. If young Master Joshua was born with a mana deficiency, didn't that mean the rumors were false? So Shaphan couldn't leave the centurion that spread those false rumors alone. Duke told Shaphan that the centurion was also an asset of the dukedom, and it wasn't a good idea to punish them for information that Shaphan wasn't comfortably certain about. Shaphan apologized to the duke for being too short-sighted. Then Duke told Joshua to live in the palace for a while, as there were plenty of empty rooms. Babel told Duke that Joshua couldn't stay at the palace, but before Babel could finish his sentence, Duke Agnes glared at Babel, saying, is there a problem, Babel? Babel got scared and said that there was no problem. Duke Agnes told Shaphan that from tomorrow on, she should teach Joshua basic night lessons, and if Joshua showed talent, then Shaphan should show Joshua the Crimson Knight's method for using mana. Surprised, Shaphan asked if Duke Agnes was talking about how to use mana, but young master Joshua didn't have any mana. Duke told Shaphan that there was plenty of time, so both Duke and Shaphan would find out if they waited and saw and it was even better if Joshua didn't have a natural mana deficiency. Duke said to Joshua that he would be looking forward to Joshua's return next year. Later, Shaphan escorted Joshua to the room that would be his during his stay. Observing Joshua's subdued demeanor, Shaphan couldn't help but wonder if the rumors about Joshua's inability to speak were true. Not a glimmer of joy crossed Joshua's face upon receiving such generous accommodations. Offering assistance, Shaphan advised Joshua to call upon him if needed before briskly exiting the room the door slamming behind him. Joshua couldn't help but note the stark change in Shaphan's demeanor. Was it because they were no longer in the presence of Duke Agnes? Joshua pondered this as he settled onto his bed, yearning for sleep. However, the thought of Duke Agnes eagerly anticipating their meeting nagged at him. Duke Agnes, typically ensconced in the opulent confines of Acadie's Golden Castle, the capital of the Avalon Empire, must have returned to the fief for a reprieve. Joshua couldn't shake the feeling that Duke Agnes might be privy to information unknown to him. Whatever it was, the prospect of Duke Agnes harboring secrets posed a potential danger, one Joshua was determined to unravel. But Joshua sighed, feeling the weight of uncertainty pressing down upon him. More pressing than anything, Joshua believed, was the imperative to reclaim his original strength. With that goal in mind, he resolved to take action. Under the cloak of night, Joshua slipped out of the palace utilizing his mana to move stealthily, leaving behind no trace of his passage. He found solace in the ease with which he could now wield his mana, realizing it might expedite his journey back to his former prowess. Yet, amidst his clandestine excursion, a sudden pang of pain gripped Joshua's stomach, signaling a disruption within his mana. He speculated whether the conflicting energies were of holy or demonic origin, their chaotic dance within him causing discomfort. To his astonishment, Joshua discovered Lucia's formidable presence intertwined with the conflicting energies, her power acting as a stabilizing force. Before Joshua could unravel the mystery further, the sound of approaching soldiers shattered the night's silence. Reacting swiftly, Joshua vanished from their sight, darting into the protective embrace of the forest. His destination clear in his mind, Joshua made his way towards his mother. As Joshua sprinted through the night, thoughts raced through his mind like a tempest. He couldn't shake the notion that Lucia held the key to the enigmatic trio of energies coursing through him. If he could harness them all as his own, 
Joshua believed, he could swiftly reclaim his lost strength. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to a humble hut, where tension crackled in the air like static electricity. Ralche, Lloyd, and Gort stood alongside Alicia, Joshua's mother. Lloyd's grip on Alicia tightened, his anger palpable. Gort and the others thirsted for vengeance, blaming Joshua for their tarnished reputations. In the chaos, Alicia attempted to flee, only to be met with violence. Lloyd's blow sent her crashing to the ground, a sickening thud marking her fall. Gort poised to strike the final blow, but Ralche intervened, his voice cutting through the tumult like a knife. He warned of Joshua's wrath should they proceed, urging restraint. Gort scoffed at Ralche's plea, accusing him of cowardice. With Duchess Vanessa's assurances of protection, Gort saw no reason to hesitate. Lloyd, equally unyielding, demanded Ralche's departure if he lacked the stomach for their vengeance. Just as Gort prepared to deliver the fatal blow, a voice pierced the tension, commanding them to halt. They turned to find Joshua standing before them, his presence a thunderbolt in the midst of their turmoil. With anger simmering in his veins, Joshua issued a chilling warning to the trio before him, their fate hanging by a threat. Ralche, trembling with fear, pleaded with Gort to flee, but Gort's frustration boiled over as he denounced Ralche's cowardice. Ignoring their banter, Joshua's voice cut through the tension like a blade. Come out now, he commanded, his gaze unwavering. Gort and Lloyd's laughter faltered as they prepared to attack, but Joshua's words held them at bay. Suddenly, a figure descended from the ceiling, catching everyone off guard. The knight, named Cain, was taken aback by Joshua's ability to sense his presence. Bearing the emblem of the Order of the Crimson Knights, Cain's arrival raised questions in Joshua's mind. Was Shafan behind this? As Lloyd, Gort, and Ralche greeted the knight with deference, Cain approached Joshua with a hint of disdain. So, this is the rumored child of a concubine, he mused. Joshua wasted no time in addressing the situation, questioning Cain about the soldier's attempt to harm a lady of the Duke's house. Abiding by the strict military code of the Duke's house, Joshua demanded clarity on how such situations were typically handled. Cain, taken aback by Joshua's commanding presence, found himself unable to refute the overwhelming force emanating from the young noble. In a moment of decisive action, Cain pivoted, drawing his sword with determination. With a steely resolve, he declared that any knights found guilty of attempting to harm a lady of the duke's house would face immediate and severe punishment. With lightning speed, Cain swiftly incapacitated Lloyd before turning his attention to Gort. Despite Gort's attempt to retaliate, Cain effortlessly evaded his strike and swiftly subdued him as well. Now, only Ralche remained. Trembling with fear, Ralche pleaded for forgiveness as Joshua's voice rang out from behind, urging Cain to halt. But Cain remained resolute, ignoring Joshua's plea as he pressed his sword against Ralche's throat. Ralche, desperate for mercy, begged for clemency, but Cain's fury brooked no negotiation. As Joshua stepped forward, intervening once more, Cain explained that he was merely carrying out immediate punishment for endangering the duke's wife. His demeanor grave, Cain made it clear that he would not let these knights escape lightly. Observing Cain's seriousness, Joshua speculated about his identity. Cain appeared to be one of the third-generation knights renowned within the duchy, belonging to the formidable Crimson Knights. Joshua surmised that Cain was likely the youngest among them. As the realization dawned upon Joshua that Cain had likely been assigned to observe him, he became certain of Cain's formidable prowess, evident in how effortlessly Cain subdued the centurions with mere swings of his sword. Curious about Cain's background, Joshua inquired about his master. Cain's response was unequivocal, Duke Agnes was his master. This revelation piqued Joshua's interest further, prompting him to delve deeper into their connection. Sensing a familiar intensity in Joshua's gaze, Cain couldn't help but draw parallels between Joshua and someone he knew. Upon Joshua's command, Cain reluctantly sheathed his sword. Ralche, filled with gratitude for Joshua's intervention, pledged his loyalty in return. But Joshua, resolute in his stance, refused Ralche's offer, declaring that he would never spare those who had harmed his mother. However, Joshua expressed confidence in Ralche's intelligence and urged him to relay the events of that night to others in detail. With a solemn warning hanging in the air, Joshua made it clear that any future transgressions would be met with severe consequences. With frustration etched across his features, Joshua asserted his intent to personally deal with those who dared to harm his mother. He dismissed Ralche with a curt command, his expression brooking no argument. As Ralche hastened away without a backward glance, Cain approached Joshua, noting the marked difference in his demeanor. Joshua's response was dismissive, 
a smirk playing at the corners of his lips as he referred to himself as the master's illegitimate child, the stable's vendor. Kane paused, considering Joshua's words before enlightening him about the knight's autonomy and choosing their master upon reaching the age of 23. Acknowledging that he would face this decision himself next year, Kane expressed his trust in his instincts. He vowed to continue watching over Joshua beyond his assigned duty. Hearing this, Joshua contemplated Kane's choice, concluding that Kane had likely made the right decision in choosing to serve the duchy's treasure, Babel von Agnes. As Kane contemplated the future, Joshua couldn't help but smile at his companion's eccentricity. Their exchange was interrupted by Alicia's awakening. Her smile radiated relief as she expressed her happiness at seeing Joshua safe. Without hesitation, Joshua enveloped his mother in a tight embrace, tears welling in his eyes as he vowed to protect her from that moment forward. With gratitude swelling in his heart, Joshua silently thanked the heavens for granting him a second chance to reclaim his youth, devoid of the regrets that had tainted his past. Determined to rewrite his story, Joshua resolved to shed his timidity and embrace his true potential, not as Joshua Von Agnes, the lowly illegitimate child, but as Joshua Sanders, hailed as the strongest spear in the continent's history. Meanwhile, in the grand halls of the Agnes Duchy's mansion, Duke Agnes inquired of Chiffon about Count Rebecca's unexpected visit. Chiffon informed the Duke that the Count had been escorted to the reception room. However, Chiffon revealed that Count Rebecca hadn't arrived alone this time leaving the Duke intrigued as he pressed Chiffon for more details. Chiffon's revelation that Count Rebecca had arrived accompanied by Miss Iceland prompted Duke Agnes to furrow his brow. He sensed that Count Rebecca was likely seeking to resolve some pressing matter, and the sudden appearance of an uncomfortable guest only added to his unease. Count Fonsel Jean Rebecca, though of lower status compared to Duke Agnes, commanded significant influence within the Empire. His daughter, Iceland Jean Rebecca, was equally notable. Iceland, a prodigious mage, had achieved Class II status at the tender age of nine, an accomplishment that spoke volumes of her innate talent. In a world where some were cursed with the inability to wield mana, Iceland was among the blessed few who possessed a natural affinity for it. This divine gift, known as the Blessing of Mana, granted its recipients the ability to sense and manipulate mana without the need for rigorous training. It was revered as one of the greatest gifts bestowed by the gods upon magicians. Duke Agnes sighed resigned to the fact that Count Fonsel would likely monopolize his time once more. It seemed that the rest of the day would be spent attending to the Count's concerns. Chiffon delivered the news to Duke Agnes with a tone that hinted at the passage of time. Babel will be fifteen next year, Chiffon remarked, implying the imminent approach of Babel's coming-of-age ceremony. Duke Agnes nodded thoughtfully, acknowledging the significance of the event. Babel has Lady Charles, Duke Agnes mused referencing the Font family's daughter who held considerable sway as a duchess in her own right. The Font family's wealth had secured them a duchy within the Avalon Empire, granting them significant influence. Chiffon suggested to Duke Agnes that Lady Charles might be a preferable choice, especially considering the Font duchy's standing. Duke Agnes, however, lamented the predictability of such arrangements. Chiffon couldn't help but perceive Duke Agnes's insatiable appetite for talent, which rivaled his thirst for military power. To Duke Agnes, skill was the paramount factor in evaluation, a trait that defined the ruler of the Agnes Duchy. Their conversation halted abruptly as Duke Agnes came to a standstill. Sensing something amiss, Chiffon inquired about Duke Agnes's sudden pause. Duke Agnes, after a moment of contemplation, broached a different topic. He asked after Joshua, revealing his intention to fulfill a promise he had made to bestow Iceland upon Joshua. Chiffon's astonishment was palpable upon hearing Duke Agnes's intention. In Chiffon's mind, the idea of pairing Iceland, blessed with the gift of mana, with Joshua, afflicted by the curse of mana disability, seemed incongruous. To Chiffon, it was akin to aligning two opposing forces, one brimming with magical potential, the other burdened by its absence. Meanwhile, outside the confines of the mansion, Joshua found solace in scaling the cliff that loomed north of the Agnes Duchy's garden. This rocky precipice held significance for him, for it was here that he had once sought solace in the wake of his mother's passing. In his exploration, Joshua stumbled upon a concealed tunnel, its secrets waiting to be unearthed. As Joshua ascended the cliff, his eyes scanned the rugged surface in search of the elusive tunnel. This was where he had first encountered Lucia, and he was determined to find it again. Spotting the entrance to the tunnel, Joshua carefully pricked his finger, allowing a drop of blood to fall onto the magic circle inscribed there. In an instant, a portal materialized before him, beckoning him to step through. 
Emerging on the other side, Joshua found himself in an ancient, dilapidated temple. Confusion clouded his mind as he surveyed his surroundings, realizing that this temple was not as he remembered it from his past life. In his previous existence, this place had been intact, its significance unmistakable. But now, it lay in ruins, a shadow of its former self. Approaching the altar at the temple's center, where Lucia had once been bound, Joshua's heart sank at the sight before him. Instead of Lucia, there was only a metal staff resting upon the stone surface. With a mixture of curiosity and apprehension, Joshua reached out and grasped the staff. To his surprise, the staff began to glow, its radiance enveloping Joshua before it vanished from his grip. Bewildered, Joshua scanned his surroundings, which now seemed to shimmer with an ethereal whiteness. Suddenly, a voice pierced the silence, drawing Joshua's attention behind him. Turning, Joshua beheld the metal staff, now seemingly imbued with life, beckoning him forth with a silent call. Joshua's astonishment echoed through the abandoned temple as he questioned the identity of the mysterious metal stick. To his disbelief, the stick revealed itself as Lukia, a demonic god's artifact. The revelation sent shivers down Joshua's spine. The spear he had wielded in countless battles throughout his previous life was, unbeknownst to him, a relic of dark origin. Furthermore, its appearance had undergone a transformation since their last encounter. Speculating on the reason for Lukia's altered appearance, Joshua contemplated the possibility that it had been sent back in time along with him. But Lukia wasted no time in addressing the urgent matter at hand. It warned Joshua of the detrimental effects the conflicting energies within his body would have on his lifespan. The only solution, Lukia explained, was for Joshua to swiftly regain his original strength and harness the tranquil energies within him. The task ahead seemed daunting as Lukia revealed that Joshua would need to reach the fourth stage of magic spearmanship to achieve this goal. Joshua's surprise was palpable. The ancient spear technique he had been mastering, known as magic spearmanship, was a formidable skill. In a world where swords reigned supreme among knights, this unique technique, forged through Joshua's mastery of mana, held unparalleled power. Despite being widely dismissed as inferior weapons, spears held a special place in Joshua's arsenal. Before his regression, only a select few could match Joshua's prowess on the battlefield. At that time, Joshua had reached the pinnacle of mastery in magic spearmanship, attaining the coveted stage 5. In a world where knights primarily wielded swords formed from mana, Joshua's proficiency with the spear set him apart. While the rank system categorized knights into various tiers, Joshua's skill transcended these boundaries. Even at stage 5, he stood unrivaled as the empire's greatest knight. Now, as Joshua contemplated reaching stage 4 once more, he recognized the significance of the achievement. At that level, he would be on par with the mightiest beer ink knights. Recalling his past accomplishments, Joshua believed that attaining this level of mastery shouldn't pose too great a challenge. However, the pressing issue lay in the constraints of time. Joshua's current condition made it difficult to train his mana effectively. Lukia's reassurance brought a glimmer of hope to Joshua. With Lukia's guidance, Joshua could harness mana with minimal adverse effects. Joshua's surprise was evident as he questioned the feasibility of such a feat Lukia remained steadfast, urging Joshua to focus on continuous self-improvement. With Lukia by his side, Joshua could navigate the complexities of mana manipulation and hone his skills relentlessly. Joshua envisioned a future where he stood at the pinnacle of his abilities, Lukia fully restored to her former power. It was then, Joshua believed, that his dreams would become reality. However, despite his determination, Joshua couldn't quite grasp Lukia's cryptic message. Before he could seek clarification, Joshua found himself back in the temple, clutching Lukia in his hand. Recalling Lukia's assurance that her presence would enable him to wield mana to some extent, Joshua decided to put her words to the test. He embarked on a mana cultivation technique unlike any other on the continent, a foundational step known as Stage 1 of Magic Spearmanship. With determination fueling his efforts, Joshua reached out to the ambient mana surrounding him. As he absorbed the energy, Joshua felt a surge of power course through him, marking his attainment of stage one. Eager to put his newfound abilities to the test, Joshua executed the first form of magic spearmanship with precision. In a single explosive burst, he concentrated mana into a focused point before launching it forward with unparalleled force. Witnessing his success, Joshua felt a surge of confidence. This was only the beginning. With unwavering determination, Joshua vowed to train tirelessly, driven by the desire to surpass his rivals and claim victory for himself. 
The grandeur of the Agnes Duchy's guest reception room unfolded as Duke Agnes made his entrance. His keen eyes scanned the room, noting the unexpected abundance of guests. Among them stood Cheryl, who offered a gracious greeting to the Duke. Curiosity piqued, Duke Agnes inquired about Cheryl's late-night visit. Cheryl explained that Count Cox, a distinguished vassal of House Font, had insisted on their presence. Cox, responsible for overseeing House Font's finances, expressed regret for the impromptu visit. Duke Agnes dismissed Cox's apologies, instead extending an invitation for Cox to join his service. This suggestion elicited a sharp retort from Cheryl, who condemned the Duke's audacity in attempting to poach talent. Cox attempted to intervene, urging Cheryl to cease her tirade. But Cheryl's fiery demeanor only served to reaffirm Duke Agnes's perception of her. Her spirited rebuttal hinted at a deeper resolve, one that commanded respect. As Cheryl conveyed news of Babel's advancement to C-rank knighthood, Duke Agnes couldn't help but wonder if he was truly conversing with the esteemed Cheryl D. Font. If the rumors were indeed true, Cheryl mused, perhaps it was time for her own talents to be recognized. Count Cox, visibly taken aback by Cheryl's audacity, urged her to rein in her words. Apologizing once more to Duke Agnes for the disruption, Cox attempted to defuse the tension. Duke Agnes, however, dismissed the incident with a wave of his hand, remarking that Cheryl's spirited nature was befitting of her youth. His attention then turned to Fonsel Jean Rebecca, whom he had nearly overlooked. Offering his apologies to Rebecca, Duke Agnes acknowledged his presence. As Iceland greeted Duke Agnes, Cheryl's frustration became palpable. She couldn't fathom why Iceland was present and voiced her curiosity. Cheryl's inquiry shifted to Joshua, Duke Agnes's illegitimate child, and the rumors surrounding his supposed defeat of three centurions. Count Cox's patience wore thin as he admonished Cheryl to refrain from further questioning. Unperturbed, Cheryl grumbled about her harmless curiosity, prompting Chiffon to intervene. Dispelling the rumors, Chiffon explained that Joshua not only possessed a frail constitution but was also burdened with a mana curse. This revelation left Fonsel astonished, prompting him to inquire further about Joshua's condition. Duke Agnes seized the moment, sensing an opportunity to gain insight into Joshua's condition. Addressing Fonsel, he acknowledged Fonsel's expertise as one of the Empire's few fifth-class magicians. Duke Agnes reasoned that Fonsel's sensitivity to mana surpassed his own as a knight, thus requesting Fonsel to examine Joshua. Fonsel, recognizing the chance to earn favor with Duke Agnes, readily agreed to the proposition. Meanwhile, Chiffon interjected, suggesting that it might be prudent to assess Joshua's mana deficiency before proceeding. This, Chiffon argued, would not only validate the rumors but also provide clarity regarding Joshua's condition. Intrigued by Chiffon's proposal, Duke Agnes sought clarification on how such confirmation could be achieved. Chiffon proposed summoning a suitable knight from their ranks to spar with Joshua, allowing them to gauge his abilities firsthand. Duke Agnes, however, questioned the necessity of pitting a member of the Crimson Knights against a mere nine-year-old. Chiffon asserted that if Joshua indeed possessed the strength rumored, then his opponent should be of a comparable caliber. Fortunately, Chiffon claimed to have just the right individual under their banner to serve as Joshua's sparring partner. With this person's involvement, Chiffon believed Duke Agnes would be fully convinced. The following day, in Chiffon's office, Kane received a report regarding his altercation with the Centurions. Confirming the incident, Kane acknowledged his responsibility to enforce immediate punishment under military law. However, Chiffon questioned the hastiness of Kane's actions. Defending his actions, Kane explained that the Centurions had posed a threat to a lady of the Duke's household. Chiffon's anger flared upon hearing this, presuming the target to be Lady Vanessa. Kane clarified that it was, in fact, Lady Lucia who was in danger. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Chiffon acknowledged Lady Lucia's status within the Duke's household. Kane stood firm, asserting that the soldier's actions not only insulted but also challenged the authority of the Duke. He accepted full accountability for his actions, prepared to face any punishment deemed necessary. Chiffon, Momentarily stunned by Kane's resolve, eventually relented, opting to overlook the matter for the time being. However, Chiffon swiftly redirected Kane's attention to a new task at hand. Kane, ever dutiful, awaited Chiffon's instruction. With a solemn tone, Chiffon revealed that Kane would engage in a spar with young Master Joshua that day. This revelation caught Kane off guard, but Chiffon explained the purpose. The Duke would determine whether Joshua was truly afflicted by the mana curse. Expressing concern, Chiffon remarked on the potential ramifications of such an outcome, fearing it could impede young Master Babel's progress. 
King questioned whether Shaphan implied that Babel might be sidelined due to Joshua's abilities. Enraged, Shaphan dismissed the notion, extolling Babel's unparalleled genius, a talent unmatched across the continent. Shaphan's words echoed in Cain's mind, questioning whether he believed young Master Babel could be so easily overshadowed. The image of Joshua, not as a mere pebble but as a meteor hurtling through the heavens, flashed vividly before Cain's eyes. Shaphan continued, outlining Cain's role in the upcoming spar, subtly injecting mana into Joshua's system without detection. Cain understood the gravity of this task. Injecting mana into someone cursed with the mana affliction was akin to administering poison, a death sentence within ten days. Despite Shaphan's allegiance to young Master Babel, Cain found it unsettling that Shaphan would reveal his true intentions so brazenly. With a final directive from Shaphan, Cain made his way to the military armament, where the Duke and the Count were to convene. Though the order came from his direct superior, Cain couldn't shake the unease gnawing at him. With a firm resolve, Cain assured himself that he harbored no ill intentions toward young Master Joshua. However, when Joshua entered the room and learned of the impending spar with Cain, the air crackled with tension. Cain explained the situation, citing Duke Agnes's order to confirm Joshua's abilities. Joshua, sensing an opportunity to showcase his prowess, felt a surge of determination. Yet, Cain reassured him that their spar would be nothing more than a formality, prompting a scoff from Joshua. Refusing to be underestimated, Joshua asserted his authority to choose his subordinates, expressing disdain for those he deemed unworthy. Cain, taken aback by Joshua's assertiveness, listened intently as Joshua challenged him to witness his true strength. Joshua urged Cain to give his best effort as Duke Agnes entered the room, accompanied by a retinue including other counts. Cain respectfully greeted the Duke, while Shaphan observed Joshua's lack of etiquette toward Duke Agnes with frustration. However, Joshua surprised everyone by offering a courteous greeting to the Duke. Duke Agnes feels pleased when he sees Joshua greeting someone. The Duke then tells Joshua that he doesn't recall specifically teaching him etiquette, but notes that Joshua seems skilled in it regardless. Shaphan becomes frustrated upon witnessing this interaction. Joshua reassures the Duke by explaining that he's simply learned by observing. Curious, the Duke asks Joshua if he's aware of the current situation. Joshua replies to Duke Agnes, informing him that he was informed about the Duke's intention to test him. Shaphan interjected, clarifying that the meeting was not a test but rather Duke Agnes's consideration to assess and address Joshua's condition. Joshua, sensing Shaphan's ulterior motives and allegiance to Babel, felt a pang of resentment. Duke Agnes confirmed their readiness to proceed. Cain assured Duke Agnes of his readiness, awaiting the order to commence. However, Duke Agnes intervened, addressing a misunderstanding. He clarified that Joshua's sparring partner was not Cain but rather Babel. This unexpected revelation left Joshua visibly frustrated. Duke Agnes, a stern figure with an air of authority, gathered Joshua and Babel for their training session. He briskly informed them that they would be using wooden swords, emphasizing the competitive nature of their practice. Babel, a confident young man with a hint of arrogance, agreed with a casual of course, signaling his readiness for the challenge. As he picked up his wooden sword, he made a remark about not intending to exert his full effort, a statement that caught Joshua off guard. Joshua, a determined and competitive individual, couldn't help but feel suspicious. He observed Babel and Shaphan. To Joshua, it seemed as though they were putting on a show, perhaps to overwhelm him. Fueled by this suspicion and his own competitive spirit, Joshua grabbed a wooden sword, intending to demonstrate his own prowess. With a swift motion, Joshua snapped the wooden sword in half, surprising both Shaphan and the Duke. Undeterred, he opted for an unconventional choice, a simple stick. This decision raised eyebrows among the onlookers, with Cheryl finding it amusing and Shaphan expressing confusion. However, Duke Agnes, recognizing Joshua's determination, intervened. He questioned Joshua's confidence in using the stick instead of a sword, then Duke Agnes intervenes, halting Shaphan's actions. He turns to Joshua and asks if he's sure about using the stick instead of a wooden sword. Joshua reassures the Duke, affirming his confidence. Upon hearing this, Duke Agnes instructs everyone to take their seats. Duke Agnes issued a directive. Babel was not to use mana. During the duel, Babel, with a smirk, assured Duke Agnes that he wouldn't need it against Joshua. The two opponents squared off, their gazes locked in intense concentration. Meanwhile, Cain, a bystander observing the match, wondered about Joshua's strategy. As Duke Agnes begins the match, Joshua swiftly takes the offensive, launching a strike towards Babel. However, Babel manages to evade Joshua's attack. 
Observing this, Joshua reflects on the rumors that Babel is merely a C-rank knight and relies solely on his speed. As Babel moves into counter, Joshua manages to land a strike on Babel's arm with his stick. Frustrated by the unexpected blow, Babel retaliated with renewed vigor. However, Joshua surprised him once again, using the stick to strike Babel squarely in the stomach. Despite the intensity of the attack, Babel managed to endure the blow, his resolve unshaken. Meanwhile, Joshua remained focused, already planning his next move as the match continued. Babel's aggressive maneuver caught everyone off guard as he swiftly launched an offensive, utilizing his mana to unleash a formidable attack on Joshua. Duke Agnes, the authoritative figure overseeing the training, immediately intervened, commanding Babel to halt his assault. However, Babel, driven by determination or perhaps defiance, disregarded the order, resulting in a massive explosion of blue aura that reverberated throughout the training area. As the dust settled, the scene unfolded with a surprising revelation. Joshua had managed to block Babel's attack using his own mana. It was a moment of astonishment for all present, witnessing Joshua, a mere nine-year-old, harnessing and releasing mana with such mastery. Babel, visibly taken aback by Joshua's unexpected display of power, grew frustrated, resorting to drawing his sword and asserting his claim as the rightful successor to the duchy. In response to Babel's challenge, Joshua steeled himself, realizing the gravity of the situation. With thoughts racing through his mind, he contemplated the significance of this confrontation, aware of the implications it held not only for himself but also for the future of the duchy. His determination to prove himself and secure his position surged within him, driving him to prepare for the impending clash. As tensions mounted and both combatants prepared to engage, Duke Agnes intervened once more, his authoritative presence compelling them to cease their actions. With a stern admonition, he warned Babel of the consequences of defying his authority, effectively quelling any further aggression. Babel, stunned by the reprimand, begrudgingly relented, his frustration momentarily subdued. Amidst the commotion, Shafan, an onlooker, expressed his astonishment. Joshua's ability to wield mana at such a young age, his incredulity, underscored the unprecedented nature of Joshua's feat, leaving him and others present in awe of his untapped potential. Duke Agnes, seizing the opportunity to address lingering rumors regarding Joshua's abilities, pointed to this display of mana manipulation as validation of his exceptional talent. Count Fonsel, though acknowledging Joshua's proficiency with mana, noted a distinction in the manner of his usage compared to Babel's. This observation highlighted the uniqueness of Joshua's mana concentration and its potential significance in shaping future events. The revelation of Joshua's newfound power left both Cain and Cheryl, spectators to the unfolding events, surprised and intrigued by the implications it held. Duke Agnes complimented Joshua on his remarkable ability to wield mana at the tender age of nine, acknowledging the feat as truly impressive. However, before the conversation could progress further, Shafan attempted to interject, suggesting an alternative explanation for Joshua's abilities. With a stern expression, Duke Agnes swiftly silenced Shafan, signaling that his input is unwelcomed. Recognizing the seriousness of the situation, Shafan promptly retreated, deferring to Duke Agnes's authority. Duke Agnes informed Joshua that there were matters he needed to discuss and requested his presence in his office later that evening. The unexpected summons surprised both Shafan and Babel, with Babel expressing frustration at the unusual nature of the request. He couldn't comprehend how a child who once lived in the stables could now be summoned to the Duke's chambers. Meanwhile, Joshua calmly accepted Duke Agnes's invitation, acknowledging that he would indeed attend the meeting. The scene then shifted to the guest room, where Cheryl, overwhelmed with excitement, joyously bounced on the bed. Count Cox, attempting to maintain decorum, gently urged Lady Cheryl to calm down. Cheryl, reflecting on the situation, found it incredulous that a nine-year-old could possess the ability to wield mana. Despite her initial disbelief, Cheryl made a firm decision. She was determined to make Joshua hers. The scene transitions to the grandeur of the palace, where Duchess Vanessa's frustration flares upon hearing from Chiffon that Babel has been defeated by Joshua in a match. In her disbelief, she impulsively slaps Chiffon, unable to comprehend how Joshua could have acquired the ability to wield mana and surpass Babel, her own son. She demands clarification from Chiffon regarding Duke Agnes's intentions. Chiffon explains that it appears Duke Agnes is considering taking Joshua to the city of Akadi, presumably to further assess his talents. This revelation leaves both Duchess Vanessa and Chiffon apprehensive about their future prospects considering the potential implications of Joshua's newfound abilities. 
Duchess Vanessa, quick to assign blame, chastises Chiffon for the predicament, but he offers reassurance, claiming to have a plan to address the situation. Chiffon's analysis extends further, suggesting that Duke Agnes might exploit Joshua's abilities by spreading the notion that he is a C-rank mana user throughout the Empire. Duchess Vanessa initially dismisses this notion, but Chiffon persists, pointing out that the eyewitness accounts of the two counts could corroborate such claims. He predicts that Duke Agnes will likely subject Joshua to a test, aiming to officially knight him as a Searank knight. This test would involve a battle against a royal knight, serving as a demonstration of Joshua's mana usage capabilities. The prospect of Joshua facing off against a royal knight intrigues Duchess Vanessa, momentarily alleviating her frustration as she envisions the potential outcomes. Her thoughts drift to her uncle, whom she decides to contact for the first time in a while. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Joshua, who arrives at Duke Agnes's office as summoned. Upon entering, he greets the Duke respectfully, but his demeanor quickly shifts as Duke Agnes begins to probe deeper. The Duke questions Joshua about his true identity and whether any resentment festers within him towards Duke Agnes himself. Caught off guard by the unexpected line of questioning, Joshua maintains his composure and assures Duke Agnes that he harbors no ill feelings towards him. Joshua approached Duke Agnes with a proposition, acknowledging the cautious environment of the royal castle where expectations for him might have been low. However, he expressed a request, piquing Duke Agnes's interest. Duke Agnes, anticipating an apology request, queried Joshua's intentions. But Joshua, aware of the futility of shallow apologies in the castle's harsh milieu, clarified that his request concerned Duke Agnes taking him to Akadi. Duke Agnes, curious about Joshua's certainty, probed further, questioning if Joshua indeed expected Duke Agnes to take him to the city. Joshua affirmed his conviction, prompting Duke Agnes to seek clarification on the reasons behind Joshua's confidence. Joshua elaborated, citing two primary reasons for his conviction. Firstly, he pointed out the disruption his presence had caused in the assumed succession plan. Traditionally, Babel was presumed to be Duke Agnes's successor, but Joshua's emergence challenged this norm, potentially leading to chaos. Joshua believed his departure could help avert such turmoil, demonstrating his astute understanding of the castle's dynamics. Impressed by Joshua's insight, Duke Agnes recognized him not only as a talented fighter but also as a strategic thinker. Secondly, Joshua highlighted Duke Agnes's personal reluctance to let him go. If Joshua could surpass Duke Agnes in skill, it would elevate the Agnes family's status and diminish concerns about the castle's vulnerability. Duke Agnes, intrigued by Joshua's boldness, questioned whether Joshua believed he had the power to effect such significant changes. Joshua, exuding confidence, assured him of his determination not to disappoint. Excited by Joshua's resolve, Duke Agnes concluded that Joshua must have a plan to achieve both his desires simultaneously. Joshua confirmed Duke Agnes' assumption, revealing his awareness of the potential plan to send him to the prestigious academy in Akadi. At the academy, noble children of the Avalon Empire received a six-year education from ages 10 to 15. Remarkably skilled individuals, such as Babel, could even graduate early. The academy served as a conduit for the royal family to recruit promising talent directly solidifying their control over the nobility. In an effort to maintain the loyalty of the nobles towards the royal family and attract exceptional talents, Duke Agnes confides in Joshua, revealing that he will be accompanying him to the city. Moreover, he assures Joshua of occasional personal tutoring sessions if he remains close by. Upon hearing this, Joshua perceives it as a remarkable opportunity to glean insights into swordsmanship from one of the empire's renowned masters. Eagerly, he expresses his willingness to accompany the duke and receive his tutelage. However, Joshua harbors a preference for the spear as his weapon of choice. Duke Agnes is taken aback by this revelation, his initial enthusiasm dampened by Joshua's unexpected choice. He recalls Joshua's previous use of what he deems a useless stick in a one-on-one -on -one battle, causing frustration to simmer within him. As his temper flares, Duke Agnes emanates a potent aura, visibly agitated by Joshua's decision. In the face of the Duke's imposing presence, Joshua finds it increasingly difficult to maintain his composure. Yet, just as Duke Agnes takes pride in his mastery of the sword, Joshua remains steadfast in his own pride regarding his proficiency with the spear. In a bold proclamation, Joshua confides in Duke Agnes, declaring his intent to vanquish anyone obstructing his path with the prowess of his spear, even if they happen to be among the esteemed nine stars, of which Duke Agnes is a part. Amused by Joshua's audacious declaration, 
Duke Agnes finds a sense of humor in the notion that Joshua is determined to overcome the formidable Nine Stars. Capitalizing on the moment, Duke Agnes challenges Joshua, expressing a desire to witness firsthand the worth of Joshua's spear. Intrigued and recognizing this as a rare opportunity, Joshua contemplates the challenge, realizing that Duke Agnes is indeed one of the Nine Stars. Without hesitation, Duke Agnes queries Joshua about his willingness to undertake the test. Seizing the moment, Joshua agrees to the test but presents a condition. If he successfully passes Duke Agnes's trial, the Duke must acquiesce to a personal request Joshua harbors. Duke Agnes, in his characteristic manner, agrees to Joshua's terms, stating that should Joshua prove himself, not only will he gain the privilege of wielding a spear, but Duke Agnes will also heed Joshua's request. However, Duke Agnes sternly informs Joshua that should he fail the test, he will be bound to follow the Duke's commands. Joshua contemplates this consequence, realizing that it may entail enrolling in the academy and honing his skills in swordsmanship, a path he had no intention of taking. Despite his reservations, Joshua accepts the Duke's proposal, inwardly confident that he will not falter. He resolves not to conceal his abilities, determined to face whatever challenges may arise head-on. Meanwhile, the scene transitions to Duchess Vanessa, who engages in a magical communication with her uncle residing in the city. As they exchange greetings, Duchess Vanessa reveals that an incident has occurred within the duchy and seeks her uncle's assistance, hinting at a forthcoming favor. Joshua stepped out of Duke Agnes's office, his mind still reeling from the encounter. As he stood outside, bathed in the dim light of the corridor, he couldn't help but marvel at the mastery displayed by the formidable Duke. To Joshua, it was clear that Duke Agnes was truly exceptional, living up to his reputation as a master of his craft. Lost in his thoughts, Joshua was startled by the sudden appearance of Babel. Babel wasted no time and asked Joshua to divulge the details of his conversation with Duke Agnes. However, Joshua, still processing the encounter himself, deflected Babel's inquiry with a casual dismissal. He had nothing to report, he claimed, attempting to brush off the conversation as inconsequential. But Babel was not one to be easily dissuaded. With a determined gaze, he insisted that they engage in another battle. Joshua couldn't help but notice the intensity in Babel's eyes, a fervent desire for victory and an unwavering determination to never taste defeat. It was a gaze that spoke volumes, revealing Babel's pure passion for the thrill of combat. With a smirk, Joshua teasingly questioned Babel's confidence, playfully testing the waters to gauge his opponent's resolve. Meanwhile, in the opulent halls of the Avalon Empire's Grand Imperial Palace, Emperor Marcus Van Britten received news of Joshua's exploits. The Emperor's interest was piqued as he learned of yet another prodigious talent emerging from the Agnes Empire. Emperor Marcus mentions that his older sister, Vanessa, had been concealing someone like the kid in question. The green-haired individual informs the Emperor that the child is not the Duchess's offspring, but rather an illegitimate one. Rumors suggest he is the child of a maid from the Duchy. Emperor Marcus finds this revelation intriguing. He considers Babel to be a unique treasure that he won't encounter again within the Empire. However, now Duke Agnes possesses two treasures all to himself. Expressing envy, Emperor Marcus admits to feeling truly jealous. The green-haired man adds that the princes are also talented individuals destined to make a significant impact on the world. Hearing this, Emperor Marcus reflects on the scarcity of individuals born with the talent for rulership but lacking in combat prowess. However, the emperor expressed disappointment in the current crop of princes, lamenting their lack of martial prowess compared to their aspirations for rulership. The green-haired companion disagreed, suggesting that perhaps the emperor's standards were too high, influenced by his own mastery and desire for excellence. It was a perspective that forced Emperor Marcus to reassess his expectations and consider the possibility that talent came in many forms, not solely confined to the battlefield. In the midst of this discussion, Emperor Marcus couldn't shake the envy he felt towards Duke Agnes, who now possessed not one, but two prized treasures within his grasp. The revelation left Emperor Marcus pondering the future implications of Duke Agnes's decision to unveil his second child to the world. It means that this child could rival Babel in skill, marking them as a significant presence within their world. A green-haired informant relayed rumors to Emperor Marcus, claiming that Babel had been defeated by this nine-year-old prodigy. The emperor, astonished by the notion of a child surpassing seasoned warriors, found amusement in the situation predicting a rush of interest in witnessing the child's abilities firsthand. Confirming the emperor's assumptions, the informant revealed that the Agni's duchy had requested the dispatch of the imperial castle's order of knights, 
indicating the child's advanced skill level, potentially nearing that of a C-rank knight. Emperor Marcus marveled at the child's extraordinary talent, considering it a stroke of fortune for the empire. His curiosity peaked, he recognized the potential significance of Duke Agnes's second child. However, the emperor also acknowledged the inherent dangers surrounding the child due to his own vast influence, making him a prime target for nefarious interests. Despite his desire to personally evaluate the child's abilities, Emperor Marcus deemed it impractical due to the lurking threats. Instead, he proposed sending a prince to assess the child's talents, stressing the importance of recognizing and nurturing exceptional abilities. The narrative then returned to the intense combat between Joshua and Babel. Joshua unleashed a formidable strike infused with mana, which Babel skillfully countered with his sword. Despite the unexpected discovery of mana in Joshua's bare fist, Babel remained composed. Sensing Babel's thoughts, Joshua boldly vowed to showcase the true power of the martial arts that had captured Babel's interest. Irritated by Joshua's confident assertion, Babel responded with a fierce swing of his mana-infused sword. The clash between Joshua and Babel crescendoed as Joshua unleashed a powerful strike, his fist infused with mana, sending Babel sprawling to the ground. Confusion and frustration clouded Babel's mind as he grappled with the reality of Joshua's ability to channel mana into his body, a feat beyond his comprehension. Despite his inner turmoil, Babel couldn't deny the stark truth. Joshua's strength eclipsed his own by far. Approaching Babel with a mix of empathy and seriousness, Joshua sought to understand the source of Babel's frustration. With a firm gaze, Joshua urged Babel to harness his frustration into a drive for improvement, reminding him of the humiliation of being defeated by someone he once dismissed. While Joshua possessed the power to obliterate Babel for his insults against him and his mother, he recognized a genuine spark of passion for martial prowess in Babel's eyes. However, Joshua's mercy was not without conditions. He issued a stern warning. If Babel persisted in his disrespectful attitude, Joshua would ensure he never wielded a sword again. Shocked by the gravity of Joshua's words, Babel grappled with the weight of his actions as Joshua departed, leaving him to contemplate the vast disparity in their current skill levels. As the morning sun filtered through the windows of the Agnes Duchy Palace, Joshua found himself still weary from the previous day's exertions. Reflecting on the newfound freedom in his mana control since absorbing Lukia's essence, Joshua couldn't help but ponder the toll it might be taking on his body, considering the lingering side effects. A soft knock interrupted Joshua's reverie, and he assumed it was Cain, arriving ahead of schedule as usual. However, to his surprise, it was Cheryl who stood at the door. As Cheryl introduced herself, she casually mentioned that she had heard Joshua was three years younger than her. With this knowledge in mind, Cheryl felt at ease speaking to Joshua. Playfully, she suggested he address her as Big Sister. With a sense of familiarity, Cheryl ventured into Joshua's room, intending to have a conversation. However, before she could proceed, Joshua abruptly halted her and whispered in her ear to leave his room. Startled by a sudden change in demeanor, Cheryl watched in astonishment as Joshua slammed the door shut behind her. Outside, Cheryl stood in stunned silence, bewildered by Joshua's sudden dismissal. Moments later, another knock echoed through the room. Irritated by the interruption, Joshua flung the door open, only to find Cain standing on the other side, his unexpected presence catching Joshua off guard. Surprised by Joshua's unexpected demeanor, Cain hesitated before speaking. He informed Joshua that he could return later if Joshua was occupied. Joshua, realizing his mistake, quickly apologized to Cain, acknowledging the mix-up. Taking a moment to gather his thoughts, Joshua then inquired about the progress of a task he had assigned to Cain. Cain confirmed that he had completed the preparations as instructed but expressed confusion regarding the purpose behind Joshua's directives. Joshua's smile widened as he reassured Cain, urging him to trust and follow along. He cryptically hinted that Cain would soon understand the reasoning behind his actions. The scene transitions to the Agnes sparring field, where a congregation of soldiers has convened. Among them, two soldiers approach Ralche with a quizzical expression etched upon their faces. They inquire about the whereabouts of Lloyd and Gort, noting that the trio was often inseparable. Rumors of their encounter with Joshua swirl in the air, prompting the soldiers to seek clarification from Ralche. Yet, he remains stoically silent, brushing off their queries with a subtle indifference. In the midst of this exchange, a black-haired soldier turns to his comrade, seeking insight into the identity of the individual who summoned the centurions on this particular day. The brown-haired soldier responds with a whisper, 
revealing that it was none other than a knight from the esteemed Order of the Crimson Knights. The revelation hints at the intensity of the impending training session, sending ripples of anticipation through the gathered ranks. Just as the tension mounts, Joshua strides onto the field, accompanied by Kane. Ralche, taken aback by Joshua's unexpected presence, struggles to comprehend the situation unfolding before him. With a commanding air, Kane announces that the day's instruction will be led by none other than Joshua himself. The declaration reverberates through the assembly, eliciting murmurs of astonishment. Confidently, Joshua steps forward, assuming the mantle of leadership as he introduces himself to the bewildered centurions. Their disbelief palpable, the soldiers can scarcely fathom the prospect of Joshua serving as their mentor. In a commanding tone, Joshua asserts that the centurions of Duke Agnes must rise to become the vanguards, the leaders who will steer the course of battle in times of war. He emphasizes the paramount importance of each centurion's individual prowess in achieving this goal. It is with this purpose in mind that Joshua has taken it upon himself to assess their skills firsthand. Addressing the assembled centurions, Joshua issues a challenge, beckoning them to face him in a display of their abilities. The response is a ripple of laughter, echoing across the field. Witnessing this, Cain leans in to caution Joshua, expressing doubt about his ability to contend with the seasoned centurions. The sentiment is echoed by a black-haired centurion who warns of the potential consequences should Joshua proceed. Undeterred, Joshua takes up his spear, advancing toward them with unwavering determination. With a pointed gesture, he directs his challenge towards Ralche, demanding to know if Ralche doubts his capability. Caught off guard and trembling with fear, Ralche stammers out a denial, fearful of the consequences of his doubt. Incensed by Ralche's lack of faith, Joshua rebukes him sharply, commanding him to cease his baseless utterances. The reaction from the other centurions confirms Joshua's suspicions. Ralche had failed to uphold his end of the agreement, divulging the confidential conversation to his comrades. In response, Ralche offers a hasty apology, seeking forgiveness from Joshua. Joshua, asserting his authority, sternly warns Ralche that such transgressions will not be tolerated. He makes it clear that forgiveness will not come easily a second time. In the aftermath of Ralche's ill-fated attempt on Joshua's mother, the situation could have spiraled into a fatal confrontation. However, Joshua, magnanimous in victory, extended an opportunity to Ralche, a chance for redemption. Yet, Ralche, in a tragic twist, squandered this lifeline that Joshua had graciously offered. Joshua, perceptive to Ralche's aspirations, discerned the latter's desire to emulate the ill-fated paths of Lloyd and Gort. The revelation sent shockwaves through the other centurions, shedding light on the mysterious absence of the two comrades who had fallen to Joshua's prowess. Faced with the consequences of his actions, Ralche pleaded for a second chance. With unyielding resolve, Joshua declared that there would be no such reprieve. However, recognizing the shared identity as centurions of Duke Agnes, Joshua pledged to safeguard Ralche's pride. He instructed Ralche to ready his sword, proposing a duel that could, if won by Ralche, erase the stain of his previous actions. Understanding the daunting odds, Ralche acknowledged the high stakes. Though pitted against a youth, the formidable Joshua, Ralche saw a slim chance for redemption if he gave his all. As he charged at Joshua, determination etched on his face, he aimed to strike a blow that could alter his fate. Yet, before Ralche could execute his maneuver, Joshua, swift and precise, swung his spear with uncanny accuracy. The blow landed with brutal force, sending Ralche hurtling into the wall. The sight of Joshua harnessing mana sends ripples of astonishment through the ranks of centurions. In response, Joshua imparts a crucial lesson, emphasizing the folly of judging adversaries solely by their outward appearance. He warns that such misjudgments could prove fatal on the unforgiving battlefield, where lives hang in the balance. Challenging any lingering doubts about his capabilities, Joshua invites skeptical centurions to test him once more. A brave soul steps forward, bowing respectfully before Joshua, identifying himself as the 23rd centurion leader. Inspired by his example, Others follow suit, acknowledging Joshua's authority with deference. Observing this display of respect, Cain's heart swells with pride. He is reassured that Joshua has exceeded his expectations, promising unwavering support to his newfound lord. Meanwhile, in the confines of Duke Agnes' guest room, Cheryl's spirits sag under the weight of disappointment. Joshua's abrupt dismissal leaves her disheartened. However, her despondency is interrupted by the arrival of Count Cox bearing news of profound significance. He announces the imminent arrival of the Order of the Imperial Knights to the Duchy, 
Cheryl's distress is palpable as she expresses her wish for Count Cox to refrain from troubling her. Concern etches Count Cox's features as he presses for an explanation, fearing Lady Cheryl may be in pain or distress. Cheryl, her frustration bubbling to the surface, dismisses his concerns curtly, urging him to leave her in peace. Instead, she chooses to confide in him about the unsettling events surrounding her father's directives. Count Cox, momentarily forgetting his own concerns and his dedication to Lady Cheryl's well-being, assures her that he will prioritize her father's orders before departing from her presence. Left alone once more, Cheryl's sadness deepens, her solitude echoing in the empty room. Meanwhile, in the austere confines of Duke Agnes' office, a grave conversation unfolds. Duke Agnes queries Joshua about rumors of a centurion's elimination at Joshua's hands. Unflinchingly, Joshua confirms the truth of the matter, citing the soldier's attempt on his mother's life as justification for his actions. Reflecting on the incident involving the centurion's elimination, Duke Agnes acknowledged its unfortunate nature. Joshua, however, pressed the Duke to delve deeper into the motivations behind his actions. With a calm yet firm demeanor, Joshua challenged Duke Agnes's perception, questioning whether the Duke believed him to be merely a young boy driven by unchecked emotions. Joshua then peeled back the layers of his recent history, revealing the painful truth of his origins as the discarded son of a concubine. He explained that his display of overwhelming strength wasn't a bid for approval, but rather a means to command respect and ensure his mother's safety. As understanding dawned in Duke Agnes's eyes, he conceded the validity of Joshua's reasoning. He suggested bringing their discussion to a close, urging Joshua to prepare for his mana evaluation later in the day. With a nod of agreement, Joshua accepted the directive, signaling the end of their poignant exchange. As news of the dispatchment of the Order of the Imperial Knights reached their ears, Joshua promptly informed Duke Agnes of his imminent departure once his preparations were complete. The scene then shifted to Armstrong, the esteemed leader of the Golden Mane Knights of Agnes Duchy, who eagerly anticipated the day's events. He expressed his anticipation at the prospect of welcoming two C-rank knights who had yet to come of age from their duchy. However, Chiffon interjected, remarking that one of them was the son of a concubine. Armstrong brushed off Chiffon's remark, attributing it to Chiffon's frustration over his position being jeopardized by Joshua's recent victory over young Master Babel. Incensed by Armstrong's words, Chiffon snapped back, urging him to cease his baseless accusations. Their squabble was interrupted by the arrival of Duke Agnes, who noted their bickering with a hint of exasperation. Armstrong and Chiffon swiftly greeted the Duke, their disagreements momentarily set aside. As Armstrong laid eyes on Joshua, he couldn't help but underestimate the young man's strength. Meanwhile, a carriage approached, bearing soldiers in its wake. Chiffon pondered the identity of the visitor capable of dispatching such a substantial battalion. To their surprise, the fourth prince, Caesar Van Britten, descended from the carriage. Duke Agnes's astonishment was palpable at the unexpected arrival of Caesar. Filled with a whirlwind of emotions, Joshua marveled at the swift arrival of this pivotal moment. In the midst of training, a soldier named Joker effortlessly dispatches his junior comrades with skillful precision. His dominance is interrupted by the arrival of a man who questions Joker's aggressive approach. He points out that such behavior won't attract recruits to join the Imperial Palace Order of Knights. Joker dismisses the concern, expressing disdain for the newcomers who flaunt their meager man abilities. Curious about the man's presence, Joker learns of a mission from Duchess Vanessa that requires his attention. The scene then shifts to the present, where Armstrong, Chiffon, Joshua, and Duke Agnes stand alongside the fourth prince, Caesar. Among the soldiers accompanying the prince is Joker, who eyes Joshua with a determined resolve. He resolves to ensure that Joshua never wields a sword again. Caesar acknowledges Joshua as the rumored youth who defeated the centurions, sparking frustration in Joshua's demeanor. The mage Evergrant, accompanying Caesar, admonishes Joshua to show respect in the presence of royalty. Joshua's voice carries a solemnity as he declares, under the sky of the empire, there cannot be two sons, except for the Lord I serve. He continues, emphasizing that there is only one emperor deserving of the respect of all the knights in Avalon. To him, the self-proclaimed fourth prince holds no legitimacy, his identity shrouded in uncertainty. Joshua questions why he should extend respect to someone of dubious lineage. In response, Valmont Dawn, the fiery-haired vice-captain of the Imperial Knights, steps forward, admonishing Joshua for his perceived disrespect towards the prince. He alludes to rumors surrounding Joshua's background, referencing his supposed status as the son of a concubine cast aside in the horse stables. 
However, Armstrong intercedes, stepping into the fray to defend Joshua. He reminds Valmont that Joshua is also a member of the Agnes Duchy family, deserving of recognition and protection. Valmont, taken aback, argues that Armstrong's defense of Joshua appears to stem from loyalty to Duke Agnes rather than genuine concern. At that moment, Duke Agnes enters, his aura radiating authority and power. Valmont is struck silent, realizing that before him stands one of the legendary nine stars, Duke Aiden Agnes. As Valmont trembles under the weight of Duke Agnes's imposing aura, the Duke directs his attention to Joshua, attributing the turmoil to Joshua's rash actions and words. With authority, Duke Agnes instructs Joshua to offer an apology to the prince. However, before Joshua can respond, Prince Caesar intervenes, assuring Duke Agnes that an apology is unnecessary. Acknowledging the gravity of the situation, Prince Caesar's mage, Evergrant, reminds him of the scrutiny they face and the potential impact on the imperial family's authority. Yet, Prince Caesar, undeterred, expresses his willingness to set aside his pride for the greater good. With measured steps, he approaches Joshua, affirming that the true recipient of respect from all knights in the empire is the emperor himself. Prince Caesar assures Joshua that he bears no ill will, relieving Valmont of any concerns. With a gentle smile, he imparts a valuable lesson, emphasizing that a knight's worth is determined by their skills, not by empty words. He trusts that Earl Joshua understands the value of genuine merit over hollow bravado. As Caesar attempts to smooth over the situation with his silver-tongued diplomacy, Joshua's mind churns with determination. He refuses to be swayed by Caesar's eloquence. In this life, Joshua vows to chart his own path, one that leads to vengeance against Caesar himself. With steely resolve, Joshua issues a challenge, declaring his readiness to face Caesar at any time. Joker, growing increasingly frustrated by Joshua's bravado, interjects, urging Joshua to curb his arrogance in the presence of the prince. He then makes a bold request to Caesar, expressing his desire to personally assess Joshua's manner proficiency. Joker argues that his expertise, surpassing that of an expert B-rank, makes him better suited for the task. Caesar, concerned for Joshua's safety, agrees to Joker's proposal. Acknowledging Joker's higher rank, he believes Joker's assessment would be more beneficial. With a smirk, Joker thanks Caesar, promising to scrutinize Joshua's mana with precision. The scene transitions to the Agnes Duchy training hall, where Duke Agnes and the others observe from the sidelines as Joker and Joshua square off. The tension crackles in the air. Joker, Noting Joshua's choice of an iron stick as his weapon, questions whether Joshua sees their confrontation as merely a game. He voices his frustration, suggesting that Joshua's perceived ease stems from the constant praise he receives for his apparent talent. Joshua, unfazed by Joker's words, quips back that Joker seems to have a gift for gabbing, implying a skepticism toward the selection process of the Imperial Knights. Joker bristles at the remark, warning Joshua that he'll regret his words. However, before Joker can finish his tirade, Joshua seizes the opportunity to strike, catching Joker off guard with a swift attack. Joker, taken aback by the weight of Joshua's mana, struggles to defend against the onslaught. Despite the challenge, he manages to counterattack, pushing back Joshua's iron stick. Joshua, inwardly reflecting, acknowledges that his opponents often underestimate him by attempting to close the distance. Yet, he knows this weakness was addressed through rigorous training long ago. Joshua wields his iron stick with precision, launching a barrage of strikes at Joker, who struggles to fend off the onslaught. Witnessing the intense exchange, Caesar marvels at Joshua's prowess, noting that he holds his own against a B-rank knight at such a young age. Valmont, however, offers a different perspective, observing that Joker's skill level aligns more closely with a C-rank despite appearances. He acknowledges Joshua's overwhelming swordsmanship and questions the unprecedented spearmanship he displays. As the match intensifies, Joker, barely able to keep up with Joshua's relentless assault, grows increasingly frustrated. He realizes that if the test continues at this pace, he'll face Lady Vanessa's wrath for failing to meet expectations. Despite his apprehension, Joker resolves to persevere, recognizing that he has no choice but to gamble on the outcome. Meanwhile, Joshua acknowledges Joker's formidable skill, acknowledging that he presents a greater challenge than Babel. He grapples with the increasing difficulty of mana control and the conflicting forces of his holy power and mana. The stakes of the match escalate as both combatants push themselves to their limits. However, in a sudden turn of events, Joker retaliates and lands a slashing blow directly on Joshua. Witnessing this, Armstrong urgently informs Duke Agnes that Joker's mana has surpassed B-rank, 
putting Joshua's life in imminent danger. Duke Agnes, however, remains composed and instructs Armstrong to be patient and continue observing. Returning to the confrontation, Joker, sporting a smirk, taunts Joshua. He asserts that while Joshua managed to block the convergence of Joker's mana in previous attempts, it won't work this time. With a surge of mana, Joker strikes at Joshua, who struggles to defend against the relentless assault. Valmont, alarmed by the unfolding danger, shouts for Joker to stop, but his pleas fall on deaf ears. Joker's powerful strike creates a massive explosion, and as the dust settles, the shattered ground bears witness to the destructive force. Joker, shocked by the outcome, wonders about the unexpected turn of events. To everyone's surprise, Joshua emerges from the aftermath, now wielding an upgraded weapon, the Lukia spear in place of the iron stick. As the scene rewinds to moments prior, Joshua finds himself in a dire situation, barely holding on against Joker's relentless assault. With each passing second, the threat of Joker's mana sword looms larger, and Joshua realizes he's on the brink of succumbing to the attack. Anticipating the collision between Joker's B-rank aura and his own C-rank mana, Joshua braces himself for the potentially devastating consequences. With Joker charging towards him, Joshua knows that the clash between their auras could inflict severe internal injuries, possibly fulfilling Joker's duty. Despite his efforts to block the impending strike, Joshua senses the inevitability of his defeat. It's in this desperate moment that he calls upon Lukia, and the ensuing explosion rocks the arena. Returning to the present, Joshua stands amidst the aftermath, Lukia clutched tightly in his weary hands. Exhausted and barely able to remain upright, Shafan, astounded by the unexpected turn of events, observes Joshua's newfound possession with disbelief. Meanwhile, Caesar acknowledges Joshua's remarkable display, despite his limited battle experience, prompting Volmont to concede. Back in the arena, Joshua confronts Joker with a mixture of exhaustion and determination. Refusing to yield, Joker prepares to deliver what he believes will be the final blow. In that critical moment, Volmont intervenes, bringing the match to a halt. With a discerning gaze fixed upon Joshua, Volmont reflects on the remarkable feat of blocking Joker's B-rank attack within the confines of a mere C-rank mana test. He acknowledges that he had not initially considered Joshua to be stronger than himself, the esteemed genius of the Empire. Yet, now, Joshua's true strength shines through. Pointing his sword towards Joshua, Volmont solemnly declares, in accordance with His Highness's decree, that Joshua von Agnes, the second son of the Agnes Duchy, has ascended to the rank of C-rank knight. Upon hearing this proclamation, Joshua contemplates his newfound status. He harbors no desire to entertain the notion of being labeled a C-rank knight, but he also recognizes his physical limitations. He cannot afford to push himself any further, lest he reveal his weakened state to Caesar. With a steely resolve burning in his heart, Joshua vows to bide his time and exact his revenge upon Caesar and the emperor when the moment is ripe. In the aftermath of Caesar's assault, Duke Agnes rushes to Joshua's side, expressing concern for his well-being. As Joshua gazes upon the Duke's face, he recognizes an expression unseen in his past life. Despite the physical toll, Joshua assures Duke Agnes that he's fine. Determined, Joshua strides towards Valmont and raises his sword. In an unprecedented spectacle witnessed across the Avalon Empire and the entire continent, the birth of the youngest mana user unfolds. That night, a conference convenes at the Agnes Duchy to discuss the remarkable event. The scene transitions to the Agnes Duchy conference room, where Count Anhel instructs Armstrong to report on matters of importance. Armstrong reveals that all recently dispatched knights have abruptly returned. Furthermore, a surge in monster activity from the creature's forest, particularly the emergence of a black ogre, prompts the knight's hasty retreat. The black ogre, known as the strongest creature from the monster's haven, poses a formidable threat to the region. Black Orge can only be closely matched by a high-ranking magician of fourth class or higher, or a knight of B-rank or higher capable of wielding sword aura. The revelation sends shockwaves through the assembly, each member grappling with the gravity of the situation. In response, Duke Agnes asserts his intention to personally address the threat posed by the Black Ogre. With a decisive tone, he delegates the next topic to Armstrong, urging the meeting to move forward. Armstrong proceeds to the second matter at hand, concerning the five duchies. The mention of the five duchies catches Duke Agnes off guard, prompting him to wonder if Cheryl and Cox's visit to the Agnes duchy held a deeper significance. With a discreet nod, Duke Agnes signals his intent to delve into the matter privately at a later time. Count Anhel then invites any other attendees to contribute to the discussion. 
Chiffon seizes the opportunity, raising his hand to address the assembly. As all eyes turn to him, Chiffon reveals information concerning Earl Joshua. His mention prompts murmurs of surprise and admiration from those gathered, recognizing Joshua's remarkable achievement as the youngest C-rank knight, surpassing even Babel in his feet amidst the murmurs of astonishment. The significance of Earl Joshua's achievement dawns upon the Agnes Duchy. Chiffon steps forward, shedding light on the remarkable transformation of Earl Joshua, a figure once forgotten by the duchy until recent events brought him to the forefront. Chiffon recalls Joshua's past struggles, noting that his weakness had been so profound that it was believed he suffered from a genetic mana disability. The sudden elevation to the rank of C-rank knight baffles Chiffon, who questions whether talent alone could explain such a drastic improvement. Count Angel queries Chiffon's implications, prompting him to elaborate on his suspicions. Chiffon posits the notion that Earl Joshua may have sought assistance from creatures or demonic entities to bolster his abilities. Failing that, Chiffon struggles to comprehend how Joshua could have achieved his newfound status. Armstrong interjects, dismissing Chiffon's theory as a mere conjecture. However, Chiffon persists, drawing attention to the mysterious weapon wielded by Earl Joshua. This artifact, unseen and unheard of before, hints at a deeper connection to magic. Chiffon points out that artifacts imbued with magic are the only weapons capable of changing shape, yet the weapon Joshua wielded bore a striking resemblance to a spear. Such power, Chiffon argues, surpasses the capabilities of a mere spear, casting doubt on the origins of Joshua's newfound strength. As Chiffon's words hang in the air, a tense atmosphere descends upon the gathering. The mention of demonic magic sparks murmurs of concern among those seated at the table, for such practices are strictly forbidden. Chiffon's assertion gains traction as the assembly contemplates Joshua's sudden and remarkable growth. Observing the reactions around him, Chiffon can't help but smile knowingly. His suspicions seem to be gaining credence among his peers. However, his moment of triumph is interrupted as Joshua strides into the conference room. Without hesitation, Joshua approaches Chiffon, addressing him directly. He challenges Chiffon to put his suspicions to the test by facing Joshua in combat. If Chiffon truly doubts Joshua's skills, Joshua suggests that a duel would provide the ultimate proof. Upon hearing this, Chiffon couldn't help but perceive Joshua as remarkably cunning. Joshua's manipulation compelled Chiffon to brandish his sword against someone who held the fate of Chiffon's master's son. With every strike, Chiffon danced on a thin line between obedience and defiance, knowing that one wrong move could unleash his master's wrath upon him. If indeed Joshua's authority proved authentic, Chiffon would find himself ensnared in a labyrinth of trouble beyond measure. Joshua confronts Chiffon about his apparent hesitation, questioning if Chiffon is afraid of him. Encouraging Chiffon to show some spirit, Joshua challenges him to overcome any reservations, especially considering Chiffon's position as one of the four chief pillars leading the duchy. Chiffon, fueled by anger, responds by unleashing his aura, sending ripples of fear through the others at the table. The tense situation prompts Duke Agnes to intervene, urging both Joshua and Chiffon to cease their hostilities. Duke Agnes reminds them of a crucial factor Chiffon seems to have overlooked. Duke Agnes reveals that during Joshua's mana evaluation, members of the Imperial Order of Knights and Chief Magician Evergrant from the Imperial Castle were present. Armstrong emphasizes that if Joshua had indeed utilized creature power, someone among the witnesses would have noticed. Duke Agnes declares that this resolves the matter concerning Joshua. However, Duke Agnes adds that while this particular doubt has been cleared, there are still lingering questions. Duke Agnes acknowledges the widespread skepticism surrounding Joshua's sudden growth, not only among the vassals but within himself as well. To properly understand Joshua's strengths, Duke Agnes instructs Joshua to accompany him to the Black Creature's Forest, emphasizing the need to address these uncertainties. Amidst the stately atmosphere of the Grand Hall, Unease rippled through the assembly of counts as Duke Agnes unveiled his intention to venture alone into the foreboding depths of the Black Forest. The counts, with furrowed brows and exchanged glances, harbored concerns that such perilous encounters should be left to the valorous knights, sparing the esteemed duke from unnecessary jeopardy. After all, Duke Agnes was soon to embark on a journey to Acadie, prompting a collective urging for him to safeguard his well-being. In the midst of their deliberations, Armstrong, with a solemn nod, echoed the sentiments of the counts. However, Duke Agnes, with a hint of defiance, dismissed their apprehensions with a casual remark, prompting a hushed silence to settle over the gathering. Undeterred, the duke expressed his resolve to cleanse the sinister depths of the Black Forest before turning his attention to matters closer to home. 
With a determined tone, Duke Agnes revealed his plans to enroll Joshua, despite any reservations others might hold, into the prestigious Imperial Academy in the capital. Upholding the esteemed traditions of the Agnes lineage, the Duke pledged to afford Joshua every opportunity to flourish, recognizing the undeniable talent that lay within him. Yet, these words sparked frustration within Chiffon, for he knew that the Imperial Academy lay beyond his influence. Moreover, he feared the repercussions of Joshua's potential return, as it could plunge Earl Babel into the treacherous waters of succession warfare. Chiffon weighed his options carefully, feeling the weight of responsibility pressing down on him. Should he concoct a convincing excuse to keep Joshua at a safe distance, or should he consider more drastic measures? The thought of eliminating Joshua crossed his mind, but he quickly dismissed it as a rash and irreversible action. Just as he was grappling with his thoughts, Joshua approached Duke with an unexpected request. Duke, intrigued, inquired about the nature of Joshua's plea. With a determined tone, Joshua expressed his desire to accompany his mother to the capital. Chiffon's interjection sliced through the air, his voice tinged with urgency. Joshua, you cannot proceed in that manner. If only Lady Lucia is dispatched to the capital, Lady Vanessa will assuredly not remain idle, he asserted, his words carrying a weight of certainty. Joshua's response was swift, his tone tinged with skepticism. And what if Lady Vanessa chooses not to intervene? He challenged. With a furrowed brow, Joshua continued, suggesting a deeper implication to Chiffon's words. Are you insinuating that the Duke requires permission for such a trivial matter? The room fell into a stunned silence as the implications of Joshua's words settled in. Chiffon's mind raced, weighing the potential consequences of his statement. If he vocalized such a notion, it could be interpreted as a call for Duke Agnes to be more considerate of the Duchess, risking the displeasure of the ancestral gods. And Chiffon sensed the game being played. Carefully, Chiffon framed his response, expressing concern over potential rumors of favoritism towards Lady Lucia. It was a subtle maneuver, possibly hinting that the Duke should pay closer attention to the Duchess and displease the will of the ancestral gods. But before the tension could escalate further, Duke made his decision. He granted Joshua's request, allowing Lady Lucia to accompany him to the capital. Gratitude flooded Joshua's expression as he thanked Duke for his generosity. Duke Agnes couldn't shake the feeling that Joshua was far from ordinary. It had been ages since he'd encountered such an enigmatic presence, and even Babel, with all his complexities, didn't quite compare. With a furrowed brow, Duke addressed the counts, seeking affirmation. One by one, they voiced their agreement, aligning with Duke Agnes's judgment, much to his relief. The decision was settled. Turning to Armstrong, Duke Agnes issued instructions, his voice firm. Once the Font family reports were organized, Armstrong was to rendezvous with him, bringing along the dispatched knight. Armstrong nodded in understanding, his resolve evident. As Duke Agnes prepared to depart, he called out to Joshua, summoning him to his office. Yet, just as the air seemed charged with anticipation, Babel entered the conference room, catching Chiffon off guard. Babel approached. As Babel stepped forward to greet the Duke, Duke Agnes remarked that he hadn't noticed Babel's presence earlier, implying that Babel seemed to have arrived late. Babel, wearing a serious expression, offered a sincere apology, explaining that he needed some time alone to gather his thoughts. Observing Babel's demeanor, Duke Agnes couldn't shake the feeling that something had shifted within him as well. There was a noticeable change in the atmosphere surrounding Babel, though not necessarily in a negative way. Duke Agnes prompted Babel, suggesting that he must have a reason for seeking an audience with him. Curious, he asked Babel what was on his mind. Babel's gaze shifted towards Joshua, prompting an exchange between the two. Joshua, exuding confidence, queried if Babel had something to convey directly to him. Witnessing this exchange, Shaphan grew increasingly agitated, admonishing Joshua for his lack of decorum in a public setting. Reminding Joshua of Babel's elevated position, Shaphan emphasized the importance of propriety. Joshua's response cut through the tension. He identified Shaphan as Babel's spokesperson, highlighting Chiffon's unwavering loyalty to Babel and his status as a noble, bestowed upon him by Duke Agnes himself. Caught in the crossfire of hierarchy and allegiance, Chiffon grappled with the limits of his influence within the duchy. Attempting to clarify his intent, Chiffon insisted he was merely providing Joshua with insight into the intricacies of duchy etiquette. However, Joshua countered, asserting that merit and skill were the true arbiters of one's position within the Agnes duchy. If Chiffon sought to be heard, Joshua suggested he must first prove himself worthy, a principle deeply ingrained in the duchy's law. 
Left momentarily speechless by Joshua's confident rebuttal, Babel's response was unexpectedly gracious, assuring Shafan that Joshua's assertions were not unfounded. Observing this interaction, Duke Agnes couldn't help but reflect on the transformation within Babel. Gone was the arrogance that once defined him. Instead, Duke noted a newfound humility, reminiscent of a true knight. Addressing Joshua directly, Babel acknowledged the necessity of proving oneself through merit and skill. With determination, Babel vowed to strengthen himself, refusing to remain stagnant while others ascended. His words carried a weight that resonated with Joshua, who recognized a profound shift in Babel's demeanor since their last encounter. Seizing the moment, Joshua voiced his agreement, acknowledging the evolution in Babel's perspective. Turning to Duke Agnes, Babel made a surprising announcement. He expressed his desire to relinquish his formal position within the Agnes hierarchy. The room fell into stunned silence at Babel's declaration, with even Chiffon and the Counts taken aback by the decision. The Duke questioned Babel, suggesting that perhaps his confidence had wavered due to the arrival of a skilled competitor. Babel quickly dismissed the notion, affirming his unwavering self-assurance. He explained to the Duke that he simply wished to adhere to the principles of fair competition established by the Agnes House. Duke Agnes, considering the implications, assured Babel that his request would be duly considered. Gratefully, Babel expressed his appreciation to the Duke. As Duke Agnes concluded the meeting and departed, a subtle smile graced his lips. The shifting dynamics within the room didn't escape his notice. A sense of change lingered in the air. Though uncertain of what the future held for the duchy, Duke Agnes couldn't shake the feeling of optimism that washed over him. Meanwhile, in Duchess Vanessa's chambers, concern weighed heavily on her mind. Learning of Babel's decision to relinquish his position as heir and Joshua's departure for the capital with Lady Lucia only added to her worries. Chiffon confirmed the unsettling news, prompting frustration to bubble up within Duchess Vanessa. Expressing her frustration, Duchess Vanessa lamented the recent string of events, especially following the failure of the centurions. Babel's significance to her was undeniable, and the thought of his voluntary withdrawal pained her deeply. Chiffon, sensing her distress, offered his apologies, acknowledging his own limitations in influencing Babel's decision. Duchess Vanessa, however, understood the stubbornness that ran in Babel's blood, likening it to that of his father. She reassured Chiffon that his efforts would likely have been in vain against such resilience. With resolve in her voice, Duchess Vanessa vowed that such a scenario would never repeat itself. However, if Joshua happens to attempt taking Babel's position, Lady Vanessa will inform the Duke about the circumstances involving Lady Vanessa and Chiffon. Chiffon reassured her, firmly stating that such a scenario would never come to pass. Duchess Vanessa, finding solace in Chiffon's words, agreed wholeheartedly. She then inquired about Joshua's upcoming plans. Chiffon informed her that Duke Agnes intended to accompany Joshua to the locked territory the following day. Upon hearing this, Duchess Vanessa expressed her apprehension about the remote and perilous nature of the locked territory, noting that the journey typically took two days. Chiffon elaborated, mentioning the resurgence of trouble in the Black Creature's Forest and Duke Agnes's decision to address it personally. Lady Vanessa inquired of Chiffon whether, upon the Duke's return from locked territory, he would accompany Lucia to the capital. Chiffon confirmed this, acknowledging its accuracy. Subsequently, Lady Vanessa instructed Chiffon to convey a message to the Duke before his departure. She expressed her desire to dine with him, noting that it would mark their inaugural and concluding meeting. The next day, the courtyard bustled with activity as knights assembled and prepared for their journey to the locked territory. Workers hustled to gather horses and load the necessary supplies onto wagons bound for the northern reaches. Amidst the commotion, Joshua strolled among the preparations, a glint of excitement in his eyes as he admired the ring adorning his finger. The narrative pivots back to a few moments earlier, where the scene unfolds within the Duke's office. Duke Agnes briefed Joshua on their plans, informing him that once the disturbances in the Black Creature's forest subsided, they would set off for Akity. Before that momentous journey, however, Duke had a special task for Joshua. Presenting Joshua with a gift, Duke Agnes recounted a time when he had aided the owner of the Magic Tower, receiving the Dawn Ring in return. Recognizing the significance of this artifact, Joshua realized that it was one of the legendary creations of the tower's enigmatic owner. Infused with mana, the ring could bestow its wearer with protective armor. Instructing Joshua on its use, Duke encouraged him to infuse mana into the ring, promising that he would soon master its capabilities. Joshua couldn't help but voice his surprise to Duke Agnes 
questioning why the prestigious Don Ring was being bestowed upon him instead of the designated heir. Duke Agnes swiftly clarified, dismissing any misconceptions Joshua might have had. He explained that it would be a shame to let such a powerful artifact languish in storage, hence the decision to lend it to Joshua temporarily. But Duke Agnes had more to divulge. When Joshua pressed for further explanation, Duke Agnes revealed the additional benefit of the ring. When activated, it would conjure enchanted armor, each piece bearing the insignia of a different noble family. This, Duke explained, was to conceal Joshua's true identity from any prying eyes, safeguarding him against potential threats or opportunists seeking to exploit his connection to the Agnes lineage. In a candid moment, Duke Agnes disclosed Joshua's new fabricated identity, a Viscount's heir, nameless and anonymous. He urged Joshua to devise a suitable alias for himself, granting him the freedom to craft his own persona within the confines of their clandestine arrangement. As Joshua absorbed this information, a realization dawned upon him. The dual purpose behind concealing his identity and lending him the Dawn Ring became clear. It was a strategic move, designed to shield Duke Agnes's household from external scrutiny and potential threats, while simultaneously affording Joshua a valuable tool to navigate the intricate web of noble politics. With a newfound understanding, Joshua saw the advantages of his new role and the accompanying artifact. It would indeed prove advantageous in the face of encounters with powerful figures, ensuring his safety and preserving the integrity of Duke Agnes's house. Duke Agnes's question hung in the air, prompting Joshua to introspect. Did he harbor resentment towards the Duke? Upon hearing this, Joshua contemplates with a sense of uncertainty swirling within him. Even the esteemed Duke Agnes, a figure of great stature, had never envisioned his demise in such a futile manner amidst the impending war between empires, a conflict slated to unfold a decade hence. Perhaps it was the abandonment Joshua and his mother endured, left to fend for themselves, that ultimately led to his mother's demise. In his previous life, Joshua scarcely glimpsed the countenance of Duke Agnes, gradually allowing resentment to fade into the recesses of memory. With a wistful smile, Joshua contemplated the enigmatic bond between father and son, forged through the passage of time and the mending of old wounds. Indeed, as the adage went, time possessed a remarkable ability to heal. Returning to the present, Joshua found himself approached by Prince Caesar, noting the change in Joshua's demeanor. Caesar, sensing the shift, acknowledged Joshua's elevated spirits, playfully suggesting that he would need to address Joshua with the title of Sir henceforth. Curious, Joshua inquired about the reason behind Caesar's visit. With a casual air, Caesar relayed the rumor he had heard, that Joshua would depart for Akadi following the subjugation of the black creature's forest. As the prospect of Joshua's arrival in Akadi arose, Prince Caesar extended an invitation, suggesting that Joshua pay him a visit sometime. Caesar, confident it would be advantageous for Sir Joshua, hinted at the potential benefits awaiting him. Curious, Joshua questioned how such a visit could be helpful. Caesar explained his plan, detailing how recommending Joshua as a knight to the Order of the Imperial Knights would pave the way for a unique privilege. By securing this recommendation, Joshua could sidestep the annual Imperial Knights exam and skip the mandatory one-year service period upon passing. Essentially, Caesar proposed that Joshua could serve in the Imperial Knights at his leisure without the usual constraints. Caesar, grinning, emphasized that this offer allowed Joshua the freedom to depart whenever he pleased after utilizing the privileges of an Imperial Knight. He chuckled, candidly admitting his own greed and making such an enticing proposition. As Caesar laughed, Joshua couldn't help but find the mirth laced with pretense and hypocrisy repulsive. Despite the individuals behind Caesar, Joshua couldn't shake the urge to confront him then and there, spear in hand. However, he knew there were greater objectives at play, particularly his quest to obtain another cherished weapon from his past life, a weapon currently ensconced in the secretive confines of the Imperial Palace's warehouse, accessible only once a year. Joining the Imperial Knights and ascending to the rank of battalion commander seemed to be the key to unlocking this treasure. But for now, Joshua recognized the need to focus on immediate tasks at hand. Politely deferring Caesar's offer, Joshua excused himself, citing pressing matters demanding his attention. As he departed, Valmont offered a cryptic remark, hinting at the importance of humility in Joshua's journey. Caesar, dismissing Valmont's comment, urged their return, confident that Joshua would eventually acquiesce to his proposal. With their paths diverging, Joshua mulled over his resolve. This time around, he vowed not to be manipulated like a puppet. The tables would turn, and it would be Caesar who faced the consequences of his machinations.
The departure of forces under Duke Agnes's command was swift, with the Duke at the forefront. The expedition to the Black Creature's Forest was hastily assembled, notable for its relatively modest size considering the leadership of the country's Duke. Among the group were the Crimson Knights, led by Armand, the Soul Class IV wizard in the Agnes Duchy, along with Babel, Joshua, and a contingent of 100 others. Yet, amidst the journey, Joshua couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling of Babel's persistent gaze fixated on him. As the group reached the locked territory castle, situated in proximity to the ominous black creature's forest, Duke Agnes was met by Robin, the former senior knight of the Clover Knights, who had pledged his loyalty to House Agnes for decades. Descending from his horse, Duke Agnes expressed his regret to Robin, acknowledging the hardships he endured in this desolate region even after his retirement. In response, Robin humbly declared it an honor to continue serving Duke Agnes, demonstrating unwavering loyalty and dedication to their cause. Robin expressed his desire to lead a life where he could be with his family, prompting a sympathetic response from Duke Agnes. However, as the Viscount of the Locked Territory, Vigo, and his daughter Anna arrived, Duke Agnes couldn't help but feel a sense of irritation. In his opinion, Vigo's presence was an unnecessary hindrance, diverting attention from their primary objective, the forest. Vigo, evidently displeased by Robin's oversight, chastised him for failing to inform him of Duke Agnes's impending visit. Robin, frustrated but respectful, offered his apologies to Vigo. Duke Agnes interjected, remarking on Vigo's apparent adjustment to life in the locked territory, albeit with a hint of sarcasm regarding Vigo's expanding waistline. Unfazed by the thinly veiled critique, Vigo graciously attributed his newfound prosperity to Duke Agnes's support. Joshua couldn't help but find Vigo's response either oblivious or audacious. As Vigo turned his attention to Babel, complimenting his appearance, Babel acknowledged him as uncle. Upon spotting Joshua, Viscount Vigo's curiosity was piqued, prompting him to inquire about the young noble's identity. Chiffon stepped forward, introducing Joshua as Earl Joshua, the second son of a lord. Vigo, taken aback, expressed his surprise at being unaware of such a significant development within his own family. He questioned when Duchess Vanessa acquired an earl of this stature, only to be corrected by Chiffon, who clarified that Joshua wasn't from Duchess Vanessa's lineage. Surprised by this revelation, Vigo sought to discern Joshua's origins, prompting Chiffon to disclose that Joshua hailed from a non-noble background. Viscount Vigo's demeanor turned serious as he approached Joshua, dismissing him as a lowlife. Duke Agnes, growing increasingly frustrated, intervened, urging Vigo to cease his derogatory remarks and attend to more pressing matters. Undeterred, Viscount Vigo extended an invitation for a meal, suggesting that Duke Agnes take a moment to rest. Duke Agnes, however, rebuffed the offer, asserting the resilience of his knights and emphasizing their readiness to continue the journey without further delay. Duke Agnes asked his knights, seeking any who might desire rest. In unison, they vehemently declined, their determination resolute. With a resounding chorus of refusal, they surged forward, prompting Duke Agnes to command his soldiers to press on. Viscount Vigo, despite acknowledging his limited resources, insisted on joining the expedition. As the lord of the land, he felt compelled to contribute, a sentiment echoed by his knights. Moved by Vigo's determination, the knights of the locked territory pledged their support. Witnessing this display of unity, Duke Agnes turned to Vigo. Observing the situation, the duke inquires of Viscount Vigo about Anna's intentions, wondering if she plans to remain in the vicinity. Vigo assured Duke Agnes that Anna would remain by their side, prepared to offer whatever assistance she could. Expressing concern for Anna's safety, Duke Agnes questioned the wisdom of bringing a child into such perilous territory. Undeterred, Anna voiced her desire to accompany them, demonstrating her magical prowess by enveloping herself in a protective blue aura and summoning a spirit, a feat that surprised even Armand, the seasoned wizard among them. Viscount Vigo revealed to Duke Agnes that Anna possessed the rare ability to wield spiritual arts a form of magic exclusive to those born with innate talent. Sages, practitioners of spiritual arts, were even rarer than conventional magicians, with most kingdoms boasting fewer than a hundred sages, even among the weakest. Joshua, surprised by this revelation, marveled at the rarity of encountering a sage. Observing Anna, he couldn't recall ever hearing of a sage named Anna, yet her presence seemed oddly familiar, sparking a sense of recognition within him. With Duke Agnes issuing the command to depart, the group organized themselves for the journey ahead. Agnes's knights took the lead, Locke's knights secured the rear, and the rest fell in between. 
As preparations were made, Duke Agnes couldn't help but entertain the thought of acquiring a sage to bolster their ranks. Meanwhile, Anna gravitated towards Babel, prompting Joshua to ponder the significance of her presence. Aware that they would be in each other's company for the foreseeable future, Joshua contemplated Anna's potential role in his plans, weighing the importance of her abilities against his own objectives. Viscount Vigo issued a warning to Joshua, indicating his intent to keep a close eye on him. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to the Grand Throne Room of the Avalon Empire, where news of Joshua's exploits reached the ears of Emperor Marcus. Intrigued by Joshua's prowess in thwarting Joker's attacks, even managing to counterattack despite Joker's status as a B-rank expert, Marcus found the development noteworthy. Addressing Evergrant, Marcus sought his perspective on Joshua's abilities. Evergrant, cautious in his assessment as a magician, noted the differences in mana utilization between knights and magicians. However, Marcus urged Evergrant to express his true feelings and speculate on Joshua's potential. Considering the question, Evergrant chose to frame his response in terms of the Imperial Knights. He acknowledged that he and Sir Valmont had yet to engage in combat, but he confidently asserted that in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, he would emerge victorious over Valmont. Marcus acknowledged Valmont's exceptional accomplishments, noting his rise to battalion captain at a young age and his esteemed status within the Empire. However, he posited that Valmont would fall short in a match against Evergrant. Evergrant concurred, emphasizing the uniqueness of both Valmont and Joshua. Emperor Marcus, intrigued by Evergrant's assessment, probed further, questioning whether Evergrant believed he couldn't defeat Joshua. Evergrant clarified that while Joshua possessed potential, he wasn't currently a match for Evergrant. However, he speculated that Joshua might surpass him in skill within the next decade. Marcus, amused by the conversation, playfully suggested a hypothetical duel between himself and Evergrant. Evergrant hesitated, unsure of how to respond. Marcus, sensing Evergrant's discomfort, shifted the topic, expressing his fascination with Joshua and regretting not personally witnessing his abilities sooner. In a swift motion, Marcus signaled for a soldier named Jaken to emerge from the shadows. Emperor Marcus commanded Jaken to arrange for Joshua to remain at the palace for an extended period. Jaken relayed that the fourth prince, Caesar, had already initiated preparations for this purpose, which surprised the emperor. Jaken further informed Marcus that a recommendation letter from Caesar had been delivered to the imperial knights, specifically for Earl Joshua von Agnes. Marcus pondered this development, acknowledging that a recommendation letter was a viable option. While recognizing the purpose of the imperial knights, Marcus expressed disdain for the 11th and 12th battalions, viewing them as haphazardly assembled due to imperial recommendations. He instructed Jaken to keep him informed of any developments regarding the recommendation. After Jaken departed, Marcus contemplated Joshua's potential talent and whether it made him suitable for a particular role designated as that. The scene then shifted to the creature's forest, where Joshua found himself surrounded by monsters, prompting him to grimly acknowledge his perilous situation. The scene transitions to a few moments earlier, amidst the bustling activity of the camp. Soldiers toil away fortifying their positions, while Duke Agnes, alongside his trusted advisors Robin, Chiffon, Joshua, and Babel, huddle together deep in discussion, mapping out their strategies against the looming threat of the monsters. Suddenly, Viscount Vigo comes charging towards Duke Agnes, his urgency palpable as he questions the decision to halt their march and set up camp so perilously close to the forbidding expanse of the Black Creature's forest. Vigo's concern is clear. The vulnerability of their exposed position could invite a sudden onslaught from the monsters. Robin, observing Vigo's skepticism, can't help but feel a pang of frustration. He knows all too well that Vigo's priorities lie solely in his own interests, regardless of the larger dangers at play. Duke Agnes, in response to Vigo's inquiry, can't conceal his disappointment. It's evident to him that Vigo hasn't been paying attention. With a keen understanding of the forest rhythms, Duke Agnes explains how the monster's behavior is dictated by the time of day and lunar phases. Nightfall sees them pouring out of the forest like a flood, and under the crimson glow of a red moon, their ferocity knows no bounds. Yet, Duke Agnes knows there's a more pressing concern lurking beneath the surface. As the intervals between the monster attacks grow shorter, spreading fear among the citizens, Duke Agnes addresses Viscount Vigo's concerns. With night approaching, visibility will soon dwindle, rendering any attempt to engage the monsters futile. Duke explains that given the impending darkness and the monsters' inevitable surge, there's no necessity for the soldiers to venture into the forest. Vigo, impressed by Duke Agnes's foresight, 
expresses admiration for his insight. Duke, in turn, urges Vigo to take charge of setting up the camp, confident in his understanding of the situation. With a respectful acknowledgement, Vigo agrees to the task. Meanwhile, Duke instructs Joshua and Babel to remain vigilant at their respective posts. They acknowledge his orders without hesitation. The scene transitions to the depths of the forest, where Joshua and a group of soldiers gather wooden sticks. As they amass an ample supply, the soldiers suggest returning to camp. Joshua, however, insists they proceed, allowing the soldiers to depart first. Joshua finishes gathering a few more wooden sticks, and as the soldiers depart, reminding him to return on time, he sets his burden down and calls forth Lukia, his faithful companion. With a sense of urgency gnawing at him, Joshua knows this might be his only opportunity. Determinately, he sets off toward the heart of the forest, unaware that Viscount Vigo is stealthily observing his movements from afar. In the world of magic, there exists a coveted artifact known as the Genesis Stone, a wondrous item imbued with the power of creation. Legends speak of Genesis Stones for each elemental force, water, fire, wind, lightning, ice, and beyond. Yet, only five of these legendary stones have been discovered, their true potential still shrouded in mystery. Possessing the ability to elevate first circle magic to the potency of third circle spells, the Genesis Stone is a prize sought not only by magicians but also by knights seeking unparalleled power. Recalling rumors of a Genesis Stone hidden within the deepest reaches of the black creature's forest, Joshua presses onward into the darkening woods. With each step, the shadows deepen around him, yet his resolve remains unwavering. If he can just locate the Genesis Stone, as Joshua presses deeper into the forest, the allure of the Genesis Stone beckoning him with the promise of control over his overwhelming power. An hour passes, and Joshua begins to wonder if he's getting any closer to his destination. Yet, a persistent feeling nudges him forward, urging him to continue his journey. Suddenly, a surge of pressure grips Joshua, and his senses sharpen as he catches sight of a formidable black ogre looming ahead. Quickly ducking into hiding, Frustration courses through Joshua as he realizes the path to the forest center is blocked. Knowing the ogre's immunity to most low-level magic and the formidable challenge it presents to a mere novice, Joshua assesses his options. Recalling the solitary nature of black ogres and drawing upon past experiences, Joshua formulates a plan. With Lukia charged with energy as in previous tests, he believes he can swiftly dispatch the ogre. However, he's aware that getting within 10 meters risks detection. With determination, Joshua strategizes a bold leap, aiming to strike down the ogre in a single decisive blow. To Joshua's astonishment, the black ogre's roar is accompanied by an overwhelming surge of pressure, leaving him bewildered by its origin. Before he can fully comprehend the situation, the massive creature materializes before him, poised to strike. Startled, Joshua realizes he must evade the impending attack or face certain death. With reflexes honed by instinct, he narrowly avoids the ogre's devastating blow, which shatters the ground upon impact. Sensing an opportunity amid the chaos, Joshua swiftly dashes to the opposite side, putting distance between himself and the menacing creature. As he flees, his gaze catches the crimson glow of the red moon, a foreboding sign of heightened danger. Realization dawns upon him. Confronting the black ogre head-on would undoubtedly lead to his demise. With a quick decision, Joshua chooses stealth over confrontation. Seeking refuge, he ascends a nearby tree and settles onto a branch, aiming to conceal his presence entirely. Recalling the teachings of his old friend, the Assassin King, Joshua employs techniques learned long ago. Instead of channeling mana directly at a target, he focuses on masking his presence entirely, relying on cunning and subtlety to evade the beast's notice. Joshua concentrates intensely, manipulating the mana to cloak his body as if merging seamlessly with the objects surrounding him. With each passing moment, he becomes one with his environment, his breath stilled, and his awareness fading. The black ogre looms closer, its gaze sweeping over Joshua's concealed form. Miraculously, the ogre passes by without detecting him, leaving Joshua both relieved and amazed. Seizing the opportunity, Joshua breaks into a sprint toward the forest center, though the strain of maintaining his invisibility taxes his body. His progress halts abruptly when a tree branch gives way beneath his weight sending him crashing to the forest floor. His senses reeling from the fall, Joshua is confronted by a horde of goblins closing in on him. Aware of the imminent danger, Joshua's smirk betrays a hint of excitement as he decides to put his abilities to the test. With practiced precision, he unleashes his magic spearmanship, employing the second form, Gust, 
to devastating effect. Goblins fall before him in rapid succession, felled by his swift strikes. Despite his success, Joshua takes a moment to catch his breath, his mind racing with self-criticism. He knows he has yet to fully master the second stage of magic spearmanship, despite his impressive display. Joshua grapples with frustration as he realizes he can't muster even half of his usual power, a limitation imposed by his youthful body. Yet, he knows he can't afford to linger in his current state, especially as he observes the monster's trajectory, set to intersect with the camped-out knights imminently. Time is of the essence, and Joshua understands he must swiftly locate the Genesis Stone and join the ranks of the knights. Meanwhile, at the campsite, chaos erupts as a goblin ambush catches the knights off guard. Babel springs into action, engaging the goblins in fierce combat alongside his fellow knights. Among them, Cain's prowess with a blade stands out, his movements fluid and precise. Babel, impressed by Cain's skill, marvels at the unexpected talent within their ranks, recognizing him as a formidable warrior of at least C-rank caliber. Amidst the flurry of battle, a voice cuts through the din, drawing their attention. As they pivot to face the threat, the knights are met with the daunting sight of a vast horde of goblins. The sheer magnitude of the enemy force prompts urgent whispers among the knights, who recognize the necessity of a strategic retreat. However, before they can act, Shafan emerges from their midst, his voice cutting through the tension. Shafan's command is unwavering as he declares severe consequences for any who dare to flee. Rallying his comrades, he orders the Crimson Knights to form a steadfast line, preparing for the inevitable clash. With a resounding call to arms, the knights brace themselves for the impending battle. As the horde of monsters surges forward, the clash erupts in a cacophony of steel and fury. Babel dispatches several adversaries with precision strikes, while Cain's blade dances with deadly grace, claiming its own share of foes. Meanwhile, Shafan channels his inner strength, infusing his sword strikes with a radiant aura that cleaves through the enemy ranks. Despite their valiant efforts, Shafan is disheartened to witness the unending tide of monsters pouring forth. The appearance of the Red Moon, anticipated for midnight, has come prematurely, casting an ominous glow over the battlefield. In the midst of the chaos, Shafan's keen eyes spot a formidable black ogre, launching vicious attacks against his fellow knights. Knowing that only a knight of B rank or higher stands a chance against such a foe, Shafan resolves to confront the ogre head-on. With unwavering determination, he charges towards the creature, aiming to dispatch it with a single decisive strike. However, his confidence is shattered when the ogre effortlessly swats him aside, sending him crashing to the ground. As the ogre turns its attention to the fleeing knights, panic sets in among the ranks. Stunned and bewildered by his defeat, Shafan struggles to comprehend what went wrong. Amidst the turmoil, Duke Agnes emerges from the shadows, his presence commanding and reassuring. With calm authority, he admonishes Shafan for losing his composure and assures him that he will handle the situation. Standing firm before the horde of monsters, Duke Agnes unleashes a devastating slash of his sword, effortlessly cleaving through the enemy ranks with unparalleled skill. Witnessing Duke Agnes's display of power, Shafan is awestruck. In a single stroke, hundreds of monsters are vanquished, leaving no doubt in his mind about the true extent of Duke Agnes's legendary prowess the power of one of the continent's esteemed nine stars, Master Duke Agnes. The scene transitions to Joshua, who stands amidst the fallen monsters, his gaze drawn to a gaping hole in the ground. With a solemn expression, he calls out a name, Bronto. Suddenly, a potent energy surges from the depths of the hole, and amidst the pulsating glow, the Genesis Stone emerges, responding to Joshua's mana with an undeniable resonance. Meanwhile, back at the campsite, Duke Agnes towers triumphantly, having decimated the horde of monsters single-handedly. Babel watches in astonishment, struck by the display of power. Viscount Vigo remarks on Babel's potential, attributing it to the noble lineage he shares with Duke Agnes. However, Vigo acknowledges that despite Babel's talents, this is his first encounter with such overwhelming prowess, hence his surprise. Concern arises as Viscount Vigo realizes Joshua's absence. He queries Chiffon, who admits he hasn't seen Joshua either. The revelation prompts a sense of unease among the gathered knights. Viscount Vigo's concern echoes through the camp as he speculates on Joshua's whereabouts, suggesting the possibility of him attempting to fend for himself. The knights share his worry, realizing they haven't seen Joshua for some time. Unease settles among them as they ponder Joshua's stark differences from Earl Babel. Duke Agnes interjects, commanding their attention back to the ongoing battle. His authoritative presence compels the knights to refocus, feeling the weight of his aura bearing down on them. 
With Babel leading the charge and the knights rallying behind him, they launch a coordinated assault on the remaining monsters, their confidence rising as they make headway. However, their progress is abruptly halted as a horde of black ogres storms into the fray, bolstering the monsters' ranks. The knights find themselves pushed back, forced into a defensive stance against the relentless onslaught. Despite their efforts, the ferocity of the black ogres proves overwhelming, striking down several knights with devastating efficiency. Shafan, observing the chaos, realizes the challenge they face is far greater than anticipated. Yet, amidst the turmoil, he senses an aura of unparalleled strength looming on the horizon. In a dramatic entrance, Joshua appears soaring through the air, unleashing a thunderous bolt of lightning that strikes the black ogre squarely in the head, eliciting a dazzling display of power. Shafan and Viscount Vigo stand in stunned disbelief at the sight, while Duke Agnes watches with a proud smile gracing his lips. As the smoke clears, Joshua stands victorious, having felled the formidable black ogre with a single decisive blow. Shafan can hardly believe what he's witnessing, a mere sea rank knight defeating a black ogre, heightened by the Red Moon's influence, at twice its normal strength. Frustration tinges Viscount Vigo's voice as he questions the sudden appearance and timing of Joshua's intervention. In his opinion, Joshua must have been hiding until the opportune moment, and he attributes Joshua's success to Duke Agnes's support. Urging Locke's knights to assist Duke Agnes, Vigo emphasizes the critical role played by timing in Joshua's feet, despite acknowledging Joshua's talent as an earl. After all, in Vigo's eyes, Joshua remains a C-rank knight. As the Locke knights engage the remaining ogres in battle, Joshua feels a surge of determination. No longer content to be underestimated, he resolves to show the knights what he's truly capable of. Aware that pushing his limits might lead to exhaustion, Joshua trusts in Duke Agnes's support if needed. Leading the charge, Joshua taps into Bronto's power, his compatibility with the entity allowing him greater control. Yet, he remains uncertain how much strain his body can endure. Undeterred, he launches himself at the nearest ogre, unleashing his Thunderbolt wind skill once more. With a resounding strike, the ogre falls, but the exertion takes its toll on Joshua. Breathless and weary after utilizing Thunderbolt twice, drained from the immense effort. Yet, Despite his fatigue, a sense of satisfaction washes over him, knowing he has proven his worth to the knights. On the other side of the battlefield, Viscount Vigo and the soldiers stand in astonishment as they witness Joshua's remarkable feat, felling the black ogre with a single strike. They know well the formidable nature of the ogre, impervious to all but the most powerful sword auras from B-rank knights. Speculation ripples among the knights, perhaps Joshua is a magic swordsman of extraordinary skill. Observing Joshua standing tall amidst the aftermath, Duke Agnes marvels at his resilience. He recognizes Joshua's determination to conceal any hint of weakness. Armand approached Duke Agnes, conveying his admiration for Joshua. It seemed logical to Armand that the Duke would be vigilant regarding Joshua's actions. Inquisitive, Duke Agnes inquired about Armand's perspective on Joshua's prowess. Armand, viewing Joshua through the lens of a magician, notes the complexity of his techniques, suggesting capabilities beyond even a third-class master. In Armin's eyes, Joshua possesses the potential to reshape not only the country's fate but that of the entire continent. Suddenly, Joshua reaches his limit and collapses, just as the Black Ogre prepares to strike. With lightning speed, Duke Agnes rushes to his aid, dispatching the Ogre with a single decisive blow, sparing Joshua from harm. In that critical moment, Duke Agnes's swift intervention saves Joshua from certain peril. As Joshua's eyelids parted, the sight that greeted him was one of chaos, Agnes' duchy palace ablaze against the night sky. He struggled to grasp the reality of what lay before him. Hovering in an ethereal state, Joshua's mind began to reconcile the scene as a dream. Yet, the deafening explosion shattered any semblance of tranquility, plunging him into a maelstrom of doubt. His gaze fixated on Babel emerging from the inferno, wounded and vulnerable. A wave of foreboding washed over Joshua as he contemplated the fate of Agnes Duchy, an event prophesied to unfold a decade hence. Bewildered by the vividness of the dream, Joshua pondered its significance. Could it be a glimpse into the future, propelled by the enigmatic powers of Bronto? The notion of precognition loomed large, amplified by the mystical aura of the Genesis Stone. Joshua marveled at the untapped potential of such ancient artifacts, even surpassing the knowledge of revered magicians from the illustrious Magic Tower. A sudden gust roused Joshua from his contemplation, prompting him to question its origin. Before he could ponder further, his attention was drawn to Babel's perilous encounter with an assailant. 
a figure emerged, a young woman, accompanied by a celestial blue lion, poised in defensive babble. Joshua's astonishment deepened upon recognizing the girl before him as Annabelle Grace, her presence accompanied by the dignified Wind Sea Lion spirit. Although memories of Anna had been elusive to Joshua until this moment, the unmistakable presence of the sea lion solidified his certainty. There was a connection, a past entwined with Agnes Duchy and Anna. Contemplating Anna's appearance led Joshua to surmise the involvement of her enigmatic mentor. Babel's dialogue with Anna remained veiled to Joshua's ears, as if a shroud of silence enveloped him, hindering his perception. Suddenly, a figure materialized before Babel, cloaked in swirling smoke. Despite Joshua's efforts to approach and decipher the conversation, his senses remained ensnared. Yet, intuition guided him to identify the mysterious figure as Anna's mentor. Drawing closer, Joshua caught a fragment of Babel's words, questioning Anna's belief in Agnes Duchy's vulnerability to a mere crossbreed organization. A smug grin played across the mentor's features in response, igniting intrigue within Joshua's mind. As the sea lion surged forward, its momentum crashing into Babel, Joshua finally caught a glimpse of the assailant's face. Frustration clawed at him as recognition dawned. It was Draxia Vel Grace. Yet, before Joshua could process further, a blinding light enveloped him, and he awoke in his bed, breathless, his voice echoing Draxia Vel Grace into the stillness of his room. The vividness of the dream lingered, prompting Joshua to ponder its nature. Was it merely a dream or something more prophetic? As he attempted to rise, pain coursed through his body, a reminder of the rigorous training in magic spearmanship. Joshua contemplated his progress in magic spearmanship, convinced that he had advanced to the second stage following the initial phase. However, he couldn't help but notice that the current second stage of magic spearmanship resembled the pinnacle skills of a Searank knight. Despite this, Joshua couldn't dismiss the power he exhibited against the monsters with his magic spearmanship. He speculated that with such capabilities, he might even stand a chance against early stage Beerank knights. This phenomenon likely stems from Bronto's possession of the Thunderbolt attribute. Furthermore, if the precognitive dream ability is another facet of Bronto's power, it underscores the importance of delving deeper into the Genesis Stone. Suddenly, Duke Agnes appeared beside him, as he remarked, Isn't it interesting? The Crimson Moon, once a looming threat that seemed poised to engulf the entire world just hours ago, now bathed everything in an exquisitely beautiful moonlight. Joshua, absorbing this transformation, found himself at a loss for words. The Duke broke the silence, informing Joshua of their imminent journey to the Academy upon returning to the Duchy. As the Duke reiterated Joshua's altered identity as the scion of the fallen Frederick Viscounty, a noble endeavor to restore the tarnished legacy, Joshua acknowledged the gravity of his new role. His response was measured, expressing understanding. Joshua recognized the wisdom in embracing a more subdued role, steering clear of the relentless scrutiny that came with being at the center of attention. Prioritizing the recovery of his strength from his past life took precedence for Joshua. Duke Agnes, however, injected a note of intrigue into the conversation. With a somber expression, he disclosed that Joshua had uttered an interesting name in his sleep, Draxia Vel Grace. Duke Agnes, his curiosity evident, pressed Joshua to explain how he came to know such a cursed name. Duke stood up from his seat and left the room, advising Joshua that he should get to sleep for the night as they would be returning to the estate first thing tomorrow. The scene then shifts to a secret room in Lodge Castle, where Viscount Vigo questions Chiffon about whether Vanessa, Vigo's sister, is aware of Joshua. Chiffon assures Vigo that Duchess Vanessa is indeed aware of Joshua's prowess. Viscount then asks Chiffon if Vanessa is turning a blind eye to the potential danger Joshua poses to Babel's air position. Chiffon explains that it's not the case. Rather, Duchess Vanessa hasn't had the opportunity to address Joshua yet. Until now, Joshua was merely a child performing errands in the stables. Who could have predicted that he was hiding such incredible talent? Vigo expresses disbelief, suggesting that Chiffon is implying that the son of a concubine awakened his talent on his own, which seems unbelievable. Vigo points out that even young Lord Babel, considered the Empire's greatest talent, reached his current position with systematic family support from a young age. And Babel had also received personal guidance from Duke Agnes himself. On the other hand, the concubine's son, Joshua, didn't receive any support or guidance from anyone. Yet, Joshua managed to defeat a black ogre with skills greater than those of a Searank knight. Viscount Vigo asserts that Joshua definitely wasn't a Searank knight. Even among the Searank knights present in the forest, not a single one could display abilities like Joshua's. 
Chiffon tells Vigo that it's impossible for a C-rank knight to possess such skills, and it's because all those knights believe that Joshua is a magic knight. Viscount Vigo tells Chiffon that he doesn't believe Joshua is a magic knight, considering Joshua's circumstances, the other possibility holds more credibility. Chiffon asks Viscount Vigo what he means by the other. Vigo explains that he means the great power that suddenly appeared one day. It's more than possible if Joshua made a contract with a high-ranking demon. Chiffon tells Vigo that it's impossible, as young master Joshua has been acknowledged by the Duke and everyone in the Imperial Knight Order. And Chiffon was present for Joshua's ranking duel, yet he couldn't sense any demonic energy from Joshua. Viscount Vigo tells Chiffon that it's not important whether Joshua has contracted with a high-ranking demon or not. Upon hearing this, Chiffon smirks, indicating that he understands what Viscount Vigo means by that. Viscount Vigo then tells Chiffon that fortunately, Joshua is still a child compared to his abilities, suggesting that Joshua may have wanted to show off his power. Now, Viscount Vigo intends to demonstrate to Joshua that such actions will only tighten the noose around his neck. Chiffon asks Viscount Vigo what his plans are. Vigo responds that he will continue to keep an eye on Joshua for now, especially since Viscount Vigo's daughter, Anna, is also attending the Imperial Academy. Chiffon assures Vigo that obtaining information from Anna will be easy. Viscount Vigo advises Chiffon to start paying attention to this matter as well, warning that things will become a massive headache if Joshua starts desiring the position of heir. Chiffon tells Viscount Vigo that he will take measures before that happens. Viscount Vigo expresses his trust in Chiffon's abilities and leaves. The scene then shifts to Agnes Duchy, where Cheryl is on the balcony. Count Cox enters and delivers emergency news to Cheryl. Annoyed, Cheryl asks Count Cox why he is making such a fuss. Count Cox informs Cheryl that young Lord Joshua is planning to return after completing the subjugation in the Forest of Dark Beings, and he heard that the servants are preparing a grand feast. Cheryl responds half-heartedly. Observing her demeanor, Count Cox asks Cheryl why she is unhappy, as he thought Lady Cheryl would be welcoming Joshua. Cheryl questions why Cox would think so, as he didn't particularly like young Master Joshua. Cox explains that Joshua was a mere concubine son at the time, but now he is the first person ever to become a mana user at age 10. Cheryl acknowledges the wealth and fame of the Pontier family, but Cox notes that there are things money cannot buy. Cheryl asks Cox to specify what those things are. Cox asks Cheryl if she knows why Duke Pontier sent them to Agnes Duchy. Cheryl responds that it's because of the mercenary king and her father's efforts to connect her with Babel. Who would have thought that the mercenary king would side with the Crombell family? The mercenary king, named Barbariant, is a swordsman of commoner origin who rose to A rank. Barbariant is also renowned as a master of the axe and is one of the twelve superhumans who can compete for the absolute seed of the nine stars. He became a hero among mercenaries and united those who lacked a sense of belonging. Barbariant is also known as the mercenary king globally. However, the problem for the Pontier family arises from a spy informing them that the mercenary king secretly joined forces with Marquis Crombell. Marquis Crombell boasts the greatest wealth after Duke Pontier in the Avalon Empire. As fellow merchants, both the Pontier and Crombell families have always clashed, and now it seems that a battle for territory could erupt between them at any time. Cheryl remarks that whether the intelligence is false or true, the Pontier family won't be able to handle the Crombell family and the mercenary king on their own if it's accurate. Furthermore, they can't disclose this information to anyone else. Cox reminds Cheryl that she's well aware of the two families' pride as merchants and emphasizes the sensitivity of rumors. If word spreads about the two families engaging in a territorial battle, it could have significant repercussions. Cox points out the obvious. Other families aiming for their trading areas will take advantage of the situation. Though territorial wars are strictly forbidden by the Empire, there's an ongoing silent war among the families. The key will be how quickly one side can suppress the other when a true territorial war breaks out. Cheryl infers that Cox is suggesting that the Pontier family can't simply buy superhumans like the mercenary king with money, which is why Duke Pontier is attempting to arrange Cheryl's engagement with Babel. So, the Pontier family can seek help from Duke Agnes. Upon hearing this, Cox tells Cheryl that's precisely the idea. Cheryl responds by telling Count Cox that although she admires strong individuals after learning the truth, she can't help but feel bitter. Cox, surprised by this revelation, doesn't fully comprehend what's happening. Typically, Cheryl would assert herself as the key to the entire plan. However, Cheryl explains to Count Cox that she doesn't need to ask Duke Agnes for help. 
Cox then explains to Cheryl that Duke Agnes differs from the mercenary king. He emphasizes that Cheryl might not fully grasp the situation, but for nobles, especially those belonging to the five great families, nothing is more important than their pride. Cox adds that the family may believe there's no need for the Pontier family to bow down first, especially when Pontier isn't in an emergency situation. Cheryl inquires if Cox thinks differently. Cox responds by stating that, at the very least, he wouldn't prioritize pride over the family's safety. Furthermore, he acknowledges that he already knows Cheryl isn't genuinely interested in young Lord Babel. Count Cox hopes that Cheryl will not be sacrificed for the sake of the family. However, the Pontier family has no other way to avoid this emergency. Though it was only for a moment, the way Cheryl acted towards Lord Joshua didn't seem fake to Count Cox. Therefore, Count Cox hopes that Cheryl will have a serious conversation with young Lord Joshua at least once. Cheryl becomes emotional upon hearing this. She then tells Count Cox that she will meet with Joshua before he departs for the capital. Cheryl instructs Count Cox to prepare an opportunity for them to have a meal together. Upon hearing this, Count Cox becomes happy and assures Cheryl to leave everything to him. As Count Cox takes his leave, Cheryl sighs, contemplating what she would talk about with Joshua. On that day, the Crimson Knight Order returned from the Lodge territory, and a grand feast was prepared in Agnes' duchy after a long time. As all the knights were enjoying their meals, we see Joshua walking through the corridor with Cain. Cain addresses Joshua as his liege and questions whether today's main character is allowed to leave the grand feast so soon. Upon hearing this, Joshua remarks that Cain has begun to address him as his liege so naturally, and he's certain it would cause a scene if anyone overhears Cain calling him liege. Cain reassures Joshua that he didn't make it up and expresses certainty that after the subjugation, he will serve Joshua as his liege. Joshua smiles in response and questions whether he has any say in the matter, as he believes he has the right to refuse the knight's oath. Cain counters by expressing his belief that Joshua is not ignorant enough to refuse a subordinate who will eventually become a master. Joshua retorts that Cain is more arrogant than he had initially thought, to which Cain thanks him for the compliment. Joshua then instructs Cain to head back for the day as he is tired and would like to rest in his room. Cain assures Joshua to rest comfortably and reiterates that he was serious about what he said earlier. As Cain believes that he has a lot to learn from Joshua, disregarding Joshua's monstrous skills, he would be honored if Joshua could give him the opportunity to serve as his liege. Joshua tells Cain that he will think about this. Cain then takes his leave, assuring Joshua to call for him whenever he needs him. Joshua reflects that there were some people who wanted to follow him in his previous life, and of course, Joshua politely refused all of them. He had decided to become Caesar's only friend and sword. Joshua thought that if people started to gather under him, then Caesar would start to be vigilant of him, which is why he refused them all. However, Caesar eventually still betrayed Joshua, and the painful memories from that time raced through Joshua's head. Suddenly, an old man approaches Joshua and asks if he is feeling all right. Joshua tells the old man that he is fine and that he doesn't need to worry about him. Instead, he asks the old man where he is heading. The old man informs Joshua that he came to tell him that there is a meal prepared for him and everyone is waiting for him. Joshua tells the old man that he had informed everyone that he wouldn't be participating since he wasn't feeling well. The old man clarifies that it's not just a feast but a seat that Duchess Vanessa has prepared for Joshua and Joshua's mother, Lucia, has also attended. Joshua gets surprised hearing this. Then we see Joshua walking into the room where Duchess Vanessa has arranged the food. Joshua firstly greets his mother. Lady Vanessa then invites Joshua to come in, mentioning that it's the first time they've met. However, Joshua doesn't reply to Lady Vanessa. Seeing this, Shafan becomes mad and tells Joshua to mind his manners, reminding him that Lady Vanessa is the Duke's wife. Joshua gazes at Shafan with a serious look, which frustrates Shafan. Joshua's mother, Lucia, then tells Joshua to greet Lady Vanessa. Upon hearing his mother's prompting, Joshua introduces himself with Agnes as his surname. Hearing the Agnes name, Vanessa becomes frustrated, but she decides to hold back her frustration, knowing she won't need to see Joshua again after today. With a smile, Lady Vanessa informs Joshua that she heard he will be departing for the capital soon. Lucia, surprised, asks Vanessa what she is talking about. Shafan explains to Lucia that Joshua has been recognized as a C-rank knight, so the Duke will be bringing Joshua to the academy. Upon hearing this, Lucia becomes happy and congratulates her son, Joshua, on becoming a knight. 
Lady Vanessa tells Lucia that she has prepared this dinner as a means of congratulating Joshua for becoming a knight. Vanessa sincerely expresses her regret for not being able to pay attention to Joshua and Lucia all this time. If Lucia harbors any ill feelings because of that, Vanessa hopes that Lucia can let go of those feelings with this dinner. Lucia assures Vanessa that she doesn't have any ill feelings toward her. Upon hearing this, Vanessa rings her bell, and then the servants bring the food in. Upon seeing the food, Joshua smirks. After the servants set the food on the table, Joshua takes his seat. Then Lucia tells Joshua to be respectful towards Vanessa. Vanessa mentions that this dinner was prepared for Lucia and Joshua, so she wonders if this makes them uncomfortable. Lucia reassures Vanessa that it doesn't. Vanessa expresses relief, mentioning that she was worried that Lucia didn't like her. Vanessa explains that she planned this dinner with the intention of growing closer to Lucia from the bottom of her heart. Hearing this, Lucia becomes happy and expresses her gratitude to Vanessa for taking care of her and Joshua like this. As Vanessa starts to eat her food, and Lucia is about to take her first bite, we see Vanessa smirking. But at that moment, Joshua stands up and says that before they start eating, he would like to apologize to Lady Vanessa. He tells her that she has put so much effort into caring for him and his mother, and he apologizes for not being able to introduce himself to her earlier. Vanessa reassures Joshua that it's all right, and he doesn't need to worry about this, encouraging him to have his dinner comfortably. However, Joshua insists that Vanessa reached out to him and his mother first, but they were unable to accept her kind gesture. Surprised, Lucia asks Joshua what he's talking about. Joshua explains to his mother that he feels Duchess Vanessa has done too much for them, especially considering she doesn't have much food in front of her while they have so many delicacies. Then, Joshua tells Vanessa that since it's his last meal before he departs, he hopes they can enjoy dinner together. In his mind, Joshua reflects that he has encountered such threats to his life numerous times, and this method typically involves poison. As expected, Vanessa has cleverly poisoned only Joshua and his mother's food with a type of poison that is difficult to detect and doesn't leave much of a trace. Joshua suggests to Duchess Vanessa that since it's their first time having a meal together, they should enjoy it together. Vanessa responds by telling Joshua that she's not just putting an extra effort to make him and his mother comfortable. Rather, it's because Vanessa has been gaining weight, so she has been paying attention to what she eats. Joshua tells Lady Vanessa that there is no need for her to maintain her figure, as she is already very beautiful. Hearing this, Vanessa smiles and tells Joshua that he flatters her too much. In her mind, Vanessa thinks that maybe Joshua has realized that there is poison in their food, and if she kept insisting on not eating because she wants to maintain her figure, Joshua would definitely become more suspicious. Then Joshua asks Vanessa why she is in such deep thought, stating that it's not like she has put poison in their food. Hearing this, Chiffon tells Joshua to stop being disrespectful towards Duchess Vanessa and questions why there would be poison in Joshua's food. With a serious look, Joshua retorts that he isn't being disrespectful. Rather, what Chiffon is doing is called being disrespectful. He questions who Shafan thinks he is talking to. Frustrated by Joshua's glaring eyes, Shafan thinks that Joshua has been exuding killing intent towards him just now. Shafan wonders how a C-rank knight could control his killing intent to this extent. Then Joshua tells Lady Vanessa that he initially intended what he said to be a joke, but after observing Sir Shafan's reaction, he realized that it wasn't a joke after all. He asks Lady Vanessa if she really put poison into his and his mother's food. Lady Vanessa becomes angered hearing this. Then, Shafan takes out his sword and declares that Joshua will be punished this instant for insulting royalty. Despite Joshua being a part of the Duke's bloodline, Shafan claims he can't let Joshua off any longer. Seeing Shafan draw his sword against Joshua, Joshua summons Lucia. He informs Shafan that not only was there poison in the food, but Shafan drawing his sword against him cannot be overlooked anymore. Joshua begins to emit his aura, and feeling it, Shafan deduces that Joshua must be at least a B-rank based on what he's feeling. Furthermore, Joshua possesses a high-rank artifact capable of dimensional space magic. Now that they've both drawn their swords, Shafan realizes he can't feign ignorance. He fears that if he leaves Joshua alone, Joshua's strength will only increase. Thus, Shafan decides to take care of Joshua here and now. As they both prepare to attack, a voice intervenes, telling them to stop. The scene then shifts to Prince Caesar. While Caesar is engrossed in reading a book, Evergrant enters and informs Caesar that he has received a letter from Agnes Duchy. As Caesar takes the letter from Evergrant, 
He remarks that it seems Joshua has finally made a decision. He then asks Evergrant if he has perhaps looked at the letter. Evergrant responds that no, he has not examined the letter, as he thought it might be insolent of him to do so. Therefore, Evergrant brought the letter directly to Caesar. As Caesar opens the letter, wondering if Joshua has accepted his offer, Evergrant expresses confidence that Joshua would have accepted, considering the Imperial Knight Order is a place where all of the Empire's knights dream of beings, and only a fool would reject such an offer. While Caesar reads the letter, he starts to laugh. Then suddenly, he tears the letter and, with a serious look, declares that things are going to be interesting with Joshua. The scene transitions back to the dinner table, where Duke Agnes directs his attention to Chiffon, inquiring about his current activity. Chiffon, unable to formulate a response, meets the Duke's query with silence. Vanessa enters the room and informs the Duke that she contacted Lucia, and Joshua is present as well. Vanessa suggests they enjoy a meal together before departing. However, her expression betrays frustration as she recounts Duke Agnes' decision to take Lucia and Joshua to the capital. Despite her agitation, Duke Agnes remains stoic. His gaze shifts to Joshua and the food before him as he prompts Chiffon to cease his idle stance. Chiffon complies, drawing his sword. Duke Agnes informs Joshua that it's time for Lucia and Joshua to head back to their room because they have an early departure tomorrow morning. Joshua then escorts his mother out of the room, leaving behind a palpable tension. Lady Vanessa, sensing the strained atmosphere, questions Duke Agnes's sudden behavior, wondering if it stems from newfound paternal affection. In response, Duke Agnes confronts Vanessa, probing whether she harbors animosity towards him. Vanessa doesn't mince her words, admitting her disdain for the Duke. Duke Agnes queries Vanessa about her feelings, questioning whether her resentment stems from his sudden interest in Joshua. In response, Vanessa's temper flares, and she vehemently demands that Duke Agnes cease bringing the illegitimate child into her presence. Accusing him of neglecting her for Joshua, Vanessa questions if Duke Agnes married her merely to display such behavior. She accuses him of prioritizing the duchy over their relationship, claiming that his actions suggest he doesn't care about her. Vanessa asserts that she won't engage in futile discussions, emphasizing her royal birth and the coerced marriage to Duke Agnes. While acknowledging that she didn't marry him out of love, she warns Duke Agnes that she won't remain silent if Joshua negatively impacts Babel, as Babel holds the same significance to her as the duchy does to him. Vanessa makes it clear that she expects Duke Agnes to uphold basic respect as the Empire's strongest noble. Vanessa holds firm in her belief that Duke Agnes will act in accordance with expectations. However, Duke Agnes's response catches her off guard. He accuses Vanessa of preaching about basic respect while failing to demonstrate it herself. Perplexed, Vanessa presses Duke Agnes for clarification. His tone turns heated as he reveals that Vanessa underestimated his awareness, pointing out the poison he detected in Joshua and Lucia food. The revelation shocks both Vanessa and Chiffon. Chiffon wonders if Duke Agnes had prior knowledge of the situation. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Joshua's room, where Lucia questions why Joshua didn't inform her of the danger. Before Joshua can respond, there's a knock on the door. It's Kane. As Joshua opens the door, Kane casually inquires about Joshua's meal. Joshua, taken aback, asks if Kane was aware of the poison. Kane explains that he deduced it from Joshua's absence in his room and the butler's comment about Joshua leaving for a delicious meal. Joshua is stunned, realizing the depth of Vanessa's preparations. He begins to suspect the butler's involvement as well. Kane then mentions hearing about Joshua's impending departure for the capital adding another layer of tension to the unfolding situation. As the conversation progresses, Kane expresses his personal endorsement of Joshua's decision to attend the academy, recognizing it as a secure environment for Earl Joshua to refine his abilities. Kane sees it as an opportunity for mutual growth, envisioning himself learning alongside Joshua in the same setting. Joshua, however, questions Kane's purpose in coming all the way to convey this sentiment. Kane then reveals that he has a favor to ask of Joshua. Curious, Joshua prompts Cain to elaborate. With utmost sincerity, Cain reiterates his earlier sentiments and humbly requests the honor of serving Joshua as his lord. Joshua is taken aback by this unexpected proposal. While acknowledging the potential benefits of having skilled subordinates, Joshua realizes there's a crucial matter to address first. He queries Cain about his understanding of the path Joshua intends to pursue, emphasizing that if Cain's intention is merely to play the role of a noble knight, then he has come to the wrong place. Joshua wants to ensure that Cain is aligned with his aspirations before making any decisions regarding Cain's request for servitude. 
As the gravity of Joshua's chosen path dawns on him, he acknowledges the potential backlash Cain might face for aligning himself with such a bloody journey. Despite this, Joshua inquires if Cain remains steadfast in his desire to serve. Cain's response is unwavering. A knight's duty is to trust and follow their lord, even if it means traversing a path soaked in blood and tainted with its stench. With a solemn gesture, Cain presents his sword before Joshua, signifying his commitment to this singular choice. He's willing to stake his life on being Earl Joshua's knight, viewing it as an honorable opportunity. Moved by Cain's loyalty, Joshua smiles and accepts, taking Cain's sword in affirmation. The scene transitions to the following day as Joshua and the Duke prepare to depart for the capital. Knights gather to bid them farewell, then the Duke asks Joshua if he will truly be okay. Joshua reassures the Duke that this level of assistance is sufficient for him. The Duke then remarks to Joshua that although he may appear like a fallen noble outwardly, he will still require more attendance and will lack in many ways with just a knight. Joshua responds to Duke Agnes, reminding him of how he used to live and asserting that even just this one person is more than adequate for his needs. As Duke Agnes prepares to leave the duchy, Cheryl rushes towards him. She quickly apologizes for her unexpected appearance, expressing that sending the Duke off without a proper goodbye wouldn't be appropriate. Duke Agnes points out Cheryl's improved demeanor compared to Fonsel and Iceland's departure, noting that she seems to be feeling better. Cheryl credits Duke Agnes for her positive change, prompting him to remark on her transformation from a tomboy to a more refined lady. He expresses that he didn't mind Cheryl's previous behavior, finding it refreshing since he lacks a daughter. Cheryl, delighted by Duke Agnes's words, suggests she should continue acting as she used to before. Observing Cheryl's familiar demeanor, Duke Agnes remarks, that's more like the Cheryl I know. He then inquires if she plans to accompany him to the capital considering her father's presence in Akiti. Cheryl expresses gratitude for the offer, but explains that she has promised to visit Cox's family. Cox interjects, suggesting Cheryl doesn't need to uphold such a promise, but Cheryl clarifies that it's not a commitment made with Count Cox, but rather with Cox's beloved partner, Anna. Turning to Joshua, Cheryl requests a private conversation. Joshua, feeling a twinge of nervousness, wonders what Cheryl has in mind. Observing Joshua's anxious expression, Cheryl reassures him not to be so nervous, explaining that she simply wants to give him something. With a gentle gesture, Cheryl retrieves her family's token and presents it to Joshua, urging him to visit her duchy upon reaching Accardi. Count Cox, taken aback, warns Cheryl against impulsively giving away her family token. Joshua's curiosity prompts him to question Cheryl's gesture. In response, Cheryl offers a simple explanation likening her token to an invitation for Joshua to visit her in Akardi should he find himself in the area. However, the murmurs among the gathered knights soon turn speculative, speculating on the potential romantic implications of Cheryl's gift. They dub it a symbolic love letter from Princess Cheryl to Lord Joshua. Joshua's unease grows as he contemplates the repercussions of rejecting Cheryl's gesture in front of the esteemed knights, fearing it would only fuel rumors and draw unwanted attention. He realizes that it may take years for him to regain the strength he once had and that hiding his true identity would become futile if he were to become as powerful as before. Meanwhile, Cheryl, overcome with emotion, tearfully insists that her intention was merely to apologize for her past behavior. Seeing Cheryl crying, Joshua realizes that Cheryl is determined in giving Joshua the token. Joshua accepts Cheryl's token graciously, signaling their departure. He informs Duke Agnes that they should leave promptly, mindful of the journey ahead. Duke Agnes, seizing the opportunity, asks Cheryl if he can also visit her in the future. Cheryl warmly assures him that he's welcome anytime. With their farewells exchanged, Duke Agnes bids adieu to Cheryl and Count Cox before departing. As they ride off, the knights under Armstrong's command raise their swords in salute, a traditional gesture of respect and farewell. Duke Agnes reflects on Joshua's unawareness of the significance behind Cheryl's gesture, a daughter of a noble family offering such a symbol holds great meaning. The scene transitions to the Imperial Palace of the Avalon Empire, where Evergrant updates the Emperor on Duke Agnes's expected arrival with his second son, Joshua, in three days. Evergrant reveals that previously, Prince Kaiser proposed for Joshua to join the Imperial Knight Order, but Caesar's proposal was rejected. The Emperor is taken aback by Joshua's refusal to join the Imperial Knights. The Emperor contemplates Joshua's actions, noting that Joshua isn't even the eldest son and was born from a concubine, yet he turned down an opportunity to elevate his status.
The Emperor wonders if Joshua believes he's capable of inheriting the Agnes Duchy on his own merits. Evergran assures the Emperor that this isn't the case, citing a letter Joshua sent to Prince Caesar. In the letter, Joshua expressed his commitment to obeying the Empire's laws and the Emperor's will without needing the Prince's recommendation. Amused by Joshua's determination to follow his will, the Emperor laughs, suggesting that Joshua intends to earn his place in the Imperial Knight Order through his own strength. He anticipates Joshua's potential clash with the Empire's esteemed Imperial Knights, considering it a prospect worth watching. For days later, the scene shifts to the Agnes family's private mansion in the capital city of Acadie. Lucia expresses uncertainty about staying in such an opulent place. Joshua reassures his mother, affirming that it's perfectly fine. Kane remarks on the mansion's unchanged appearance despite the passage of time. Intrigued, Joshua questions Kane's familiarity with the place. Kane reveals that he spent his childhood in Acadie and accompanied Duke Agnes here once before. Joshua reflects on Kane's connection to his father, acknowledging Kane's capabilities but seeing him as merely that capable with no mention of Knight Cain in Joshua's previous life. Joshua wonders if Cain was constrained by his own limitations or if he vanished along with the Agnes family's downfall. Regardless, Joshua is determined not to let Cain fail now that he's taken him under his wing. For Joshua, ensuring Cain's success is the reward for his loyalty. Cain elaborates on his previous visit to the mansion, explaining that Duke Agnes brought him there to assess his capabilities. Joshua observes the bustling activity around the area where the Duke will be staying and realizes that the mansion provides a more secluded environment for training. As Joshua enters, he acknowledges the privacy the mansion affords, allowing them to train without prying eyes. However, Joshua is mindful of the limited security in the sparsely populated mansion. Aside from Cain, the inhabitants are primarily servants his mother took in. Concerned about his mother's safety in the event of an ambush, Joshua decides that he cannot always remain at the mansion. He informs Cain of his need to step out briefly. Cain cautions Joshua, reminding him of the potential challenges in navigating the capital for the first time and the risk of getting lost. Joshua reassures Cain that he'll be fine and instructs him to look after his mother in his absence. Cain agrees, though he suspects Joshua may just be scouting the surroundings. The scene shifts to the downtown area of Acadie, where Joshua stands before a familiar restaurant. Reflecting on its unchanged appearance over the years, Joshua hesitates to enter, anticipating the judgmental stares of the patrons. Suddenly, a man with black hair approaches Joshua, noting his apparent confusion. Offering assistance, the man proposes to escort Joshua back to where he came from. Joshua, however, claims to be on a quest to find a red coin hidden deep in the Rolf River. The man is taken aback by Joshua's unexpected revelation but agrees to guide him. As they move forward, Joshua realizes that he's found the right place to gather the information he seeks. Joshua recognizes the need for a skilled informant who can delve into his past experiences discreetly. He believes that the ideal informant must be adept at eluding public attention while clandestinely accumulating substantial, high-quality information. The black-haired individual before Joshua fits these criteria perfectly, possessing an unassuming appearance that allows them to blend in unnoticed. Entering the restaurant, Joshua contemplates the worker's potential curiosity about a young visitor like himself. However, he notes that they adhere well to the informant's rulebook. The black-haired individual guides Joshua through the establishment, demonstrating the professionalism that sustains their industry's excellence. As they approach a guarded door, the black-haired individual instructs the guard to open it, revealing a concealed room below. Joshua marvels at the level of security they maintain, feeling reassured that his concerns are unwarranted. He acknowledges the trustworthiness that forms the lifeline of this industry and is confident that even if he were to disclose sensitive information, such as the promise of a dragon heart, the secrecy would remain intact. Descending underground, Joshua and the black-haired individual reach another door where a guard respectfully greets the latter. The black-haired individual informs the guard of their guest, prompting the door to be opened. Witnessing this exchange, Joshua ponders whether the black-haired individual holds a higher position than he initially presumed. Despite the inner workings regulations, the workers display remarkable deference towards him even within the secrecy of the passageway. Joshua realizes the folly of judging solely based on appearances. Entering the next room, Joshua notices yet another door. The black-haired individual assures him that this is the final one, prompting Joshua to follow him inside the third room. Once inside, the black-haired individual inquires about the information Joshua seeks. Joshua, curious, asks whether he also directly sells information, 
finding it amusing that a branch manager is personally present despite the relatively low quality of the information he's receiving. Joshua questions the black-haired individual about the adequacy of their personnel. The black-haired individual is taken aback by Joshua's insight and remarks that Joshua must be well-informed about the organization. Curious, the black-haired individual asks how Joshua can be so certain of his identity as the branch manager. Joshua explains that the foundation of any information organization lies in maintaining security, and to achieve this, the hierarchy among members is deliberately obscured. Even within the same branch, members are kept unaware of each other's true identities. This secrecy is fundamental to the organization's clandestine nature. Joshua further elaborates that the central office tightly regulates and oversees each branch, with regular members having no knowledge of the branch manager's existence, let alone their identity. However, through observations of people's behavior and the black-haired individual's responses to his inquiries during their journey, Joshua has deduced his role. Impressed by Joshua's astuteness, the black-haired individual admits that he initially believed the rumors about Joshua's capabilities to be exaggerated but now he sees they have been understated instead. He acknowledges Joshua as the second son of the Agnes family. Joshua remarks, It seems you're familiar with me. The black-haired individual responds, informing Joshua that he is the individual receiving the most attention from the entire empire, emphasizing that if he wasn't aware of that, he wouldn't be able to continue working in this field. Despite Duke Agnes's efforts to conceal Joshua's identity, Joshua ponders the situation. The black-haired individual quickly deduced Joshua's identity. Joshua reflects that it's reassuring that the guy possesses such skills, but at the same time, it raises concerns as he might exploit that knowledge to sell Joshua's information. Addressing Joshua, the black-haired guy mentions that he can discern Joshua's worries just by observing his expression. He assures Joshua that he can relax, mentioning that the only individuals privy to Earl Joshua's identity are himself and a select few others. Then, he apologizes to Joshua for the belated greeting and introduces himself as Zero, the person in charge of Akari's Lunar Moon branch. Zero proceeds to inquire about the purpose of Joshua's visit. Prior to that, Joshua inquires of Zero whether the reason he was led to Room 3 is because the information Joshua can access is limited to Rank 3. Zero confirms Joshua's suspicion, explaining that it's typically the case. However, Zero reassures Joshua stating that he will provide information up to the first rank, which is the highest level that Zero is capable of providing. Joshua, intrigued by this generosity towards a newcomer, questioned Zero's rationale. With a hint of shrewdness, Zero clarified that if he could gain Earl Joshua's favor in advance, investing such resources was a small price to pay. Joshua, however, couldn't shake the feeling that there would inevitably be a demand for repayment in the future. In this world, favors seldom came without a price tag, and if Zero was willing to offer information of the highest caliber, he would undoubtedly expect something equally valuable in return. Expressing his initial assumption that the available information would only extend up to rank Zero, especially given Zero's alias as the black-haired figure, Joshua noted the discrepancy. Zero, visibly surprised by this revelation, listened intently as Joshua further elaborated that as far as he knew, Akardi's Lunar Moon branch refrained from prying into customers' information beyond necessity. Zero extended a sincere apology to Joshua for the misunderstanding, urging him to request any information he required. Joshua wasted no time in disclosing his quest for a specific item, the Count Orbis family heirloom's current whereabouts. Zero's response was candid. Most of the family's possessions had already found their way to the black market. With a focus on retracing from that point, Zero assured Joshua that within a week, he could procure the desired information. Prompted by Zero's offer, Joshua pondered his next move. He recognized the delicate nature of releasing his intentions too hastily. The repercussions of being caught snooping around others' affairs could prove troublesome. Strategizing his approach, Joshua decided to set a tempting lure, one that would attract attention without directly revealing his motives. If successful, it would serve as a masterstroke, achieving multiple objectives at once. Finally, Joshua disclosed his bait to Zero, the red coin hidden deep within Lake Rolf. Whosoever uncovered it would receive the blessing of the moon. Joshua dropped a bombshell, revealing that whoever discovered the token would unlock the moon's door, an astonishing piece of insider knowledge known only to a select few within their organization. Zero, visibly stunned by Joshua's awareness of this closely guarded secret, couldn't help but inquire about Joshua's true identity. In response, Joshua proposed a tantalizing offer. If Zero agreed to his terms, 
Joshua would procure the token within three years. With a sly grin, Joshua queried Zero's thoughts on the matter, suggesting it was a proposition worthy of consideration. Zero, taken aback by Joshua's confidence in the revelation that the token's existence was in question, reasoned that the token's significance might have diminished after the Moon's Door successor had been determined a year prior. Moreover, Zero's organization had dedicated decades to the fruitless search for this symbolic token. Yet, Joshua's unwavering optimism intrigued Zero. Cautioning Joshua to lay out his conditions before making any commitments, Zero emphasized the need to assess the investment's viability. Joshua's terms were straightforward. Zero must keep confidential any questions Joshua posed from that moment on and refrain from divulging any information regarding Draxia Vel Grace. Zero, astonished by Joshua's reference to the legendary god of combat, sought clarification. Joshua deftly turned the question back to Zero, insinuating that such a small request surely warranted the investment. The narrative transitions to two months later, within the confines of the mansion. Here, Joshua immerses himself in rigorous training under Kane's guidance while gradually regaining his strength. Simultaneously, he orchestrates Lucia's relocation to a more secure residence owned by Duke Agnes, recognizing the necessity for enhanced privacy and protection, contrasting starkly with their previous remote abode. Despite Lucia's reluctance to be parted from Joshua, the inexorable pull of maternal love yields to his persistent persuasion. Their farewell exchanges are poignant, laden with unspoken emotions. The scene then shifts to a pivotal moment, occurring one week before Joshua's anticipated enrollment at the academy. Lost in contemplation, he sits in silence, grappling with inner turmoil. Kane, observant of Joshua's preoccupied demeanor, extends a probing inquiry, sensing the weight of unspoken concerns. Joshua's response is terse, denying any underlying unease, yet his mind teems with unanswered questions. Despite assurances from Zero that a mere week would suffice, the two months devoid of communication gnaw at Joshua's resolve as the imminent commencement of his academy journey looms large. The potential ramifications of continued silence from Zero threaten to derail Joshua's carefully laid plans. In a timely twist, Zero makes his long-awaited appearance, prompting a mix of relief and frustration from Joshua. Inquiring about Joshua's well-being, Zero's arrival is met with a hint of sarcasm from Joshua, acknowledging the tardiness of his presence. Kane's intense gaze, brimming with suppressed anger, catches Zero's attention, prompting a query about Kane's state of mind. Sensing the tension, Joshua intervenes, urging Kane to temper his emotions, reassured by his familiarity with Zero's identity. Turning his attention to Zero, Joshua wastes no time in addressing the purpose of his visit querying about the awaited information. Zero reassures Joshua of the successful retrieval of the desired data, attributing the delay to the convoluted path it took to reach him. Handing over a piece of paper bearing the sought-after location, Zero explains the absence of fees, framing it as a service rendered, trivial in comparison to his usual demands. Dismissing any notions of the item's significance beyond its mundane properties, Zero jests about the unlikely presence of hidden powers. Joshua's patience wears thin at Zero's probing remarks, admonishing him to cease his attempts at deciphering his intentions. Zero's response carries a hint of amusement as he remarks on the transparency of Joshua's intentions. Dismissing the current request as unremarkable compared to others, Zero pledges to periodically update Joshua with his findings. With a businesslike demeanor, Zero outlines his payment structure, intending to charge Joshua for all services rendered in a single lump sum aligning with his organization's standard protocol of upfront payment. Upon hearing Zero's explanation, Joshua's mind churns with speculation, sensing a larger agenda at play. Anticipating potential future demands, Joshua contemplates the true extent of Zero's services and the potential rewards they may yield. With their interaction concluded, Zero bids farewell, leaving Joshua to ponder the implications of their arrangement. Unfolding the paper provided by Zero, Joshua delves into its contents, uncovering a historical narrative of the Count Orbis family's once prestigious standing within the Avalon Empire, detailing their alliance with the Rebecca family and recounting a legendary feat of prowess by the Orbis family head. The document offers a glimpse into a bygone era where magicians held sway, hinting at a rich tapestry of secrets waiting to be unraveled. From that pivotal moment, a groundbreaking concept emerged in the annals of the continent's history, the birth of the Battle Mage, courtesy of the Orbis family's head. While the Kingdom of Knights, Avalon, remained relatively indifferent to this seismic development, it ignited a veritable firestorm of reactions from the Kingdom of Magic, Terra. 
So intense was Terra's response that its monarch personally journeyed to the Orbis family's doorstep, extending an invitation to their realm. In a swift turn of events, the illustrious Orbis family, once a beacon of brilliance, plummeted from grace within a mere few decades. Their downfall, however, was not orchestrated by external forces but rather by the very imperial family of their own kingdom. As Joshua absorbs the weighty implications of this historical revelation, a troubling question nags at his thoughts. Did Avalon's imperial family orchestrate the systematic purge of their kingdom's nobility with deliberate intent? Intrigued, Joshua's attention shifts to another piece of information, this time concerning Baron Accent. Just as he utters the name, Kane's ears perk up, prompting him to interject. Confirming Joshua's reference to the infamous knight's merchant, Baron Accent Problem, Kane offers a glimpse into the shadowy world of the underworld where Baron Accent reigns supreme. Rumors swirl within the underbelly of society, whispering tales of Baron Accent's tight grip over the black market, suggesting that every illicit item that traverses its murky depths inevitably finds its way into his hands. Adding to the intrigue, Baron Accent's familial ties are revealed. He stands as the stepbrother of Vigo Viscount, whom Joshua had encountered previously. In the midst of this revelation, Count Fonsel enters accompanied by his daughter, Iceland, marking a reunion long overdue. With warm nostalgia lacing his words, Count Fonsel acknowledges the passage of time since their last encounter. The scene transitions to the opulent confines of the mansion reserved for the highest echelons of nobility. Situated in close proximity to the imperial palace, its grandeur serves as a testament to the occupant's esteemed status. Yet, amidst the splendor of the capital's elite residences, a singular abode in the outskirts dwarfs them all in both size and extravagance. Despite its peripheral location, the residence stands as a symbol of opulence, a testament to its owner's boundless wealth, which transcends societal hierarchies. This owner, none other than the enigmatic figure of the underworld, Baron Problem, holds sway over the shadows that dance in the kingdom's underbelly. Within the confines of Baron Problem's chamber, a tense exchange unfolds between him and Earl Varenshin Villas. With a stern countenance, Earl Varen reminds Baron Problem of the expiration of their agreement, demanding accountability for unmet promises. Baron Problem offers a solemn reassurance to Earl Varen, acknowledging the rarity of elves and the challenge in acquiring them. Humbly, he appeals for a bit more time to fulfill his end of the bargain. However, Earl Varen remains resolute, reminding Baron Problem of the trust placed in him and the expectation of results rather than excuses. With a hint of resignation, Baron Problem seeks forgiveness, watching as Earl Varen rises from his seat. Sensing an ultimatum looming, Earl Varen queries whether a week will suffice. Baron Problem assures him without hesitation, vowing to deliver the elves within the stipulated time frame. Yet, Earl Varen, unmoved, extends the deadline, cautioning that failure to produce the elves within the extended period will result in consequences. With a veiled threat hanging in the air, Earl Varen departs, leaving Baron Problem to ruefully confide in his butler about the predictability of Earl Varen's demands. Baron Problem's life hangs by a precarious thread, his freedom of action constrained by the looming shadow of Earl Varen's authority. The butler, sensing the gravity of the situation, voices his concern regarding the feasibility of procuring an elf within the tight time frame. In response, Baron Problem grimly acknowledges the rarity of elves but emphasizes the necessity of success. Failure could spell the collapse of everything he has painstakingly built, as Earl Varen wields unparalleled power as the sole heir of the villa's marquisate, commanding the highest respect within the military hierarchy and enjoying the emperor's unwavering trust. Earl Varen's influence extends far beyond mere words. He possesses the capability to wield substantial leverage over Baron Problem's fortunes. The scene shifts to the interior of Earl Varen's carriage, where his knight, Muku voices doubts regarding the likelihood of Baron Problem's success within the designated time frame. Earl Varen, unfazed by the challenge ahead, acknowledges the arduousness of the task. Muku, perplexed, queries Earl Varen's decision to impose such a stringent deadline upon Baron Problem. Earl Varen cryptically hints at an ulterior motive for the accelerated time frame, leaving Muku to ponder the deeper implications of their mission. Earl Varen leans forward in his carriage, his gaze fixed on Muku a silent challenge in his eyes. What do you believe is the most crucial aspect of a king's management of his subjects? He queries. Muka doesn't hesitate in his response. That would undoubtedly be the carrot and stick approach, he answers confidently. Earl Varen nods, acknowledging the significance of rewards, but his expression betrays a deeper understanding. 
Carrots have their place, he admits. But consider this. Would a bloated fowl, stuffed on carrots, be swayed by the promise of yet another? Mukua's brow furrows as he grasps the implication. You're suggesting that sometimes, the stick is necessary, he concludes. With a solemn nod, Earl Varen confirms Mukua's insight. Indeed, he agrees. The true power lies in the stick. It's the magic that can transform even the most venomous adversaries, silencing their protests and bending them to one's will. Muku absorbs the gravity of Earl Varen's words. Then, with a steely resolve, Earl Varen lays out the consequences. If Baron Problem fails to produce the elves in time, he declares, his tone grave, I will have no choice but to crush him underfoot. As Baron Problem's fear escalates to its zenith, he'll likely exhibit even greater loyalty once Earl Varen extends a hand in what appears to be an act of mercy. Muku acknowledges the astuteness of Earl Varen's insight, recognizing his ability to see through Baron Problem's facade. Earl Varen, though, laments the situation, expressing disappointment at the turn of events. Nevertheless, he suggests a change of pace, proposing they dine out for the evening, a rare treat. Muka promptly directs the coachman to head to the nearest restaurant, eager to partake in the outing. Meanwhile, back with Count Fonsel and Joshua, Kane warmly greets the Count as they cross paths. Count Fonsel remarks on the unexpected nature of their encounter, pondering if his presence might be misconstrued as an interception of Kane and Joshua. Kane reassures him, affirming their genuine pleasure at seeing the Count again. Joshua reflects on Count Fonsel's unique demeanor, Count Fonsel, despite his outward appearance of fragility and timidity, possessed a gentle and kind-hearted demeanor. He bore his physical limitations with grace, never once complaining even in the face of adversity, and maintained a formal demeanor towards all, regardless of their station in life. This uncommon trait, where a noble of his stature spoke respectfully to commoners, often subjected him to ridicule and scorn from his peers. However, Count Fonsel remained steadfast in his principles, unwavering in his commitment to provide for his family. Unbeknownst to many of his fellow nobles, Count Fonsel, known as Jean Rebecca, was held in high esteem by the common folk, admired for his compassion and integrity. His actions endeared him to the hearts of the people, earning him their respect and admiration. As Iceland approaches Joshua, she hesitates momentarily upon noticing his distinctive hair color, but swiftly recognizes him as Earl Joshua. Joshua is taken aback by Iceland's unexpected address, surprised by her acknowledgement of him. Before Iceland can utter another word, Earl Varen strides into the room with Muku in tow, interrupting their exchange. As Earl Varen surveys the crowded restaurant, he questions the presence of patrons at such a late hour. The manager promptly assures him of immediate arrangements for his comfort. His attention then shifts to Iceland, whose beauty captivates him. Drawing nearer, Earl Varen inquires if it's her first visit and which family she belongs to, but Iceland remains silent, her demeanor guarded. Suddenly, Muku interjects, announcing Earl Varen's identity as the eldest son of the villa's marquisate, commanding respect from all present. Kane's surprise is evident as he ponders the unexpected appearance of such a high-ranking noble in a humble establishment. Meanwhile, Count Fonsel steps forward, offering apologies for Iceland's reticence, seeking to defuse any tension arising from her lack of response. Count Fonsel extends his courtesy to Earl Varen, expressing his honor at meeting the scion of the esteemed villa's marquisate. Earl Varen, in turn, seeks to ascertain Count Fonsel's own lineage. With pride, Count Fonsel introduces himself as the head of the Rakrika family. However, Earl Varen's response is less than amiable. He expresses disappointment in Count Fonsel's failure to instill proper manners in his daughter, viewing her silence as a personal affront. Earl Varen insists that Iceland herself must offer an apology, unwilling to overlook what he perceives as a breach of decorum. Observing the tense exchange, Kane wonders about the effectiveness of such a confrontational approach, particularly in an informal setting with strangers. He questions the necessity of Earl Varen's forceful tactics, suspecting it may be more about asserting dominance than genuine offense. Earl Varen strides past Count Fonsel, demanding that Iceland show respect by offering an immediate apology. In a bold move, Joshua steps forward, his voice cutting through the tension like a knife. He scoffs at the situation, suggesting that Marquis Villas must have their own concerns, given the behavior of their only child. Earl Varen's frustration mounts at Joshua's audacity, his anger simmering beneath the surface. Muku, sensing the rising hostility, draws his sword, demanding Joshua reveal his identity or face consequences. Undaunted, Joshua calmly observes Muku's stance, noting the weight of his actions. 
With a steely gaze, Joshua warns Muku of the repercussions of his actions, his aura radiating power that renders Muku immobile. Earl Varen, growing impatient, urges Muku to take action. Confusion clouds his mind as Muka hesitates to attack Joshua. Joshua, seizing the opportunity, reveals his alias, Asher Vin Frederick, but we will still call him Joshua. As Earl Varen mulls over Joshua's revelation, Joshua assures him there's no need to dwell on his name, for soon, Joshua's name will be etched into his memory forever. The scene transitions to Lock Castle, where a mysterious figure named Zhuang, clad in a black cloak and mask, meets with Anna. Anna remarks on Zhuang's swift arrival, to which Zhuang responds that Anna's summons caught him off guard. Sensing urgency, Zhuang questions if something has transpired. Anna reveals that a new king has emerged, a monstrous threat has surfaced in the Duchy of Agnes. Zhuang's inquiry about Babel prompts Anna to clarify that while Babel is known, there is another son of the Agnes Duchy, one who surpasses Babel in power. This revelation surprises Zhuang, who demands to know why Anna didn't share this crucial information sooner. Anna calmly explains that the Agnes Duchy will eventually spread rumors to bolster their family status, and in times of peace, such rumors hold a unique power, gradually gaining traction until they become widely known. As Anna speaks, Zhuang ponders the truth in her words. Across the realms, tensions simmer like volcanoes on the brink of eruption, their powers amassed over years now reaching a critical point. While many celebrate the strength of their nations, the reality is far grimmer. The sight of formidable armies raises questions. What do those in power intend with such displays? Is war inevitable? Anna asserts that the balance of power lies in the hands of the warlords, for no nation would willingly engage in conflict if defeat is certain. She emphasizes the crucial role of information in averting wars, prompting Zhuang to recognize its significance. He acknowledges Anna's perspective, understanding that Joshua's emergence as the second son of the Agnes Duchy poses a grave threat to their plans. One wrong move could unravel years of careful preparation, leaving their efforts scattered to the wind. Anna reassures Zhuang, assuring him that she has contingencies in place. She divulges her plan to enroll in the prestigious academy located in Akadi, the capital of Avalon. Anna urges Zhuang to trust her, emphasizing that everything will be fine. With unwavering confidence, she pledges to stake her reputation on the line and sway Joshua to their cause. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Joshua and Earl Varen. Earl Varen expresses surprise at hearing about House Frederick for the first time and inquires about Joshua's origins. Joshua, unfazed, questions the significance of his background. Earl Varen dismisses it as inconsequential, deeming House Frederick destined for obscurity. He perceives Joshua's involvement in his affairs as presumptuous and warns him of the consequences. Earl Varen demands Joshua's submission, insisting on an apology if Joshua hopes for any leniency. Upon hearing Earl Varen's command, a smile spreads across Joshua's face, much to Earl Varen's chagrin. Earl Varen orders Muka to subdue Joshua, expressing his impatience with Joshua's perceived insolence. With a determined resolve, Muka charges at Joshua, his aura swirling around him. To Earl Varen's astonishment, Joshua exudes a palpable sense of danger, his demeanor far from that of an ordinary child. Muku, underestimating Joshua's abilities due to his youthful appearance, moves in for the attack, confident in his superiority. But as Muku launches his assault, Joshua intercepts with astonishing agility, halting Muku's advance with his bare hands. The sudden reversal shocks both Muku and Earl Varen. Before they can react, Joshua retaliates with a powerful punch fueled by his own aura, sending Muku crashing to the ground. Earl Varen watches in disbelief as Muku, a skilled beer rank knight, is effortlessly defeated by Joshua's barehanded prowess. He struggles to comprehend how Joshua, seemingly devoid of mana manipulation, could overpower a seasoned knight with such ease. The realization dawns on Earl Varen that Joshua possesses abilities far beyond what he initially perceived. Despite being just a young child, Joshua advances toward Earl Varen with determination in his eyes. He asserts that he has no intention of forgiving Earl Varen, believing that individuals like him only understand the gravity of their actions after facing consequences. Earl Varen demands to know Joshua's identity, questioning if he is part of the Frederick family or merely impersonating royalty. Before Earl Varen can finish his accusation, Joshua delivers a swift punch to his face, sending Earl Varen crashing to the ground. As Earl Varen struggles to recover, Joshua warns him that their confrontation has only just begun. He urges Earl Varen to awaken to the reality of their situation. Ready to strike again, Joshua is interrupted by Muku, 
who acknowledges the disrespect they have shown him and pleads for Joshua's mercy. In Mukua's mind, skepticism crept in as he contemplated the inexplicable. Joshua, after all, manipulated manna effortlessly, a feat that defied conventional understanding. Muku couldn't help but wonder, for such mastery, Joshua must hold a considerable rank, yet he remained a mere youth. Pondering further, Muku entertained the notion that Joshua hailed from a lineage veiled in secrecy, one shielded from the prying eyes of the world. However, with each passing moment, Mukua's apprehension intensified, for the implications of Joshua's abilities could spell unforeseen consequences for young Lord Earl Varen. Then, in a moment of clarity, Joshua's words cut through the uncertainty like a blade through fog. He reminded Muku of a prior warning. When a knight unsheathes his sword, he must shoulder the weight of accountability. With a grave expression, Joshua solemnly confesses to Muku that he lacks the generosity to show mercy to his adversaries. Muku is taken aback by this admission, feeling a weight descend upon him. He lowers his head, beseeching Joshua to grant clemency. Muku offers his arm as a pledge, acknowledging the shame of being a knight unable to protect his lord. He even goes so far as to surrender his right to wield a sword if it pleases Joshua. Muku implores for forgiveness on behalf of Sir Versen, pleading earnestly for Joshua's grace. As Joshua observes Muku's unwavering loyalty, a pang of recognition stirs within him. Memories from a past life surface, reminding Joshua of someone similar to Muku. With a resolute demeanor, Joshua reiterates his stance on mercy, emphasizing his reluctance to extend forgiveness to his adversaries. Drawing attention to the necklace adorning Earl Varen's neck, Joshua removes a ring from it, a symbol of the Varen family. He instructs Muka to inform Earl Varen that if he wishes to reclaim the family heirloom, he must come to Joshua personally. Joshua warns that failure to retrieve the ring will result in its sale on the black market. Kane interjects, remarking on Joshua's fiery nature. Joshua brushes off the comment, urging Kane to focus on his positive attributes rather than dwelling on the negative. Kane counters, suggesting that there's nothing inherently wrong with Joshua's assertiveness and charisma, hinting at a potential admiration for such qualities. Witnessing Joshua's actions, Count Fonsel is struck by a sense of admiration. He finds Joshua's demeanor increasingly impressive with each passing moment. Turning to Iceland, Count Fonsel inquires if she has anything to share with him. Iceland shakes her head and hurries over to Joshua, leaving her father's side. With a gentle smile, Count Fonsel redirects his attention to Muku and Earl Varen. He assures Muku that he will personally accompany him to the nearest hospital, offering his support in the aftermath of the confrontation. As the setting transitions to a solemn temple, the atmosphere becomes charged with Earl Varen's palpable rage upon catching sight of his bruised visage, a consequence of the recent altercation with Joshua. Seething with indignation, Earl Varen confides in Muku, expressing a profound dissatisfaction that even a thorough thrashing of Joshua would fail to assuage. With an air of command, Earl Varen demands that Muku immediately procure Joshua's presence. However, Muku, grappling with his own doubts, hesitates, admitting his lack of prowess for such a task. Enraged by Muku's apparent incompetence, Earl Varen lashes out, his anger manifesting in a swift kick directed at Muku punctuating his disdain for the inability to subdue a seemingly feeble adversary like Joshua, who bears the semblance of a mere child. In a tone dripping with contempt, he challenges Mukua's reasoning and issues a stern warning of impending punishment upon their return home. Reluctantly, Mukua acquiesces to Varen's demands, though the weight of their implications hangs heavily upon him. Earl Varen, undeterred by Mukua's reservations, orders him to meticulously gather intelligence on Joshua Frederick down to the minutiae of his familial connections and household staff, hinting at a calculated scheme of revenge to be executed with precision. Yet, Muku, though acknowledging the enormity of the task, voices his protest against the lack of justification for such vindictive measures, only to be met with Earl Varen's unyielding resolve. Earl Varen, standing firm in his authority as the successor to the esteemed Marquis of House Villas, adamantly brushes aside Muku's qualms, asserting his prerogative to act without justification in the face of such blatant disrespect. With a tone of conviction, he challenges Mukua's dissent, prompting him to ponder whether Muka truly finds his reaction unjustified. Muku, however, counters Earl Varen's confidence with a pragmatic concern, expressing skepticism that anyone would believe such a serious offense could be committed by a child scarcely ten years of age. Moreover, Muka paints a stark picture of the potential consequences warning Earl Varen that even if his accusations were to gain traction, the tarnishing of House Villa's esteemed reputation could have far-reaching repercussions. 
altering the very fabric of public perception surrounding the noble household. Earl Varen, his frustration mounting, swiftly dismisses Mukua's objections, demanding compliance and an end to what he perceives as baseless objections. Yet, Muku, in a rare display of defiance, raises his voice, passionately asserting that his words are far from nonsensical. Rather, they echo the deeply ingrained values of nobility, where honor often holds precedence over even one's own life. And the honor of house villas is tantamount to the very essence of the household itself. Mukua's warning carries a weighty undertone as he cautions Earl Varen that even if they evade the scrutiny of authorities, the discerning eye of the Marquis of House Villas would not be so easily swayed. And the repercussions for their actions could extend far beyond a mere slap on the wrist, plunging them into the depths of severe retribution. Upon processing Mukua's cautionary words, Earl Varen swiftly formulates a strategy, recognizing the urgency of acting before any damaging rumors can circulate. He proposes the erasure of evidence, confident in their ability to mitigate the situation. Earl Varen subtly insinuates Mukua's apprehension, referencing a past incident involving House Rubrika, hinting at the consequences of an action driven by fear. Muku, however, counters with a revelation, the existence of tangible evidence. He discloses that Asher Vin Frederick has in his possession the Varen family token, a statement that jolts Earl Varen with surprise. Hastily, Earl Varen checks his pocket, only to be met with a chilling realization, the token is missing, replaced by a palpable sense of shock. Muku elucidates further, explaining Asher Vin Frederick's conditions for its return, hinting at a looming confrontation. Muku, acutely aware of the repercussions, reflects on the significance of the token's theft, recognizing its detrimental impact on the revered reputation of House Phyllis. Despite considering Asher Frederick's motives, Muku cannot dismiss the slim possibility of intentional sabotage, prompting further concern and deliberation. Deep in thought, Muka grapples with the implications of having someone as formidable as Asher Vin Frederick as an adversary to the villa's family. Recognizing the stakes at play, Muka voices his concerns to Earl Varen, underscoring the precarious balance of risks and rewards in their current situation. With a sense of caution, Muka proposes to Earl Varen the wisdom of quelling his anger and adopting a more observant stance for the time being. Earl Varen, visibly frustrated by Mukua's suggestion, challenges him on whether he expects Varen to extend an apology to Frederick. Muku clarifies that while Frederick demands a direct confrontation, Muku intends to delegate the task to a substitute for the time being. Transitioning to a different scene, Joshua and Kane find themselves in a bustling restaurant, engaged in conversation. Kane probes Joshua's confidence in Earl Varen's willingness to personally reclaim the villa's family token. Joshua, with a hint of skepticism, suggests that Earl Varen would hesitate to confront him directly over such a valuable possession. Instead, Joshua surmises that Earl Varen will likely opt for a more discreet approach, entrusting a loyal surrogate to handle the exchange, thereby safeguarding sensitive information from potential leaks. Kane, intrigued, muses aloud about the mysterious substitute's identity, prompting Joshua to delve into a fascinating rumor circulating in Akadi. He shares tales of accent probalum, reputed to hold sway over the night in the city, but Joshua reveals a deeper truth. It is the young master of house villas who truly commands the darkness. Cain, struck by this revelation, reassesses his previous perception of Joshua's motivations, realizing that Joshua's actions weren't merely impulsive reactions to a noble heir, but rather calculated moves towards a grander ambition. In Joshua, Cain sees the potential for greatness far surpassing his initial expectations. Their conversation is interrupted by the arrival of Iceland, who expresses heartfelt gratitude to Joshua for his recent aid. Joshua, modest yet resolute, downplays his role, explaining that his actions were driven not solely by altruism, but by broader considerations. Iceland, acknowledging the depth of Joshua's impact, reflects on how his intervention spared not only her, but also her family from the wrath of Earl Varen. Grateful for Joshua's intervention, Iceland offers her thanks once more. When Joshua heard this, he thought Isley would become a powerful mage in the future who would make a name for herself across the continent. Iceland seemed very different when she was younger, and Joshua wondered how she changed from being shy to becoming a ruthless killer. In Joshua's recollection of his previous life, Iceland was revered as the Ice Archmage, a figure of ethereal beauty amidst the frosty darkness, her icy magic reflecting both her elegance and aloofness. Reflecting on her past epithet, Joshua finds it aptly descriptive of Iceland's current demeanor. Breaking the contemplative silence, Iceland reassures Joshua that should he find himself in trouble following the day's events, 
she and her father will readily come to his aid. Joshua, however, dismisses her concerns, insisting that such gestures are unnecessary. Yet, Eislin, feeling indebted for Joshua's assistance, hesitates to let go of her sense of obligation towards him, believing it unjust to ignore his potential future troubles. Sensing her lingering worry, Joshua proposes a solution. Should Iceland remain genuinely concerned, she can grant him a single request in the future as a token of repayment. Iceland's face lights up with gratitude at the suggestion, eagerly pledging to be there for Joshua whenever he requires her assistance. As Joshua's gaze drifts out the window, he catches sight of something intriguing, a faint smirk playing upon his lips as he observes whatever has captured his attention. The scene unfolds with someone agilely navigating the rooftops, soon revealed to be Zero. Startled by Joshua's apparent awareness of Zero's surveillance, Zero grapples with disbelief, considering Joshua's remarkable perceptiveness. Despite Zero's confidence in remaining undetected even by a master, Joshua's acute awareness and the accuracy of the information he possesses compel Zero to reassess the situation. Initially assuming that Joshua had merely stumbled upon the existence of the moon's door and sought to exploit it against Zero. The realization that Joshua may possess more detailed knowledge prompts Zero to contemplate the potential ramifications for their master's decision-making process. Meanwhile, outside the restaurant, Baron Probalum stands watch, observing the exit of Count Fonsel and his daughter from the establishment. Upon sighting the Count, Baron Probalum confirms that this is indeed the intended location. Inside, Joshua expresses surprise at Baron Probalum's swift arrival, remarking on it as quicker than expected. As the Baron approaches, he extends greetings to Joshua, expressing his deep honor at meeting the son of the esteemed House of Frederick. At the sight of Probalum, Cain's thoughts turn inward as he assesses the Baron's stature, noting internally that Probalum may hold a lower rank among the Barons, yet possesses capabilities surpassing those of higher-ranking peers. Cain finds himself pondering the significance of Probalum's formal demeanor towards someone of unknown name and humble origins from a rural area. Meanwhile, Probalum, addressing Joshua with a measured tone, introduces himself as Earl Varen's substitute and delivers a message meant for Sir Asher. He underscores the importance of the ring Asher took from Earl Varen, emphasizing its value as a cherished heirloom of the villa's family, and implores Asher to return it to its rightful owner. Joshua, however, stands firm, reminding Probalum of his prior directive to Earl Varen. The Earl must personally reclaim the ring if he desires its return. Furthermore, Joshua asserts that failure to adhere to this condition will result in the ring's destruction. Probalum, taken aback by Joshua's resolve, seeks to explore alternative solutions, indicating a willingness to negotiate further. Joshua expresses his surprise to Probalum about Earl Varen's perceived weakness, indicating a shift in his initial impressions. He instructs Probalum to fetch Moku, the knight who accompanied Earl Varen, before they proceed with their conversation. In addition, Joshua emphasizes that since he's going to such lengths for Probalum's benefit, he expects a reciprocal gesture. Having already fulfilled one of Probalum's requests, Joshua now suggests that Probalum should fulfill one of his in return. Taken aback by Joshua's boldness, Probalum inquires about the nature of the request. Without hesitation, Joshua directs Probalum's attention to the rings adorning his fingers, hinting at their considerable value. With a directness characteristic of his demeanor, Joshua then requests that Probalum hand over those rings to him as a form of compensation. As the scene shifts to the exterior of the restaurant, Cain confronts his liege with a startling accusation, likening Joshua's actions to those of a demon for his seemingly effortless acquisition of Probalum's ring. Cain questions how Joshua could conduct such a transaction with a demeanor devoid of any visible emotion. In response to Cain's skepticism, Joshua calmly refutes the accusation, asserting that the exchange wasn't a result of coercion but rather a fair trade. He argues that it's only reasonable to expect something in return for granting Probalum an opportunity. Perplexed by Joshua's explanation, Cain presses further, seeking clarification on why Joshua coveted Probalum's ring in the first place. Joshua unveils the significance behind the ring, revealing it to be a cherished heirloom of the Orvis family known as the Elf's Tears. He delves into the tragic history of the Elves recounting how their captivating beauty led to their persecution by humans, resulting in immeasurable loss and suffering for the elven race. In a desperate bid to safeguard themselves, the elves united in the forest at the continent's southern tip, establishing a sanctuary known as the Forest of the Elves. To fortify their sanctuary against human intrusion, the high elves erected a formidable barrier spanning the entirety of the forest, 
ensuring their safety and seclusion from the outside world. However, even for the high elves endowed with extraordinary magical talents, maintaining the protective barrier around the expansive forest proved to be a monumental task. Tragically, the strain of upholding the enchantment led to the demise of all the high elves, leaving just one solitary survivor. This lone survivor became the focal point of reverence for the remaining elves, who hailed him as their monarch, bestowing upon him the name Alumbus, a symbol of their dwindling legacy. As the centuries unfolded, knowledge of the Forest of Elves became shrouded in secrecy, known only to those who held close ties with the fifth-generation Alumbus. However, this individual vanished into obscurity along with his family, leaving behind a void of uncertainty and speculation. The last known patriarch of the Orvis lineage, Zerath Orvis, vanished under mysterious circumstances, prompting rumors of foul play. Joshua entertained suspicions that Zerath may have met a sinister fate, perhaps at the hands of someone seeking to extract information about the Forest of Elves. Despite facing immense pressure and potential threats, Zerath remained resolute in his silence, steadfastly guarding the secret of the forest until his final breath. Even the fifth-generation Queen of Elves, who learned of Zerath's demise belatedly, was powerless to prevent the unfolding tragedy. She emerged onto the continent, driven by the desire to lay eyes on Zerath firsthand. Upon locating the last disciple of Zerath Orvis, who had fallen victim to the machinations of a servant from another noble family, in a scene fraught with emotion, the Queen of Elves wept bitterly as she reached out to offer her apologies, gently grasping the hands of Zerath's final disciple. In that tender exchange, tears flowed freely, their essence intertwining with the sacred family heirloom, later immortalized as the fabled Elf's Tears, eventually gaining fame as the renowned Elf's Tears. However, the tragic news soon spread that the final descendant of the Orvis lineage had succumbed to an illness, leaving behind a legacy tainted by misfortune. Joshua reflects on the cruel twist of fate that befell this family, pondering the mystical power believed to reside within the ring born from such sorrowful circumstances. As they arrive at the mansion, Cain notices Joshua's deep contemplation and queries about his troubled thoughts. Seizing the opportunity, Joshua turns to Cain with a request, stressing its significance not only for himself but also for Cain's own benefit. With sincerity, Joshua confides in Cain, expressing his urgent need for loyal subordinates upon whom he can entrust his safety and well-being. Joshua holds a firm stance against those who falter in battle before him, a sentiment he shares with Cain. With resolve in his voice, Joshua reveals his imminent plans to enroll in the academy. He instructs Cain to depart and join the Duke's retinue, a decision that surprises Cain. Seeking clarification, Cain questions whether Joshua intends for him to serve Lady Lucia's guardian knight. However, Cain expresses reservations about this proposition, foreseeing potential complications for Joshua. Cain articulates his concerns, highlighting the challenges Joshua may face as a noble without an attending knight particularly given his humble origins and lack of background information. Cain predicts that Joshua might encounter disdain and neglect, situations that align with his temperament but would prove difficult to navigate alone. Thus, Cain emphasizes the importance of his presence to shield Joshua from such adversities, especially considering that Earl Varen, another academy student, will also be in attendance. Cain harbors concerns that Varen may once again target Joshua, a worry he openly shares with Joshua. However, Joshua reassures Cain, expressing his genuine desire for a peaceful existence. Despite Cain's potential skepticism, Joshua asserts his ability to endure solitude with resilience. Nevertheless, Joshua reveals another matter on his mind. With a respectful gesture, Joshua humbly asks Cain to seek training in swordsmanship from the Duke on Joshua's behalf. He emphasizes that this isn't a command as Cain's liege, but rather a sincere request, one that Joshua earnestly hopes Cain will consider. Observing Joshua's display of humility, Cain surmises that Joshua must have sought assistance from Duke Agnes on Cain's behalf. Cain, steadfast in his loyalty, refuses to witness Joshua, the person he serves, bowing to anyone, including himself. While Cain accepts Joshua's request, he raises a valid point about reciprocity. Cain expresses his wish to never bow his head to anyone besides Joshua. Ever gracious, Joshua readily agrees, vowing to ensure that Cain never finds himself in a position of subservience to anyone other than Joshua himself. Affirming this pledge in his own name, Joshua solidifies Cain's trust and allegiance. In a gesture of gratitude, Cain bows an acknowledgement, symbolizing his commitment to placing his well-being under Joshua's care from that moment onward. In the heart of the sprawling Igrant continent, encompassed by the dominance of three formidable superpowers, 
stands the towering ivory tower. Its height is so immense that it seems to challenge the very heavens, serving both as a sanctuary and a source of pride for the skilled magicians who call it home, the Magic Tower. Within the confines of this magnificent structure lies the conference room, where all the magicians have convened. Among them is Ian Dunpere, the esteemed master of the Magic Tower and the first to achieve the revered 7th class magician status. He presides over the gathering as the leader of the seven magicians. Ian, curious about the absence of three specific seats, those designated for the Red Flame, Thunderbolt, and Void Magicians, poses the question to his fellow magicians. Marcus, an Earth Magician, steps forward with an explanation. He reminds Ian that both the Red Flame and Void Magicians are known for their transient nature, often wandering away from their designated spots. As for Thunderbolt, Marcus speculates that the Magician may have departed on urgent business related to an ongoing case. Accepting Marcus's explanation, Ian decides to commence the 27th regular meeting without them. He emphasizes the importance of addressing pressing matters without delay, recognizing that the absence of some members should not hinder their progress. Ian announces to everyone seated at the table that the primary focus of the meeting is the primordial stone. Theta, a storm magician, comments on Ian's directness, noting that it diverges from Elder Ian's usual approach. Marcus intervenes, reminding Theta of the importance of etiquette in such formal gatherings. Ian expresses surprise at Theta's attendance, remarking on the rarity of their presence. Theta explains that they attended upon the Magic Tower Master's insistence, citing the significance of the matter at hand. Theta then queries Elder Ian about the alleged disappearance of Magma. Marcus interjects, revealing that not only Magma but also Bronto has vanished. Both Theta and Elder Ian react with astonishment to this revelation. Alicia, an ice magician, interposes, stating that only the magic tower holds knowledge about the primordial stones. She speculates that someone might have taken magma and bronto without comprehending their true nature, posing a potential threat. Elder Ian confirms Elisha's assessment, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. Elder Ian possesses a rather solid understanding of who might be responsible for taking magma. However, when it comes to bronto's whereabouts, Elder Ian finds himself in the dark. Theta connects the dots, realizing why Thunderbolt Master abruptly left his responsibilities. Marcus interjects, revealing that there is some information available, though he remains uncertain if it directly pertains to Bronto. Marcus, hesitant but intrigued, discloses an unusual occurrence near Bronto's last known location. He shares that in that vicinity, rumors suggest the emergence of a magic swordsman. The revelation stuns those gathered around the table. Alicia speculates on the identity of this mysterious figure questioning whether it could be him. Marcus continues, disclosing that the magic swordsman is no seasoned veteran, but a mere child who recently turned nine this year. Alicia and Theta are left momentarily speechless, grappling with the unexpected nature of this revelation. Seeking clarity, Elder Ian queries Marcus about Bronto's discovery in the Avalon Empire. Marcus affirms this detail, confirming that Bronto was indeed found in that region. Elder Ian reflects on Thunderbolt's recent journey to the Avalon Empire, suggesting a correlation between this trip and the disappearance of magma. He instructs Marcus to keep a keen eye on the situation. However, Elder Ian's tone grows somber as he acknowledges the possibility that if the information proves true, there may be little they can do. Frustration mounts as Alicia vents her concerns to Elder Ian, speculating on the identity of the magic swordsman. She wonders aloud if he could potentially be Thraxia Velgray's successor unable to fathom anyone else in that role. Elder Ian attempts to pacify her, understanding the weight of her apprehension. But Alicia persists, asserting that this is not a matter to be taken lightly. Marcus chimes in, suggesting that there may be no direct connection between the two events. This assertion puzzles Alicia, prompting her to press Marcus for clarification. Marcus reveals that the rumored magic swordsman is allegedly the son of Arin von Agnes. Theta, sensing the urgency of the situation, urges Marcus to divulge any additional pertinent details he may have withheld. Theta chastises Marcus for not sharing this crucial information sooner. Elder Ian, growing increasingly frustrated, silences the room, reminding everyone of the uncertainty that surrounds their discussions. Elder Ian issues a directive for everyone to refrain from taking independent action and instead focus on closely monitoring the unfolding events. With that, he concludes the meeting for the day, signaling for everyone to depart. Each member complies, taking their leave from the conference room. Alone in the quiet aftermath of the meeting, Elder Ian reflects on the rapid pace of change in the world around them. 
He contemplates whether these changes will ultimately lead to positive outcomes or bring about unforeseen challenges. The scene transitions to Joshua and Cain, where Joshua is in the midst of casting a spell on the elf tear ring. As Cain hears Joshua's incantation, he is taken aback by the realization that Joshua possesses knowledge of the rune language, a tongue typically reserved for high-ranking magicians. This revelation prompts Cain to question whether his liege, Joshua, truly is a magic swordsman. Upon completing the spell, Joshua carefully cradles the ring in his hand. Cain rushes over, concerned, and inquires if everything is all right. Joshua reassures Cain, confirming that all is well. Intrigued, Cain presses Joshua for details about the origins of the ring and its enchantments. Joshua explains that the ring is imbued with the blessings of a seventh-class high-ranking barrier, designed to automatically safeguard its wearer in perilous situations. He adds that it also enhances one's connection with spirits, though he admits to being uncertain of its full capabilities. Upon hearing this, Cain expresses a request to his leech. He asks Joshua if he would consider granting him the elf tear ring. Joshua informs Cain that the ring he holds was crafted by a high elf specifically for the sole daughter of the Orvis family head, Zarath Orvis. It is intended exclusively for female use, meaning men cannot wield its powers. Joshua reveals his intention to gift the ring to his mother. The scene then shifts to a dimly lit room, where Zero places his hand on a sphere, triggering a magical communication link to his master. Zero respectfully greets his master, who appears wearing a mask concealing his face. The masked figure questions Zero's sudden contact, probing whether it relates to a certain individual. Zero confirms that while there was a minor incident involving Joshua, he senses that there's more to Joshua than meets the eye. The masked figure acknowledges Joshua's uniqueness, but Zero insists that calling him special is an understatement. Surprised by Zero's revelation, the masked figure informs him that the Magic Tower has initiated efforts to locate Joshua. Zero is taken aback by this news, left stunned by the implications of the Magic Tower's actions. Observing Zero's stunned reaction, the masked figure remarks that it appears Zero was unaware of a significant development. One of the seven magicians has initiated a search for Joshua. The masked figure speculates that Joshua may be the descendant of the legendary magic swordsman, Ainslot. The Magic Tower has been pursuing Ainslot for some time, using the Primordial Stone as a pretext. However, the masked figure emphasizes that the true importance lies not with the stone nor Ainslot, but rather with Joshua. A portion of the Avalon Empire's Imperial Knight Order, along with the Magic Tower, as well as the clandestine organization known as the Red Coin, have all begun to mobilize with Joshua at the center. Zero is left speechless by this revelation. The masked figure expresses a desire to personally intervene but explains that internal conflicts within their organization prevent them from doing so. However, the masked figure suggests that if Joshua were to bring the red coin to them, the situation could change. Zero assures his master that he will retrieve the red coin at any cost. Zero's master reassures Zero of his trust, setting the stage for the next scene. The setting shifts to a dense forest where Viscount Vigo finds himself bound to a tree. Standing before him is Jack Sterapis, the Thunderbolt Master Magician. Jack instructs Viscount Vigo to remain silent and observe closely as he unleashes a powerful spell. With a flourish, Jack conjures a storm of lightning, swiftly dispatching the surrounding monsters with a single strike. Viscount Vigo watches in astonishment as the display unfolds before him. Jack then turns to Viscount Vigo, probing him about the comparison between Jack's magical prowess and Joshua's abilities. Pressing Viscount Vigo for an answer, Jack learns of the noble's allegiance to the Avalon Empire. Viscount Vigo questions whether the Empire will tolerate Jack's actions. Jack, undeterred, moves closer to Viscount Vigo, asserting that fear of the Empire did not hinder his arrival. Urging Viscount Vigo to respond, Jack demands to know how his power measures up against the rumored magic swordsman, Joshua. Viscount Vigo candidly admits that in terms of power, Jack surpasses Joshua by a significant margin, even to someone like Viscount Vigo, who lacks expertise in magic. Jack ponders this revelation, considering that Ainslot's specialty wasn't lightning-based magic. He wonders if Joshua might have taken Bronto, as Jack had suspected. Jack resolves to confront Joshua personally, recognizing that gaining access to the Agnes estate won't be easy for a Thunderbolt master. Viscount Vigo warns Jack against underestimating the challenge, noting that Joshua has likely joined the academy in the capital under Duke Agnes's patronage. Jack realizes the complexity of the situation, acknowledging that navigating the Agnes estate is already daunting, but gaining entry to the capital presents an even greater challenge. 
Furthermore, the presence of monsters in the capital, in addition to Duke Agnes's formidable stature, adds to the difficulty. In a surprising turn, Viscount Vigo offers his assistance to Jack, despite their initial encounter not being particularly favorable. However, Viscount Vigo clarifies that if Jack intends to confront Joshua rather than collaborating, Viscount Vigo is more than willing to assist Jack in that endeavor. Jack, upon hearing this, responds with a smile, questioning what Viscount Vigo can bring to the table. Viscount Vigo explains that Jack bears the symbol of Sterapes beneath his eyes and holds the esteemed rank of a sixth-class magician, the Thunder Seer of the Seven Magicians. Jack, somewhat surprised, remarks on Viscount Vigo's awareness of his identity. Viscount Vigo asserts that knowledge is power in Avalon, emphasizing that with their collaboration, Viscount Vigo's extensive connections in Avalon could prove beneficial for Jack. Despite the potential advantages, Jack hesitates. He acknowledges the urgency of the situation but expresses reluctance to join forces with a seemingly unknown Viscount. Viscount Vigo, taken aback, queries Jack about his reservations. Jack, with a stern expression, explains that, despite his apparent nonchalance, he would find it troublesome if his identity were to be exposed. Viscount Vigo is taken aback, registering shock at Jack's revelation. He voices his concern, asserting that if Jack intends to eliminate him, it's an impractical move. Viscount Vigo explains that, being a noble of the Empire, any sudden disappearance would prompt Duke Agnes to launch an investigation. This, in turn, would lead to the eventual exposure of Jack's identity. However, Jack, seemingly undeterred, proceeds to subdue Viscount Vigo. Time flew by swiftly, and Joshua enrolled in the academy upon reaching the age of 10. Among the influx of students were approximately a thousand children from noble families. The academy structured its student body into six grades, with advancement exams held annually to promote students to the next level. Graduation occurred upon passing the final exam. Joshua harbored ambitious goals during his anticipated six-year tenure at the academy. He aspired to master the fifth stage of the magic spear art, a feat he had achieved in his previous life. Confident in his plans, Joshua strolled through the corridors, observing his noble peers accompanied by their attendants. Despite the class distinctions, Joshua couldn't suppress a smile. Upon reaching his designated room, Joshua entered to find it surprisingly spacious for accommodating three occupants. Reflecting on the opulence of Avalon, Joshua hoped to avoid sharing his living quarters with individuals like Varen. Joshua had hoped for a quiet existence during his time at the academy, but his solitude was interrupted by the arrival of a purple-haired boy who requested assistance with his luggage. Joshua obliged, helping the boy with his belongings. Grateful, the boy introduced himself as Agar's Cohen Douglas. Observing Agar's, Joshua couldn't help but feel that individuals like him were preferable to the arrogant noble children who flaunted their status. Joshua reciprocated with his own introduction, revealing his alias as Eshvin Frederick, though for clarity's sake. Upon hearing Joshua's alias, Agar's expressed surprise, remarking that he had never heard of the Frederick family before. Agar's suggested they get along for the duration of their time at the academy. Just as they began to forge a connection, another student entered the room. Upon seeing Joshua and Agar shaking hands, he remarked on their quick acquaintance. Introducing himself as Icarus, he left both Joshua and Agar stunned by his unexpected arrival. Joshua finds it difficult to believe that the boy standing before him is none other than Icarus, known as the genius of the era, the heavenly brain. Icarus's name would go down in history for his pivotal role in the first imperial prince's internal battle a conflict that would shape the future of the bloodline. During a tumultuous period marked by the Avalon Empire's vulnerability due to ongoing internal strife and Emperor Marcus's disappearance, a fierce power struggle erupted between the first and second imperial princes. Under the guise of stabilizing the country, this internal conflict raged on for nearly a decade, claiming tens of thousands of lives. Ultimately, it was the first prince who emerged victorious, absorbing the second prince's administration and forces into his own. Among the key figures in this historic battle were two individuals who made significant contributions. One of them was the fourth imperial prince, hailed as a hero for his efforts in bringing the prolonged conflict to a close. Jaiser van Britten, hailed as a hero for his role in bringing the internal battle to an end, was one of the individuals who made significant contributions. The other was known as the genius of strategy and tactics, possessing a mind seemingly bestowed by the heavens, an esteemed vassal who played a pivotal role in leading the first prince to victory, Icarus. Noticing both Agars and Joshua staring at him, 
Icarus inquires if there's something amiss with his appearance, puzzled by their surprised expressions. However, Agars interrupts with a hug, expressing his disbelief and joy at their unexpected reunion. Icarus reciprocates the sentiment, admitting that he never imagined their paths would cross again, and expresses his gratitude for Agars's companionship. Agars assures Icarus that he is equally thrilled to spend time together and looks forward to an enjoyable year ahead. Icarus remarks on Agars's perennial optimism, prompting Joshua to wonder about their relationship. It's the first time he's heard of Icarus having a friend. As the conversation unfolds, Joshua learns more about Icarus's background. Originally a servant to a barren couple in the Harvest Territory, located in the countryside south of Avalon, Icarus was eventually adopted due to his remarkable talents. However, this unusual circumstance attracted ridicule from other nobles, bombarding the Harvest Territory with scorn and derision. Despite his remarkable talents, Icarus found himself unable to shake off the stigma of his commoner background within the academy. No matter his achievements, he was met with disdain and contempt from his peers. Consequently, Icarus spent much of his time in isolation, as Joshua had heard. The first person to extend a hand of friendship to Icarus was none other than the first prince of the Avalon Empire, Kisser Van Britten. Kisser treated Icarus with dignity and respect, offering him the chance to flourish without limitations. Hearing Icarus's story, Joshua couldn't help but see parallels with his own past, marked by similar experiences of scorn and betrayal, leading to his tragic demise at the hands of Kaiser, whom he had once trusted implicitly. Approaching Icarus, Joshua introduces himself using his alias, Frederick, and the two shake hands. Icarus suggests that they should get along, prompting Joshua to vow inwardly to win Icarus's allegiance no matter what. In that moment, Joshua senses the weight of destiny in their meeting, a fateful encounter that could potentially change the course of his life. The scene transitions to Duke Agnes's residence, where Cain presents Lucia with the ring and informs her of Joshua's departure for the academy. Lucia expresses her regret at not being able to witness Joshua's admission, to which Cain suggests that Joshua likely refrained from inviting her to prevent his identity from being exposed. Lucia reassures Cain that she understands, expressing gratitude for his constant care and protection of her son. Cain humbly acknowledged Lucia thanks, emphasizing his honor in serving Joshua as his liege. He admits that it may be impolite to say, but he genuinely believes Lucia has an extraordinary son. Lucia face lights up with happiness at his words. Just then, Duke Agnes enters the room and inquires about their activities. Cain and Lucia both greet him respectfully. The Duke asks Lucia if she feels comfortable in their home, to which Lucia responds with gratitude, acknowledging the Duke's generosity and expressing that she feels undeserving of such kindness. Duke Agnes reassures Lucia that if she ever feels uncomfortable or needs anything, she should feel free to approach him at any time. He emphasizes that she is welcome to seek him out whenever necessary. With a polite nod, Duke Agnes's butler greets Lady Lucia and excuses himself, followed by Duke Agnes, as they leave the room. However, the butler, in a moment of boldness, asks the Duke to forgive his impertinence but questions why Lady Lucia was allowed into their residence. He expresses concern that Lady Vanessa may harbor treacherous intentions upon learning of this development. In response, Duke Agnes queries if the butler is unaware of the situation. The butler acknowledges that he understands young Lord Joshua's remarkable talents, but he also highlights the importance of acknowledging the abilities of young Lord Babel, who carries the blood of the imperial family. He suggests that perhaps Duke Agnes should definitively appoint a family head. Duke Agnes acknowledges the concern for the imperial bloodline, recognizing that the legitimacy of the legitimate son cannot be disregarded entirely. The butler goes on to express his concern that if young Lord Joshua were to inherit the Agnes name, it would undoubtedly stir up considerable commotion within the family. Contemplating the implications, Duke Agnes ponders the idea that authenticity might be swayed by bloodline alone. He confides in his butler that he will continue to observe the situation for a while longer. The butler nods in agreement with Duke Agnes's decision. As Duke Agnes delves deeper into his thoughts about the legitimacy of his true heir, the weight of his decision weighs heavily on his mind. During Joshua's inaugural class at the academy, he was swiftly introduced to the dynamic between Agars and Icarus. These two figures had already carved out a notorious niche within the institution, though their reputations leaned more towards infamy than acclaim. As fate would have it, Amaru Brunston and his retinue entered the scene, wasting no time in belittling both Agars, a humble commoner, and Icarus, the illegitimate offspring of Count Douglas. 
Amaru's disdainful remarks, suggesting that losers naturally gravitate towards one another, hung heavy in the air. Observing this exchange, Joshua couldn't help but speculate on Amaru's lineage. Could he be a scion of the esteemed Stin family, poised to ascend as one of Avalon's esteemed five masters, perhaps following in the footsteps of Count Ari Brunstin, known as the Master of the Rapier? Joshua found himself drawn to the uncanny resemblance between Amaru and the potential heir apparent, noting the shared traits of silver hair and sharp, penetrating eyes. Amidst the banter, Amaru's companion, a boy with a mane of brown hair, casually remarked on the potential academic benefits of having Agars and Icarus in their class, implying that their presence might guarantee better grades. With a derisive smirk, Amaru echoed his friend's sentiment, musing on the dismal prospect of the illegitimate and the commoner failing to progress to the next academic year. Observing the yellow necties adorning the upperclassmen, Joshua discerned them as second years, contrasting with the white necties worn by the freshmen. In this hierarchy of academia, necktie colors shifted with each passing year, a subtle marker of progression. Amidst this silent observation, Joshua couldn't help but speculate about Agars, recognizing in him a reflection of his own status as an illegitimate child. Amaru's cutting remarks sliced through the tense atmosphere, casting Agars as a mere failure, a representation of the desolate existence of illegitimate offspring. With a heavy heart, Amaru disavowed any former association with Agars, lamenting his own past friendship. However, Icarus stepped forward, tempering Amaru's harsh words with a plea for empathy. The confrontation escalated as a brown-haired student named Duncan Pond Dunnitz interjected, defending Amaru and his honor. Accusing Icarus of showing contempt towards the esteemed Stin family, Duncan demanded respect. Icarus, bewildered by the sudden accusation, attempted to defuse the situation, asserting his innocence. Yet, before he could elucidate further, Duncan's punches Icarus, sending him crashing to the ground in a flurry of chaos. Agars rushed forward, attempting to intervene, his voice lost amidst the escalating violence. Ignoring Agars's pleas, Duncan's friend delivered a swift kick to Agars's side intensifying the confrontation. In the midst of the turmoil, Joshua emerged from the sidelines, his frustration boiling over as he confronted the unfolding scene. His carefully laid plans for a quiet existence shattered in an instant, replaced by a fierce determination to challenge the toxic mindset prevalent among the noble students. As Amaru questioned Joshua's unexpected presence, frustration mingled with disbelief in Joshua's mind. How could he stand idly by while his fellow students faced such brutality? With resolve hardening in his heart, Joshua vowed to dismantle the entrenched arrogance of the noble elite. Suddenly, Amaru's demeanor shifted, his composure faltering as he addressed Joshua with unexpected deference. Joshua's attention was drawn to the figure behind him, Kaiser, the prince. The sight of Kaiser, acknowledging Joshua with a respectful greeting, sent shockwaves through the assembled students, their astonishment palpable. Elsewhere, in Earl Varen's chambers, Muku and the Earl engaged in a discussion tinged with intrigue. Earl Varen questioned whether the fourth imperial prince's actions were influenced by his acquaintance with Joshua. Muku confirmed Earl Varen's suspicions, citing information gathered thus far. Earl Varen's voice carried a weight of frustration and intrigue as he voiced his perplexity over Joshua's elusive background. Despite exhaustive efforts to unearth information about Frederick Viscounty, all attempts had proven futile. The revelation that even the fourth imperial prince held acquaintance with Joshua only deepened Varen's intrigue. Determined to uncover Joshua's secrets, Varen urged Muku into action, directing him to the moon door without delay. Varen's directive was clear. Investigate the enigmatic figure known as Ashvin Frederick, Joshua's alias. Varen understood the importance of exploiting any weakness Joshua might possess, regardless of the cost. Amidst this urgency, the scene shifted revealing a poignant memory shared between Muku and Joshua. In this recollection, Joshua made a solemn demand of Muku to return Varen's ring and ensure an apology to the Rubrika family. Additionally, Joshua extracted a promise from Muku, demanding that he use the honor of his family name to prevent Varen from repeating such actions in the future. Muku, in earnest, pledged his utmost effort to fulfill Joshua's request. Returning to the present, Muku addressed young Lord Varen with a mix of trepidation and resolve. Expressing his concern for potentially overstepping his bounds, Muka reminded Varen of the weight of their promise to Joshua. Muka's warning carried a grave implication. Any betrayal of that promise would not only tarnish the villa's marquee family name, but also invite ridicule and scorn from the world at large. Frustration etched into every line of his face, Varen dismissed Muka's reminder with a terse retort. 
He asserted that Muko had made the promise independently, emphasizing that it bore no relevance to Varen himself. With a commanding tone, Varen instructed Muko to cease his conjecture and focus on the task at hand, to uncover the truth behind the mysterious Frederick. Reluctantly, Muko acquiesced to Varen's directive, acknowledging the urgency of the situation. Meanwhile, in the bustling classroom, Joshua found himself immersed in his studies alongside his peers. Agar slumbered nearby, oblivious to the academic pursuits of his classmates, while Icarus diligently applied himself to his work. Observing the scene, Joshua contemplates that he hadn't intended to attract attention, but circumstances seemed to be pushing him towards aligning with Icarus. Aware of the curiosity surrounding him, partly due to Kaiser's involvement, Joshua reflects on Kaiser's persistence. Despite Joshua's response, Kaiser remains steadfast in his pursuit of Joshua's allegiance. Joshua reflects on Kaiser's request for him to visit the Imperial Palace before graduation. However, Joshua realizes that he had already planned to do so, irrespective of Kaiser's prompting. With the Imperial Knight Order and the secretive storage facilities within the palace, Joshua harbors a personal mission, something imperative that he needs to uncover within those walls. Suddenly, Agars begins to murmur in his sleep, his words barely audible amidst the classroom's hushed atmosphere. The students erupted into laughter, their mockery directed at Agars's apparent foolishness, compounded by his status as an illegitimate child of the Douglas family. The teacher, sensing the need for order, gently reprimanded Agars and urged him to pay attention. In response, Agars pledged to do his utmost to remain attentive. The teacher then shifted the discussion to a more serious topic, the significance of the sword as the preeminent weapon. With a commanding presence, the teacher highlighted the historical and symbolic importance of the sword. From the renowned Knights of Avalon to the Emperor himself, whose mastery of the sword was renowned, the teacher underscored its status as the weapon of choice for the most formidable warriors. Amaru's hand shot up confidently, his assertion ringing through the classroom. According to him, the superiority of the sword over other weapons was indisputable, it was simply the best. He argued that in combat between individuals of equal skill, the sword wielder would inevitably emerge victorious. However, Joshua's expression betrayed his disagreement, his thoughtful gaze hinting at a dissenting opinion. Undeterred, the teacher interjected, pointing out the prevalence of spears among soldiers in warfare. The teacher challenged Amaru's stance, questioning whether soldiers should prioritize sword training over spear proficiency. Amaru clarified that his argument pertained specifically to dueling scenarios rather than the practicalities of warfare. Then, in a moment that caught the class off guard, Joshua stepped forward, his voice dripping with sarcasm. He ridiculed the notion of the sword's supremacy, singling out the rapier as a particularly impractical weapon. The class fell into a stunned silence, their attention drawn to this newcomer whose boldness stood in stark contrast to their expectations. Frustration flickered across Amaru's features as Joshua's words hung in the air, challenging the established norms of the classroom discussion. Amaru's retort came swift and assured, defending the rapier's honor as the superior weapon. The teacher intervened, cautioning against conflict among students, but Amaru's pride wouldn't allow restraint. As a member of the Stin family, renowned for their mastery of the rapier, he refused to endure what he saw as mockery without response. Joshua's response was laced with a hint of amusement as he countered Amaru's stance. He questioned whether belittling other weapons while praising the rapier could truly be considered anything but opinion. Amaru, undeterred, asserted that he spoke only truth and challenged Joshua to prove otherwise, throwing down the gauntlet for a duel. Yet, Joshua, mindful of the rules, reminded Amaru of the prohibition against student conflicts. Amaru's frustration simmered at Joshua's adherence to the rules after such bold words, questioning Joshua's resolve. But Joshua stood firm, suggesting a compromise, a practical sparring class where they could settle their differences within the bounds of regulation. Joshua's eyebrows raised in curiosity. Amaru revealed that the practical swordsmanship class was scheduled for the following day, presenting a perfect opportunity for their duel. He implored the teacher to permit the match, vowing to cease further argument on the matter and pleading for the chance to prove himself and dispel any doubts among his peers. The teacher, though concerned by the intensity between the two students, reluctantly approved the spar. However, to ensure safety, the use of real swords was strictly prohibited. Wooden weapons would suffice for the purpose of sparring. Amaru's lips curled into a satisfied smirk at the teacher's decision. He envisioned the wooden sword as a perfect tool to humble Joshua. 
Determined to emerge victorious, Amaru harbored no qualms about his opponent's potential ties to the fourth imperial prince. He was focused solely on defeating Joshua. Meanwhile, Joshua's expression softened into a knowing smile at the prospect of the upcoming spar. The scene transitions to Joshua's room, where Agars confronts him with concern etched on his face. Joshua, seemingly unperturbed, queries Agars about his apparent distress. Both Agars and Icarus express incredulity at Joshua's nonchalance, warning him of the very real threat Amaru poses. Joshua, however, surprises them with his calm demeanor. He acknowledges Agars's awareness, recognizing that Agars isn't as oblivious as he initially seemed. Agars reveals his familiarity with Amaru, highlighting the latter's exceptional talent and prestigious lineage as a scion of the Sten family. Amaru's mastery of mana further adds to his formidable reputation. Curious about Agars's intimate knowledge of Amaru, Joshua probes further. Agars recounts their long-standing friendship, tracing it back to their shared experiences in the treacherous northern reaches of Avalon. In this desolate land, two families, including Agars's, valiantly defended against relentless hordes of demonic beasts. The bond between Amaru's father, esteemed as the commander of the north and head of the Sten family, and Agars's father, a stalwart companion in his endeavors, was legendary. Their camaraderie had weathered countless trials in the face of life-threatening situations, earning admiration even among the nobility. It was through this connection that Amaru and Agars crossed paths. Despite Agars' status as a son of a concubine, their shared experiences of being distant from the line of inheritance fostered a deep friendship. In their youth, they found solace in each other's company, leaning on one another in times of need. Agars confides in Joshua, expressing his intimate knowledge of Amaru's character and his desire to shield their new friend from harm. He urges Joshua to set aside his pride and extend an olive branch to Amaru, hoping to avoid any potential conflict. Joshua, however, scoffs at the suggestion, finding humor in Agars's plea for reconciliation. He refuses to bend to what he perceives as weakness, unwilling to apologize merely to appease Amaru. Joshua's words cut through the air with a sharp clarity as he addressed Agars's perceived complacency. He remarked that at least Agars would be safe in his current state, relegated to a life of subservience and laughter, bowing to the whims of those around him. Icarus, however, interjected, shedding light on Agars's true motivation concern for Joshua's well-being. Joshua, unmoved by the explanation, dismissed it as nothing more than an excuse, emphasizing the importance of personal growth and steadfastness in the face of adversity. He urged Icarus to strive for change and to cling to their own convictions, leaving Icarus momentarily speechless. With a determined stride, Joshua exited the room, leaving both Icarus and Agars stunned by his unwavering resolve and uncompromising stance. The scene shifts to Zero's domain, where Muku implores Zero to gather information on a certain individual named Ash Van Frederick. Muka emphasizes that this newcomer had recently enrolled in the Avalon Academy. Zero, with his finger on the pulse of the underworld, assures Muku that he has some preliminary knowledge of the boy in question. Muku, sensing the gravity of the situation, offers Zero a blank check, promising him any sum of money in exchange for every detail he can gather about Ash Van Frederick. Zero, however, explains that the information from the moon door comes with a hefty price tag, particularly when it concerns individuals receiving special treatment from his organization. Muku is taken aback by this revelation, but he recognizes the significance of the situation. If even the moon door is treating this boy as someone of importance, there must be more to him than meets the eye. Determined to uncover the truth, Muku insists that Zero provide the information, assuring him that he will pay whatever price is necessary. Zero, unfazed by the enormity of the request, calmly informs Muku that the price for such information from the moon door would be around 1 million gold. Muku is shocked hearing at the staggering sum. Muku grapples with the weight of the information, contemplating the staggering cost of 1 million gold. This sum, he realizes, surpasses the annual tax revenue of most cities. Zero observes Muku's contemplative expression, surmising that he needs more time to weigh the implications of such a substantial expenditure. With a suggestion to visit the moon door again after making a decision, Zero views this as an investment in young Lord Joshua. Zero perceives Joshua as a potentially valuable asset, one whose significance might surpass even Mukua's understanding. Despite other potential channels for information that someone like Varen might pursue, the moon door's exorbitant commission fee for Joshua's details hints at an unexpected level of danger. Zero surmises that, Faced with such a formidable adversary, Varen may reconsider any vengeful actions due to the potential consequences. 
encouraging Joshua to focus on finding the red coin. Zero pledges unwavering support until the culmination of the long-standing conflict. The scene then shifts to Joshua. Contrary to the stringent regulations of the academy, students were granted freedom to roam after classes concluded. Joshua took advantage of this leniency to focus on reclaiming the power he had lost. Within the confines of the mansion provided by Duke Agnes, he grappled with the conflicting divine and demonic energy swirling within him, akin to oil and water in constant turmoil. To stabilize these forces, Joshua relied on Bronto's power. As he neared a breakthrough, a sudden collapse of power unleashed a violent explosion, hurling Joshua against the wall. After a momentary lapse into unconsciousness, Joshua regained his senses, his mind swiftly assessing the situation. Though the power surge was overwhelming, Joshua remained undeterred, confident in his ability to rein it in. With Bronto's guidance, he aimed to harness more of the divine and demonic energies, edging closer to mastering the third stage of the magic spear art. However, a disconcerting realization struck Joshua as he searched for Lucia, a vital component of his arsenal. Despite his efforts to locate her, Lucia was nowhere to be found. Suddenly, a voice pierced the air, berating Joshua's apparent cluelessness. Through the intricate magic of subspace, Lucia materialized before him in human form. She revealed that she had been by his side, safeguarding him for the past three days. Startled by this revelation, Joshua realized he had been unconscious for an extended period, likely causing quite a commotion back at the academy. Reflecting on his past life, Joshua recalled reaching the third stage of the magic spear art, a feat that coincided with Lucia demonstrating signs of intelligence within subspace. He marveled at the unexpected reappearance of this ability, manifested now in the form of a child. It dawned on him that he wasn't the only one undergoing regression. Curious, Joshua probed Lucia's newfound form, questioning if she could also access his thoughts. Lucia confirmed his suspicions, explaining that such abilities were beyond her capabilities in her initial awakening state. Joshua, intrigued by Lucia's cryptic remark, inquired about the more important matter she alluded to. Lucia urged Joshua to introspect, emphasizing the imperative of understanding himself before comprehending the nature of the adversary. She challenged the notion that Joshua's physical condition was flawless, prompting him to reassess his own state. Lucia then proposed sharing a crucial piece of information with Joshua. She directed his attention to the primordial stone he had acquired, cautioning against the narrow perspective that considered Bronto's powers limited to elemental attributes. Lucia insinuated that humanity's understanding of the stone's potential was limited, hinting at latent powers beyond mere elemental capabilities. Joshua, taken aback, ponders Lucia's words. Lucia encourages him to consider the unique powers possessed by other primordial stones, such as extinction, regeneration, and harmony, deeming them irrelevant. Then, posing a question, Lucia prompts Joshua to contemplate the distinctive power inherent in Bronto, the stone he acquired. Intrigued, Joshua considered the lightning attribute's destructive prowess and pondered if there might be something more profound hidden within Bronto's essence. Joshua mulled over Lucia's suggestion, contemplating whether the potential power of Bronto overlapped with that of the red primordial stone, magma. Lucia encouraged Joshua to ponder this question independently, recognizing its significance in aiding him to achieve his objectives swiftly. Curious, Joshua sought clarification on what Lucia meant by his objective. Lucia's response was stark and direct. Joshua needed to exact his revenge. Following that, the scene transitions to the classroom, where Agars and Icarus enter together. Upon spotting Amaru, Agars avert his gaze, maintaining an uneasy distance. In that instant, Duncan gives Icarus a hearty slap on the back, questioning why they both linger in the classroom. He confidently asserts that if he were in their shoes, he'd have taken off just like that fellow, Ash something. Agars intervenes, urging Duncan to cease his interference. Another student, emboldened by Duncan's provocation, voices concern over their missing roommate's sudden disappearance and the subsequent disturbance it caused. Agars, baffled by the shift and blame onto him and Icarus, attempts to defend their innocence. The teacher's arrival interrupts the escalating tension, reminding the students of the strict prohibition against student altercations. With a warning directed at Duncan, the teacher emphasizes the potential disciplinary consequences of continued aggression. As the classroom settles back into routine, the teacher reflects inwardly, acknowledging their own role in allowing such tensions to escalate unchecked. The teacher, foreseeing the impending chaos, resolved to prevent a recurrence of such incidents. Despite the turmoil, there was a silver lining. 
With Ashvin Frederick's disappearance, Duncan could face disciplinary action. However, Joshua's sudden entrance disrupted the uneasy calm. Apologizing for his absence, Joshua cited personal reasons for his leave of absence. The teacher, shocked by Joshua's return, couldn't shake the feeling that Frederick was digging his own grave. The students, whispering amongst themselves, speculated about Joshua's abrupt return and its implications for his graduation prospects. Sensing the growing tension, the teacher urged the students to silence as the class commenced. Joshua took his seat, but the teacher couldn't shake the feeling of impending trouble. Determined to prevent further escalation, the teacher reluctantly postponed the practical lesson, wary of Amaru's potential reaction in the current climate. As Joshua settled into his seat, Amaru's frustration was palpable. Agars wasted no time in questioning Joshua's return, suggesting that the collapse of the Frederick family should have been reason enough for Joshua to flee. Joshua, unfazed by the accusation, turned the inquiry back on Agars, questioning if he had conducted a background check. Agars confirmed the rampant rumors circulating throughout the academy, insinuating that Amaru had likely investigated Joshua's past. Agars pressed Joshua to consider apologizing to Amaru, emphasizing the importance of bowing down when necessary for survival. Joshua, resolute in his convictions, refused to entertain the idea, determined to demonstrate his steadfastness. Despite his resolve, Joshua couldn't help but notice Icarus's apprehensive expression. While empathetic to Icarus's concerns, Joshua recognized that he couldn't afford to be preoccupied with petty conflicts. The narrative shifts to a crucial task awaiting Joshua. Subsequently, we find ourselves in Lucia's subspace, where Joshua queries Lucia about her knowledge of his revenge. Delving deeper, Joshua questions if Lucia genuinely traveled back in time with him and urges her to reveal Bronto's other ability. In response, Lucia asserts that she cannot simply divulge information without Joshua meeting certain conditions. Despite Joshua's frustration, Lucia remains firm, stating that she's willing to provide hints if he fulfills her requirements. An exasperated Joshua implores Lucia to cease playing games and share the information. Lucia, undeterred, points out that Joshua has the choice to remain silent and sleep, emphasizing that she is under no obligation to disclose anything. Frustration boils over as Lucia rebukes Joshua for his impatience, prompting him to inquire about the conditions Lucia expects him to meet. Lucia calmly outlines her straightforward conditions to Joshua. He must re-establish the connection he had in his past life and prioritize self-care. Joshua, seeking clarification on how to take better care of himself, prompts Lucia for more details. Lucia insists on a swift response, citing drowsiness as motivation for Joshua to decide promptly. Joshua contemplates the simplicity of these conditions and promptly agrees to Lucia's terms. Lucia expresses hope that Joshua will fulfill these requirements, emphasizing the unique power embedded in a promise made with a divine artifact like herself. As promised, Lucia imparts a hint to Joshua, clarifying that Bronto's power isn't precognition. She distinguishes it from a precognitive dream, referencing Joshua's past vision of the Agnes Duchy's fall as an example of the latter. This revelation prompts Joshua to reconsider the nature of Bronto's abilities. Lucia reveals to Joshua an intriguing aspect of his abilities, the power of earnest thoughts manifesting in dreams. In Joshua's case, one of his revenge targets appeared in his dreams, hinting at the existence of a latent divine power within him. This divine power, as Lucia explains, is akin to the divine revelations received by high-ranking priests before impending danger. Joshua is taken aback by this revelation recognizing the profound implications of such a power. Lucia explains to Joshua that the term divine power refers to the power of God, often believed to grant high-ranking priests divine revelations of impending danger. Joshua's precognitive dream resembles this phenomenon, as it hints at divine influence. Lucia emphasizes that the true power of God is far more astonishing than humans perceive. Furthermore, Lucia reveals the second power surging within Joshua's body. If Joshua can successfully assimilate both powers, he will become virtually invincible, surpassing any human opponent. Most importantly, Lucia enlightens Joshua about the true potential of the primordial stone, Bronto. Bronto's genuine power lies beyond elemental capabilities. It embodies growth, boasting lightning-fast speed and immense destructive force. Joshua is intrigued by this revelation from Lucia. Meanwhile, the scene transitions back to the classroom, where Amaru confronts the teacher insisting that the matter cannot be overlooked. When prompted for clarification, Amaru asserts that the approved spar between himself and Joshua carries significant weight, 
It's not merely a casual match, but a pledge bound by noble honor. Amaru warns that any deviation from the agreed terms would tarnish his family's reputation, necessitating drastic action. The teacher grapples with the dilemma, recognizing the weight of familial influence despite the apparent student-teacher dynamic. Contemplating how to avert the impending confrontation, the teacher acknowledges the power dynamics at play. Amaru gestures towards Joshua, declaring that Joshua's return won't go unnoticed. He vows to seize the opportunity to demonstrate the futility of the spear. Joshua retorts, expressing his own determination not to let the matter rest. He pledges to illustrate the inefficacy of the rapier. As anticipation builds, students flock to the arena, eager not to miss the impending clash between Joshua and Amaru. Inside the hall, laughter erupts at the sight of Joshua wielding a spear. Icarus suggests Joshua consider apologizing to Amaru, prompting a terse response from Joshua. Despite Icarus's persistence, Joshua remains resolute, determined to face Amaru head-on. Icarus expresses uncertainty about Joshua's intentions but asserts his belief that Joshua cannot defeat Amaru. He worries that even if Joshua were to win, the Stin family would retaliate fiercely, considering it a humiliation to their son wielding the rapier. In response, Joshua resolves to confront the entire Stin family if necessary. Icarus observes Joshua's determination with genuine concern. In the charged atmosphere of the dual arena, Joshua noticed a subtle shift in Icarus's expression. Sensing a lack of trust in his abilities, Joshua decided to confront the issue head-on. He approached Icarus and candidly expressed his observation, acknowledging the skepticism in Icarus's demeanor. The tension between them escalated when Joshua proposed a bet, seeking to address the underlying distrust. Perplexed, Icarus struggled to comprehend Joshua's intentions. The idea of a bet seemed to elude him, prompting Joshua to elaborate on the terms. He explained that if he managed to defeat Amaru, safeguarding his convictions and surviving the challenges posed by the formidable Sten family, he would emerge as the victor. The stakes were high, the loser would be obligated to fulfill one wish of the winner. Icarus, still grappling with the unexpected proposition, failed to discern Joshua's underlying motivations. Undeterred by Icarus's confusion, Joshua remained confident in his abilities. He nonchalantly justified his decision to initiate the bet, expressing a belief in his own invincibility. The teacher intervened, sensing that the duel could not be delayed any longer. Icarus, however, took a moment to advise Joshua to place greater value on himself, emphasizing the impossibility of navigating challenges alone. The cryptic nature of Icarus's words left Joshua pondering whether something more profound was at play. As the duel loomed, the audience, comprised of eager students, erupted in anticipation. Their collective voice urged Amaru, the seasoned adversary, to swiftly dispatch the seemingly audacious new student. Amaru, assuming a stance of practiced readiness, prepared to strike. In stark contrast, Joshua stood composed, his eyes closed, spear in hand. The audience's bewilderment was palpable. Whispers echoed through the crowd as they questioned Joshua's unorthodox approach. On the surface, it seemed like a reckless move, a departure from the expected magical prowess that could overwhelm any opponent. Little did they know that Joshua had a different strategy in mind. In the depths of concentration, Joshua made a conscious choice. Despite having reached the third stage of the magic spear art, he opted to rely solely on his spearmanship. The decision reflected a profound realization that the pursuit of magical power alone had its limitations. In his quest for mastery, Joshua had inadvertently neglected the fundamentals. Now, with his eyes closed, he felt a connection to the basics that transcended the magical realms. The introspective moment unfolded as Joshua recalled the twists and turns of his journey. He recognized the value of revisiting the foundational principles he had initially mastered. The paths he had traversed, the experiences that shaped him, all converged in this pivotal duel. Joshua's closed eyes symbolized not ignorance, but a deliberate focus on the essence of his training. As the duel commenced, Amaru, fueled by determination, charges at Joshua with remarkable speed. As the confrontation unfolds, Amaru positions himself to strike, poised for impact. In a surprising twist, Joshua, with eyes closed until this moment, opens them with lightning-fast reflexes. The spectators, including fellow students and the teacher, are taken aback as Joshua skillfully breaks Amaru's wooden sword in an instant, and Amaru falls to the ground. The unexpected turn of events leaves everyone in shock, their disbelief palpable in the stunned silence that follows. Among the onlookers is Icarus, who stands alongside Anna, a fellow student. Anna, observing Joshua's unorthodox movements, 
comments on how Joshua doesn't conform to her expectations. To Icarus' surprise, Anna refers to Joshua by his full name, Joshua von Agnes, revealing a connection that raises eyebrows and adds an extra layer of intrigue to the unfolding scene. Inside Joshua's mind, a moment of revelation occurs. He realizes that the extreme swiftness he displayed, the kind that catches opponents off guard, represents a pinnacle he had sought in vain in his past life. Joshua is now enlightened, having achieved the coveted sixth stage of the magic spear art with unparalleled finesse. This newfound mastery elevates him beyond his previous limitations, and he stands victorious in this unexpected duel. The narrative transitions to the female trainee dormitory at Avalon Academy, where Anna is engaged in a magical communication. She contacts her father, Draxia Vel Grace, with an air of frustration and concern. Anna had anticipated a quieter life for Joshua at the academy, but his recent actions have disrupted her expectations. Draxia, responding directly to Anna's call, reveals information that adds a layer of complexity to the situation. Draxia informs Anna about the recent demise of Viscount Vigo at the hands of Jack Therapies, one of the seven magicians holding the Thunder Seat. Vigo's utility in their plans had made him valuable, and his loss is a setback. Anna, shocked by this unexpected turn of events, questions her father about the motives behind such a drastic act by a group as formidable as Jack's therapies. She speculates whether the Magic Tower, an influential institution known for monitoring magical activities, has uncovered their clandestine plans. Draxia, while acknowledging a certain connection between the Magic Tower's actions and their own, attempts to allay Anna's fears. He reassures her that, despite suspicious movements, there are no major issues within the kingdom. Draxia's revelation to Anna about Joshua von Agnes's possession of a coveted item sought by the Magic Tower ignites a discussion about potential courses of action. Anna, quick to strategize, suggests that her father, Draxia, should acquire the item to preempt any interference from the Magic Tower. However, Draxia dismisses this idea, cautioning that the item holds no value unless it's in the Magic Tower's hands. He explains that drawing attention to himself could jeopardize their plans. Instead, he emphasizes the importance of monitoring the various variables surrounding Joshua's actions, hinting at a larger scheme at play. Anna concurs, highlighting Joshua's disruptive presence since his arrival at the academy. She recounts his audacious behavior, including disparaging the Stin family's prized rapier and defeating their son in a duel with a single strike. Draxia, impressed by Joshua's boldness, wonders how Duke Agnes will react to these developments, hinting at the possibility of Joshua usurping the official heir, Babel, in his father's eyes. Anna, struggling to grasp the notion of an illegitimate child overtaking a legitimate heir, expresses disbelief at the prospect. However, Draxia points out the inherent bias a father may have toward his own blood, regardless of legitimacy. Meanwhile, the narrative shifts to the teacher's office, where Joshua, under the alias Eshvin Frederick, is summoned. The teacher, intrigued by Joshua's exceptional prowess and spearmanship, confronts him about his true identity. Joshua calmly confirms his alias, prompting speculation from the teacher about the possibility of high-ranking nobles or foreign royalty enrolling incognito. However, he ultimately expresses disinterest in Joshua's background, emphasizing that his concern lies solely with maintaining order within the academy. The teacher's words carried a weighty concern as he addressed Joshua, cautioning him about the repercussions of his recent actions. While a clash between students like Joshua and Amaru was typically viewed as a minor disagreement, the teacher emphasized that Joshua's victory over Amaru, a member of the esteemed Stin family, had significantly altered the situation. What might have been dismissed as a childish spat now carried far-reaching consequences, challenging the established order among the noble families. Joshua, displaying a resolute demeanor, assured the teacher that he was prepared to shoulder the responsibility for his actions. However, the teacher's tone turned somber as he recounted a similar incident involving another student, Siamese Kuhn Douglas, from the previous year. This anecdote served as a cautionary tale, illustrating the intricate social dynamics at play within the academy. Despite the academy's purported ideals of equality, the teacher revealed the existence of an unspoken hierarchy dictated by the influence and status of students' families. Amaru's defeat at Joshua's hands threatened to upset this delicate balance, potentially inciting reprisals against Joshua and others from less privileged backgrounds. Undeterred by the teacher's warning, Joshua challenged the entrenched norms. He questioned the morality of turning a blind eye to violence and manipulation within the academy to avoid immediate consequences. 
Joshua argued that such complacency only perpetuated harmful behaviors, fostering a culture of impunity. The teacher, taken aback by Joshua's audacity, attempted to rationalize their stance by citing the inevitability of certain societal realities. However, Joshua refused to succumb to defeatist attitudes. He rejected the notion of immutable circumstances, asserting that only cowards were paralyzed by fear and unwilling to challenge the status quo. The teacher broached a new suggestion to Joshua, highlighting an alternative path if Joshua's sole purpose for attending the academy was merely to fulfill graduation requirements. The teacher proposed recommending Joshua to the Imperial Knight Order, where compulsory education could be attained. Given Joshua's evident skill level, the teacher expressed confidence that Joshua would easily pass the entrance test. Joshua reflected on his previous rejection of the Kaiser's offer for recommended admission to the Imperial family. Additionally, since his enlightenment on Bronto's power, Joshua felt a sense of urgency, recognizing that his time at both the Academy and the Imperial Knight Order would be better spent elsewhere. The teacher, leveraging their authority, offered to facilitate Joshua's application for the test. Joshua, resolute in his intentions, asserted that he had no intention of wasting his time at the Academy. However, he also declared his refusal to flee with his tail between his legs, emphasizing that he was not one to back down from challenges. The teacher, taken aback by Joshua's determination, was left pondering his departure. As Joshua exited the teacher's office, leaving behind a contemplative atmosphere, the teacher gazed out of the window, wondering if Simi shared Joshua's sentiments. The scene shifts to Duke Agnes's residence, where his trusted butler enters with urgent news. The Empire is making progress with a matter of great significance, referred to only as that matter. Duke Agnes, intrigued, inquires about the source of this intelligence. The butler reveals that it comes from the Stin family, handing over a letter for the Duke to review. As Duke Agnes reads the letter, a sense of anticipation fills the air. It seems the long-awaited events have finally begun to unfold. Meanwhile, at the training ground, Kane, one of Duke Agnes's protégés, engages in a sparring match with his mentor. Duke Agnes, ever the vigilant instructor, questions Kane's readiness to protect their liege, Joshua. He expresses his hope that Kane's skills won't become a hindrance to Joshua's safety. Kane, fueled by determination, charges at Duke Agnes, expressing his desire to grow stronger and fulfill a promise made by Joshua to ensure Kane never has to bow to anyone but their liege. Duke Agnes swiftly evaded Kane's attack, prompting him to question Kane's fervent pursuit of strength, even to the extent of changing his primary weapon. In response, Kane revealed that his motivation stemmed from a promise made by Joshua. Joshua had assured Cain that under his leadership, Cain would never have to submit to anyone else. With unwavering faith in his liege's pledge, Cain persisted in his pursuit of strength. With a swift push, Duke Agnes gently incapacitates Cain, sending him crashing into a nearby wall. He then instructs the workers to tend to Cain's injuries. Duke Agnes pondered how Joshua had swiftly garnered such unwavering loyalty from someone in such a short period. Meanwhile, in another setting, Joshua engages in a conversation with Icarus, his friend and confidant. Joshua offers a simple explanation, power. He believes that by displaying enough strength and determination, he can compel obedience from those around him. While Icarus initially doubts the feasibility of Joshua's claim, the memory of Joshua's formidable display during his duel with Amaru leaves room for reconsideration. Joshua then reminds Icarus of a previous bet they had made, prompting Icarus to recall their agreement. Joshua shares a deeply personal wish with Icarus, expressing his desire for Icarus to stand by his side. Icarus, taken aback by Joshua's unexpected request, blushes with surprise. However, Joshua assures him, affirming his unwavering belief in Icarus's capabilities and emphasizing that he trusts only Icarus to wield his skills and service to their shared goals. Icarus, visibly moved by Joshua's faith in him, agrees to consider the proposition. He promises to contemplate it further if Joshua can demonstrate his ability to fulfill his promises. With that, Icarus hastily departs from the room, leaving Joshua to reflect on the progress they've made in their relationship. Meanwhile, in the grandeur of the Emperor's chamber, a different agenda unfolds. The Emperor, speaking with his trusted advisor Jakin, assigns him a crucial task to ensure Joshua's enlistment in the Imperial Knight Order by any means necessary. The Emperor's determination to secure Joshua's allegiance is palpable, as he offers to personally provide a recommendation letter if needed. Jakin, recognizing the daunting challenge posed by the Order's stringent requirements, 
understands the depth of the emperor's resolve to win Joshua over to his cause. In the quiet solitude of Joshua's room, he lies contemplatively on his bed, musing on the complexities of the academy's social dynamics. Initially dismissing the circles as mere frivolities, Joshua now grasps their profound significance. These alliances, forged by the offspring of influential nobles, serve as a nexus of power and influence. Outsiders, particularly those from less prestigious families, face ostracism and discrimination within these circles. Despite the professor's awareness of these injustices, their hands are tied, unable to intervene. Joshua sympathizes with their plight but refuses to succumb to the prevailing injustice. He recognizes that acquiescing to the unfair status quo only perpetuates the cycle of oppression. With the emergence of the Academy's most significant victim to the circles, Joshua perceives an opportunity for change. He believes that by addressing this systemic issue head-on, he can garner Icarus's support more readily than he initially anticipated. As Joshua contemplates the intricate path Kaiser may navigate without Icarus at his side, he eagerly anticipates the unfolding events. The complexities of their dynamic and the impending challenges seem to fuel Joshua's curiosity, leaving him intrigued about the thorny path Kaiser may tread in the absence of his steadfast companion. Icarus enters the room, prompting Joshua to shift his attention to the immediate concerns at hand. Icarus, evidently aware of the rumors circulating, expresses worry about the Sten family's potential involvement. Joshua, however, reassures Icarus, assuring him that the matter with Amaru has been resolved. Despite Joshua's confidence, Icarus raises a valid point. The Sten family might take action to protect their reputation, especially after Joshua's audacious critique of their swordsmanship. Adding to the complexity, Icarus forewarns Joshua about the Araxia Circle, a powerful faction within the Academy known for its influence. The imminent approach of this group further complicates Joshua's situation, but undeterred, he asserts that he has a plan to tackle both the Stin family and Araxia simultaneously. His unwavering determination radiates as he remains confident in his ability to navigate the intricate social structures within the Academy. The scene transitions to an outdoor setting, where Joshua encounters Amaru. As he observes Amaru's resilience and determination to improve despite his recent defeat, Joshua is both impressed and reflective. He notes Amaru's quick understanding of the principle of rotation, even in the short duration of their duel. Joshua marvels at Amaru's ability to search for the cause of his defeat even under the intense pain that led him to lose consciousness. In an unexpected turn, Amaru, with no apparent shame, seeks martial arts teachings from Joshua. This prompts Joshua to agree, but he attaches a condition to his consent. Amaru must provide Joshua with valuable information about the Araxia Circle, a group that has caught Joshua's attention. Additionally, Joshua expresses his interest in gathering information about Siamese Ku and Douglas. The narrative then shifts to the Avalon Imperial Palace, where Jaqen delivers news to the Emperor about an emergency letter from the Swallow Empire. The Emperor, recognizing the significance of the letter, immediately associates it with Draxia, the powerful figure from the Swallow Empire. Jaqen reveals that Draxia intends to expedite the plan previously communicated to the Emperor. Draxia, the formidable figure from the Swallow Empire, urges the Emperor to accelerate their plans and fulfill the promises made between them. However, the Emperor, while acknowledging Draxia's request, expresses concerns about the fierce opposition they face, particularly from Thran. He suspects that Thran may have discovered Avalon's involvement, leading him to withhold military support. Instead, he offers a compromise, suggesting the dispatch of two of the Empire's masters to assist Draxia. Jaqen, the Emperor's trusted advisor, assures him that he will issue this directive as a royal order. He also informs the Emperor of Joshua von Agnes's enrollment in the Academy under a false identity. Rumors suggest that Joshua defeated Amaru Sten, a notable feat considering Amaru's lineage. The Emperor finds amusement in this revelation, recognizing Joshua's exceptional prowess even compared to the Empire's pride, Babel von Agnes. Meanwhile, atop the Academy's roof, Joshua ponders his plans to disrupt the influential circle within the Academy before departing. His contemplation is interrupted by the unexpected arrival of Amaru. Initially dismissive, Joshua is taken aback when Amaru offers a sincere apology for his previous mockery of spears and shows genuine remorse for his actions. Joshua is surprised by Amaru's humility, wondering if this is the true nature of the person he had previously underestimated. Amaru's unexpected display of contrition prompts Joshua to forgive him, recognizing his own fault in underestimating his opponent and belittling his skills. 
Despite Amara's gratitude and apologies, Joshua dismisses the need for thanks or forgiveness, viewing it as unnecessary in their interaction. Upon hearing Joshua's forgiveness, Amaru's spirits lift, and he eagerly asks Joshua if he could teach him about Joshua's incredible swiftness. Joshua, taken aback by the request, listens as Amaru explains the intricacies of swiftness. Amaru describes swiftness as more than just moving quickly from one point to another. It involves finding the shortest path in a complex and challenging realm. During their duel, Amaru experienced firsthand the unpredictability of Joshua's attack path which seemed to twist his entire body before he lost consciousness. This revelation leaves Joshua intrigued by Amaru's insights in the potential depth of their martial arts discourse. The narrative unfolds as the setting shifts to the expansive Swallow Empire, a formidable nation rivaling the vastness of the Avalon Empire. Distinguished by its sweeping plains and renowned for its expertise in horseback arts, the Swallow Empire grapples with a persistent challenge, the quest for independence by the Thrin Principality. In the heart of this empire, Duke Altsma, a seasoned general who has ascended to the pinnacle of mastery, voices his concerns to the Emperor of Swallow. Urgency colors Altsma's words as he implores the Emperor to make swift decisions. Within the castle, other dukes join the chorus, echoing Altsma's sentiment and underlining the critical nature of the situation. Their collective apprehension revolves around the Swallow Empire's exclusive focus on neighboring kingdoms warning that such a myopic approach could sway the balance of power in favor of those neighboring realms. Duke Altsma, exuding confidence in his martial prowess, boldly declares that with the Emperor's backing, he can vanquish any opposing force, be it the formidable Arden von Agnes or the revered God's Knight Chrysler Jean Sebastian. However, Gander, the Sage of the Swallow Empire, interjects, reminding Altsma of a significant oversight. Gander draws attention to the absence of key figures, crucially the Emperor and another influential individual, both integral members of the Empire's Nine Stars. Gander elucidates the impracticality of disregarding the power held by neighboring nations. He emphasizes that any strategic move must take into account the strength wielded by these external forces, a challenge too formidable for the Swallow Empire to tackle in isolation. In the midst of this spirited debate, Emperor Draxia Bell Grace, revered as the wisest leader in the Swallow Empire's history, intervenes. Acknowledging Altsma's brilliance, Draxia cautions against unwarranted confidence. Draxia forewarns that Altsma's defeat would reverberate far beyond his personal consequences, jeopardizing the entire Swallow Empire and potentially inviting greater peril upon the nation. As the conversation unfolded in the Swallow Empire, Duke Altsma expressed remorse for not thoroughly considering the ramifications of their actions. Draxia, the Emperor, prompted Gander, the Sage, to share his thoughts on the matter. Gander offered a strategic perspective, stating that unless the Avalon Empire and the Hubalt Empire made significant moves, other kingdoms would likely express displeasure but lack the ability to take drastic actions. He highlighted the Hubalt Empire's distraction with the upcoming Pope election, allowing the Swallow Empire to focus more on Thran. However, Gander cautioned that Avalon could be a potential obstacle. Draxia agreed with this assessment acknowledging the need to avoid rash actions unless provoked by specific developments in Thran. Nevertheless, he instructed his forces to remain prepared for potential conflict, demonstrating a prudent approach to the uncertain future. With the meeting concluded, Draxia conferred with Marco, the Prime Minister of the Swallow Empire, discussing the influential figure in Thran, Knight Euravis. Marco recognized Euravis's pivotal role as a moral leader crucial for Thran's stability. Draxia contemplated the delicate balance between seeking the happiness of citizens and the necessity of maintaining power to ensure peace. In a contrasting scene, the narrative shifted to Joshua's room, where an unexpected visitor, Agars, stood before him. The sequence of encounters with influential figures, first Icarus and now Agars, hinted at the complexity of Joshua's situation. Agars, presumably acting in Joshua's interest, delivered a stern warning. He urged Joshua to steer clear of any interactions with Araxia, cautioning that crossing their path could not only imperil Joshua's life but also jeopardize the well-being of his family. Joshua confronts Agars, suggesting that Agars is the one who's afraid. This catches Agars off guard. As Joshua confronted Agars, he subtly hinted that Agars might be the one grappling with fear. The mention of Agars' brother caught him off guard, revealing a depth of knowledge Joshua possessed. Offering Agars an escape route, Joshua suggested that if Agars feared a similar fate for him as his brother, he could flee without judgment. However, 
Joshua cautioned Agars that continually evading challenges would ultimately lead to surrender. With a blend of humility and insight, Joshua stepped closer to Agars, questioning whether a life on the run appealed to him. Agars, momentarily speechless, fired back, questioning Joshua's understanding of the situation. He disclosed that Araxia's leader, Varen Shinvillas, hailed from one of Avalon's esteemed twelve families, posing an insurmountable barrier for those like them. Joshua, upon learning this, acknowledged the strategic advantage of having Varen at the helm, expressing gratitude to Agars for the revelation before departing, leaving Agars bewildered by the apparent significance. The scene transitioned to the designated chamber for Araxia members, where three students occupied the table while the rest stood in line. Natasha Moon Brieri, daughter of the Marquis family, one of Avalon's elite twelve families, impatiently urged them to commence proceedings. Gowong, another student, advocated for a more measured approach, playfully chiding Natasha for her impatience. Natasha countered by accusing Gowong of being too carefree, speculating about the concerns plaguing his family due to his laid-back demeanor. She insinuated that his father, Marquis Crombell, was likely preoccupied with familial matters, leaving little time to worry about Gawang. Gawang, upon hearing his family name mentioned, clarified that his family's issues were separate from his personal life, and he simply sought to savor the moment. He cautioned Natasha that fixating on trivial matters would only lead to frustration. Varen intervened, instructing both Natasha and Gawang to cease their bickering, bringing order to the room. As Varen absorbed the news of Amaru's defeat at the hands of someone named Ash, a shockwave rippled through the Avalon Empire. Natasha, one of the Twelve Family's daughters, couldn't fathom the event, wondering aloud about the identity and prowess of this mysterious Ash. Gawang, on the other hand, playfully teased Natasha for adding yet another name to her list of potential suitors, suggesting she reserve judgment until she saw Ash's appearance. Varen, typically indifferent to such matters, was surprisingly serious about the situation. He cautioned Natasha and Gawang that Ash was not to be taken lightly, hinting at a personal encounter where he had suffered a bit at the hands of this mysterious figure. This revelation surprised Gawang, who had not expected Varen to be concerned about a member of a fallen family. Natasha, too, found Varen's sudden change of heart intriguing and out of character. Gawang, ever the carefree individual, questioned Varen's newfound interest in a fallen family. Natasha, Echoing Gawang's sentiments, pointed out the unusual nature of Varen's concern. Varen, however, stressed that Ash was a formidable opponent and their nonchalant attitude could have severe consequences. He also revealed that Ash had a connection with the fourth imperial prince, adding another layer of complexity to the situation. Natasha, quick to see opportunities, suggested recruiting Ash to Araxia, their exclusive group. She believed that using this situation to their advantage could strengthen Araxia's position. Varen, frustrated with Natasha's seemingly opportunistic proposal, questioned her motives. Gawang, however, sided with Natasha, seeing the potential benefits that Ash could bring to Araxia. Varen reminded them of the loyalty Amara's brother had shown, highlighting the familial ties that transcended the fallen status of the Stint family. Varen expressed his distaste for the idea of Ash freely roaming around the academy, vowing to make Ash understand the consequences of crossing paths with him. The mention of Siamese Kuin Douglas hinted at a history where Varen had dealt with individuals who dared to challenge his authority. The narrative then shifted to Joshua, standing outside the headmaster's office. He anticipated being summoned, suspecting that the meeting would revolve around the incident with Amaru. Joshua realized that the hope of navigating his days at the academy quietly had been abruptly shattered by the unfolding events. As Joshua stepped into the headmaster's room, he was greeted by the presence of a masked individual. The figure, concealed behind their mask, informed Joshua that he had been sent by order of His Majesty the Emperor to deliver a message. The figure concealed behind a mask approached Joshua with an air of solemnity, bearing news dictated by the Emperor's decree. In response to Joshua's inquiry about his identity, he disclosed his affiliation with the Black Wind, the covert intelligence arm directly answerable to the Emperor. This revelation triggered a flood of memories in Joshua's mind, recalling tales of the Black Wind's legendary status as the Emperor's unwavering loyalists, reminiscent of an old comrade once renowned as the Assassin King. As the conversation progressed, the masked envoy underscored the gravity of the Emperor's message. The Emperor expressed his disappointment at Joshua's refusal of the missive from the Fourth Imperial Prince and urged him to align with his will. The path forward, as dictated by the Emperor's desires, entailed Joshua's prompt induction into the esteemed Imperial Knight Order. 
To sweeten the proposition, the emperor offered to furnish Joshua with a recommendation letter at his request. However, a note of warning accompanied the emperor's offer. Should Joshua persist in his defiance, the emperor would resort to drastic measures. There was a thinly veiled threat of manipulating circumstances to expedite Joshua's expulsion from the academy, coercing his compliance with the emperor's wishes to join the imperial knights. Thus, the masked messenger emphasized the imperative nature of heeding the emperor's will, lest dire consequences befall Joshua's future endeavors. As the masked messenger's words lingered in the air, Joshua absorbed the weight of the emperor's uncompromising edict. It was a stark reminder of the emperor's dominion, compelling Joshua to consider his next move carefully. The advice to swiftly heed the summons to the imperial palace reverberated in his mind, each syllable laden with the implicit threat of repercussions should he delay. With a sense of urgency gnawing at him, Joshua left the confines of the principal's office, his thoughts swirling with the realization that the emperor's reputation for resolute authority was not unfounded. Meanwhile, outside the office, the scene unfolded in a chaotic tableau. Douglas, fueled by unchecked aggression, unleashed his fury upon Icarus, the violence unfolding with a raw intensity. It was a confrontation that threatened to spiral out of control until Agar stepped in, his presence a temporary barrier against the onslaught. Yet, even in the midst of the turmoil, Douglas remained steadfast, his resolve unyielding as he dismissed Agar's attempts to defuse the situation. Amidst the chaos, Agar's voice cut through the tumult like a beacon of reason, demanding answers and accountability from those involved. His queries hung in the air, as Gawang interjected, offering a semblance of clarity amidst the confusion. The tension remained palpable, each word spoken fraught with unspoken implications and underlying tensions. As if Agar's previous transgression was merely being having the wrong older brother, he now finds himself condemned for his choice of friends. Conversing with Gawang, Agars reflects on the brevity of Joshua's presence at the academy, questioning whether their relationship has progressed to the level of friendship. Yet, before the uncertainty can settle, Varen interjects with a perspective of his own. Varen's assertion that Joshua possesses a penchant for involvement in matters beyond his own prompts Agars to seek clarification. Varen, however, remains cryptic, suggesting that Agars need not concern himself with the specifics. Instead, he outlines a plan that involves capturing Agars and Icarus as leverage to summon Joshua. Reminding Agars of a past incident involving his older brother Siamis, Varen urges him to replicate the same strategy. The mention of Siamis triggers a poignant memory for Agars, a moment of familial solidarity where Siamis assured him of their bond as brothers. Yet, the memory quickly darkens as Agars recalls Varen's brutal assault on Siamis a stark reminder of the ruthlessness lurking within their shared history. Varen's words echoed with a chilling finality as he addressed Siamese, his tone laced with thinly veiled threats. He reminded Siamese of the apparent leniency he had shown by merely expelling him from the academy, despite the irreversible damage inflicted upon him. It was a stark reminder of Varen's authority and willingness to wield it ruthlessly. With a somber warning, Varen advised Agars to tread carefully, insinuating dire consequences should he choose to challenge the status quo. As the tension thickened, memories of past conversations resurfaced, including Joshua's poignant question to Agars about his future. The memory lingered briefly before fading into the present turmoil. Agars, undeterred, mustered his courage to confront Varen, intent on defying his oppressive rule. However, before he could act, Douglas intervened with a sudden and violent blow disrupting Agars's resolve and asserting Varen's dominance once more. Seizing the moment, Varen issued a veiled threat aimed at Joshua and their families, his words dripping with malice. Yet, in a surprising turn of events, Icarus found his voice amidst the chaos, condemning the nobles' cowardly tactics and questioning their integrity. His words struck a chord, challenging Varen's authority and prompting a tense confrontation between the two. Varen's onslaught against Icarus persisted relentlessly, each kick landing with brutal force, while the surrounding witnesses could only look on in shock. Despite Agars's urgent pleas for restraint, Varen remained unmoved, his relentless assault showing no signs of abating. In a pivotal moment, Joshua stormed into the scene, his countenance a mix of fury and disappointment. He confronted Varen head-on, accusing him of betraying their previous agreement and subjecting Icarus to further harm. Joshua's words carried a weight of determination as he warned Varen of the dire consequences awaiting him. Undaunted by Joshua's admonishment, Varen brushed off any comparison between his actions and Joshua's supposed transgressions. However, Joshua stood firm, 
asserting that Varen's assault on his friends was a far graver offense than Varen realized. This proclamation left Agars pondering whether Joshua truly considered him and Icarus as friends. As Joshua approached Varen with unwavering resolve, he vowed that Varen would face the full extent of retribution for harming his friends. Yet, seizing the moment, Varen issued a chilling ultimatum to Joshua, reminding him of the power he wielded and the dire consequences of defying him. Caught off guard by Varen's threat, Joshua momentarily hesitated, reassessing his next course of action amidst the tense confrontation. Observing Joshua's momentary pause, Varen remarks that Joshua seems to have finally grasped the gravity of the situation. He derides Joshua's lineage, questioning what the scion of a fallen family could possibly hope to achieve. Nearby, Natasha observes Joshua's reaction with interest, finding him to be more formidable than she initially anticipated. Gawang interjects, dismissing Joshua's bravado as mere bravado. He challenges Joshua's earlier assertion about the severity of laying hands on his friends, questioning whether Joshua truly believes he can contend with every influential family present. Natasha chimes in, noting the formidable presence of three of the twelve families and suggesting that even the offspring of the five Duke families lack the power to challenge them. She concedes that matters would be different if the Agnes or Tremblin Duke families were involved. Ignoring Joshua's identity, Varen asserts his intent to bring the situation to a decisive end. However, before he can proceed further, Varen mentions Joshua's familiarity with the Dawn Ring, injecting a note of intrigue into the tense exchange. In response to Varen's revelation, Joshua's demeanor remains composed, betraying no hint of surprise. He acknowledges Varen's statement with a calm resolve, suggesting that he is indeed aware of the significance of the Dawn Ring. Varen questioned Joshua's decision to return the Dawn Ring, noting that Joshua could have used it as leverage against him. In response, Joshua firmly stated that he refused to resort to the underhanded tactics that Varen employed. Varen's unexpected reaction hinted at a begrudging respect for Joshua's moral stance. He expressed satisfaction that Joshua had not succumbed to the same manipulative methods. Then, in a surprising turn, Varen offered to impart a valuable lesson to Joshua. He revealed the true potential of the Dawn Ring, explaining that by imbuing it with mana, he could unleash its latent power. Varen demonstrated by triggering an explosion with the ring, enveloping himself in an armor of his family's heritage. Varen's voice sliced through the tension, a subtle menace underlying his words. He reminded Joshua of the harsh reality of their world, where family lineage dictated one's power and influence. With a hint of disdain, Varen dismissed Joshua's attempts to assert his own authority, confident that Joshua's efforts would prove futile in the face of established hierarchy. Gawang interjected, noting the disparity between his own dawn ring and Varen's extravagant display. He mused about persuading his father to procure him a more impressive one, eliciting a scoff from Natasha. She pointed out the exorbitant cost of such a request, questioning Gawang's father's willingness to indulge such extravagance when Gawang's current ring sufficed. Despite the seriousness of the conversation, a moment of levity emerged as Gawang chuckled at Natasha's retort. However, Natasha's mention of another individual, Ash, shifted the tone once more. Varen dismissed Ash with a wave of his hand, asserting that Natasha would quickly grow tired of someone like him. He likened Ash to Siamese, a figure from their past who dared to challenge Varen's authority. Varen's reminiscence turned dark as he recounted Siamese's fate, a stark warning of the consequences of rebellion in their unforgiving world. In that decisive moment, Joshua strode purposefully toward Varen, his intent clear in his determined stride. Sensing Joshua's approach, Varen cautioned him against acting rashly, but Joshua remained resolute, his eyes flashing with determination. He voiced his desire to witness not only the downfall of those before him but also the destruction of Varen's own family. With unwavering resolve, Joshua reminded Varen of his own words regarding the significance of family power in their world. Drawing forth his own dawn ring, Joshua's actions stunned Varen and the surrounding onlookers. As Joshua activated the ring, a deafening explosion erupted, engulfing him in a brilliant light. Varen stood frozen in shock as the dust settled, his eyes widening in disbelief. Before him stood Joshua, adorned in the formidable armor of the Agnes Duchy, bearing the symbol of the Agnes Duke family, the Knight's Tomb. The revelation sent ripples of astonishment through Gawang, Natasha, and the other students, who had believed Babel von Agnes to have already graduated from the academy. As Gawang recollects, a sudden realization strikes him, prompting him to reveal, yes, this Ash fellow. He's the rumored prodigy who awakened as a wielder of mana at the tender age of nine within the esteemed Agnes Duke lineage.
Joshua sees the moment to confront Varen, echoing his earlier words about the importance of family power within the academy. In a moment of revelation, Joshua declared his true identity as Joshua von Agnes. Turning to Varen, he demanded to know the extent of his family standing in their world. Varen, taken aback by this unexpected revelation, was momentarily stunned. Before the tension could escalate further, Natasha attempted to intervene, suggesting a misunderstanding. However, Joshua cut her off abruptly, his anger palpable as he began to emanate his aura. He rebuked them for their callous disregard for others' lives and their blind allegiance to family power, casting them as heartless manipulators who showed no remorse for causing suffering. Gawang, representing the legacy of the Twelve Families, cautioned against making enemies of their esteemed peers. But Joshua countered with a pointed question, challenging Gawang to consider the consequences of antagonizing the Agnes Duke family. The shock rippled through Gawang as he contemplated the precariousness of their situation, particularly with the ongoing tensions with the Prontier family. In a solemn tone, Joshua warned Gawang of the dire consequences of antagonizing the Agnes Duke family. He emphasized that not only would Gawang risk losing his position as successor, but he could also endanger his family, given the vast disparity in power between the Agnes Duchy and the Pontier Duke family. Joshua clarified that his grievances were solely directed at those who had harmed his friends. He offered a chance for those uninvolved to depart safely. Hearing this, the students from other families seized the opportunity and fled, eager to avoid further confrontation. Varen, however, refused to yield, threatening the fleeing students with dire consequences. Joshua urged Varen to focus on his own predicament, revealing his intention to expel Araxia from the academy that day. Varen was left speechless unable to comprehend the gravity of the situation. With determination in his eyes, Joshua infused his sword with his aura and struck Varen with full force, sending him crashing into the wall. Gawang and Natasha watched in shock as Joshua approached them, instructing Gawang to tend to Varen and depart. Gawang's voice carried a note of resignation as he addressed Joshua, acknowledging the widely known fact that Babel was the official successor of the Agnes Duke family. Despite Joshua's undeniable talent, Gawang insisted that this fundamental truth would remain unchanged. He warned Joshua that the repercussions of his actions would surely haunt him in the days to come. Joshua met Gawang's words with unwavering resolve, expressing anticipation for whatever trials lay ahead. Meanwhile, Natasha's urgent plea diverted Gawang's attention, prompting him to assist her in transporting Varen to the infirmary. As Gawang hurried off with Natasha, Agars and Icarus approached Joshua, seeking clarification about his lineage. Joshua responded cryptically, acknowledging that everyone harbored their own secrets. Expressing regret for involving them in the confrontation, Joshua inquired about their well-being. Icarus reassured Joshua that they were unharmed, prompting Joshua to express surprise at his lack of astonishment regarding Joshua's heritage. With a knowing smile, Icarus admitted that he had suspected as much from the beginning. Icarus pondered the perplexing question of why someone from a fallen family would even bother attending the academy. After all, the imperial family wouldn't spare a moment's notice for such individuals. Joshua's presence seemed to defy logic. There appeared to be no discernible reason for him to seek attention from the aristocracy. Joshua's response introduced the possibility that he aimed to establish personal connections akin to Araxias. However, Icarus found this notion even more incredulous, given the Academy's general indifference towards individuals from ruined families. He emphasized that the Academy's elite would scarcely acknowledge someone from such a background. Further elaborating, Icarus highlighted the clarity of the contextual cues surrounding Joshua's situation. Among thousands of trainees, Joshua stood as the sole representative of a dismantled noble lineage. He noted that a significant portion of past occurrences involved individuals concealing their true identities. Agars, taken aback by this revelation, expressed his surprise at the statistics. Meanwhile, Joshua silently affirmed his suspicions, finding the situation unfolding just as he had anticipated. Joshua admired Icarus's boldness in expressing his thoughts, even when the social status of others was known. It led Joshua to conclude that Icarus possessed exceptional strategic skills. Catching sight of Joshua's smile, Icarus couldn't help but notice the admiring gaze directed his way. Curious about the attention, Icarus inquired why Joshua was staring at him. With a playful grin, Joshua complimented Icarus on his captivating eyes. The unexpected praise left Icarus blushing, caught off guard by Joshua's unexpected compliment. Thran, a diminutive nation, had long been under the sway of the Swallow Empire. King Anthony, who had devoted his life to securing Thran's independence, 
passed away at the age of 72. In a poignant memory, King Anthony entrusted his daughter and the fate of Frandi Uravis. Returning to the present, Uravis resolved to fulfill King Anthony's vision of Fran's independence at any cost. The Princess of Thran, honoring her father's wishes, placed her trust in Uravis's hands. Promising to dedicate his life to Thran's cause, Uravis recognized the urgency of the situation. With King Anthony's passing, there was no time to delay, especially with the looming threats posed by the Swallow and Avalon empires, as well as the formidable Magic Tower. Uravis understood that securing control over the primordial stone magma was essential for Thran's survival. Meanwhile, Jack arrived at the Avalon Academy, his presence heralding potential shifts in the balance of power. Elsewhere, Joshua found himself sprawled on the forest floor, contemplating his next move. Aware of the looming challenges and perhaps disillusioned with the academy, Joshua began to contemplate his departure. Joshua found himself unexpectedly contemplating an early departure from the academy, a departure that had not been part of his initial plans upon arrival. Determined to journey to the Imperial Palace without delay, Joshua knew there was something crucial awaiting him in the secret storage there. The mere thought of Cain's reaction to this sudden turn of events brought a wry smile to Joshua's lips. Undoubtedly, Cain would be taken aback. Joshua imagined Cain diligently honing his skills under Duke Agnes's tutelage. As Joshua pondered his next steps, Jack emerged, announcing his long-awaited encounter with Joshua. Intrigued yet cautious, Joshua inquired about Jack's identity. Jack introduced himself as Jack Sterapis, a member of the Magic Tower's illustrious Seven Magicians, holding the esteemed title of Thunder Seat. He wasted no time in revealing his mission, to reclaim Bronto, which Joshua had taken from the Forest of Dark Beings. Joshua, sensing the gravity of the situation, suggested relocating to a more suitable venue to address the matter at hand. With tension thick in the air, Joshua urged Jack to join him in a change of location before proceeding further. Upon hearing Joshua's proposal, Jack acknowledged Joshua's unexpected understanding of the situation. With a nod, he deferred to Joshua to lead the way as they delved deeper into the forest shadows. Yet, as they ventured further, Jack couldn't help but voice his concern about the distance they were covering. Joshua brushed off Jack's apprehension, assuring him that they were unlikely to encounter anyone in such remote terrain. However, Joshua couldn't resist a sly remark, pointing out Jack's naivety and expecting him to surrender Bronto willingly. Jack's suspicion was confirmed as Joshua revealed his true intentions. With a flicker of determination, Joshua asserted his confidence in his own abilities, ready to face off against Jack. With a surge of energy, Joshua unleashed his aura, launching a powerful strike at Jack. Yet, to Joshua's astonishment, Jack swiftly intercepted the attack, seizing Joshua's fist in a firm grip. In a moment of realization, Jack admitted that while Joshua may be the strongest in his own generation, Jack was not bound by the same limitations. With a swift motion, Jack forcefully pushed Joshua to the ground, demanding compliance and revealing Bronto's whereabouts. Joshua scoffed at Jack's verbose rhetoric, noting that Jack risked defeat by being so careless with his defenses. With a determined call, Joshua summoned Lucia, his trusty weapon, which materialized and struck at Jack with formidable force. Yet, Jack managed to evade Joshua's assault, narrowly avoiding a potentially dangerous encounter. Observing Lucia's power, Jack recognized it as the fabled ancient artifact he had heard tales of. Inquisitively, he questioned whether this was the same lightning power Joshua had employed to vanquish the Black Ogre in the Forest of Dark Beings. Joshua, evasive in his response, pondered whether he should disclose such information to Jack, silently acknowledging Jack's unexpected strength. Unbeknownst to Jack, Joshua had already absorbed Bronto's power. Undeterred by Joshua's silence, Jack warned that if Joshua refused to divulge Bronto's whereabouts, he would resort to more traditional methods. Joshua remained resolute, dismissing Jack's threats as a misunderstanding. With a hint of defiance, Joshua challenged Jack's assumption that he would willingly surrender the information. Jack retorted that Joshua was the one misunderstanding, referencing his proficiency in mental magic brain control. With lightning speed, Jack unleashed a spell, swiftly maneuvering behind Joshua and striking with his lightning blade. Joshua's agility allowed him to narrowly evade the attack though he couldn't help but marvel at Jack's ability to cast Class 4 magic with mere verbal command. Assuring Joshua of his intent not to kill him, Jack pressed on, launching another assault, this time with his lightning spear. Witnessing the sheer force of Jack's attack, Joshua couldn't help but acknowledge its lethality. The resulting explosion underscored the gravity of the situation. As the dust settled, Jack presumed Joshua subdued. 
However, Joshua swiftly countered, launching his own attack from behind. Though Jack anticipated the move and retaliated, Joshua remained undeterred. With deft maneuvering, Joshua deflected Jack's assault with Lucia before launching his own offensive. Jack, undeterred by Joshua's counterattack, met it head-on, blocking Joshua's strike with confidence. Observing Joshua's precise mana control and high mana density, Jack acknowledged Joshua's formidable skill. Sensing an opportunity, Joshua seized the moment, directing Lucia to strike Jack head-on with his aura. The force of Joshua's attack sent Jack staggering backward, impressed by Joshua's resourcefulness. Undeterred by Jack's evasion, Joshua leaped forward, aiming another strike with Lucia. However, Jack deftly dodged Joshua's assault, retaliating with a lightning spell. Yet, Joshua's agility allowed him to evade Jack's counterattack mid-air, gracefully landing on the ground. Amused by Joshua's evasive maneuvers, Jack challenged him to sustain the dodging tactic. With precision, Jack unleashed a barrage of strikes, prompting Joshua to evade each one. Joshua realized he couldn't keep dodging indefinitely and needed to close the distance between them. In response, Jack taunted Joshua, reminding him of the humiliation of losing to a magician in close quarters combat. Despite the taunt, Joshua remained determined to find a way to overcome Jack's formidable abilities. Jack vowed to make Joshua taste the humiliation he spoke of, unleashing his lightning bolt spell. In response, Joshua employed his magic spear art, engaging in a clash that resulted in a tremendous explosion. Struggling to withstand the force of Jack's attack, Joshua found himself pushed to his limits. As Jack approached, he remarked on Joshua's resilience, noting that even seasoned B-rank expert knights would struggle against a class 4 magic strike. Undeterred, Joshua braced himself for the next onslaught, refusing to yield to Jack's demands. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Jack offered Joshua one final chance to surrender Bronto. Despite the weight of Jack's words, Joshua remained steadfast. Suddenly, Joshua noticed he was encircled by lightning spheres, a trap set by Jack during their exchange. With caution, Joshua prepared to navigate the treacherous situation, aware that any misstep could lead to imminent danger. Joshua's defiance rang clear as he questioned whether Jack truly believed he would surrender. In response, Jack clenched his hand, sending all the lightning spheres hurtling towards Joshua simultaneously. Reacting swiftly, Joshua unleashed his magic spear art, Stage 2, Violent Gale, blocking the spheres and triggering a massive explosion. Jack, taken aback by Joshua's resilience, acknowledged his surprise. Despite Jack's intention to defeat him, Joshua stood firm against the onslaught. However, weakened from the exchange, Joshua found himself barely able to remain upright. Suddenly, the lightning spheres reappeared, encircling Joshua once more. Shocked by their reappearance, Joshua realized they were relentless in their pursuit until their target was vanquished. Undeterred, Jack urged Joshua to display his genius talent once more. With determination, Jack prepared a formidable fire spell, conjuring a massive fireball aimed directly at Joshua. In that moment, Lucia, Joshua's spear, questioned whether Joshua was truly considering giving up so easily. Joshua surveyed his surroundings, noticing that time seemed to slow down around him. Lucia implored Joshua not to abandon the opportunity to unleash his newfound power. However, Joshua explained that his opponent was too formidable to risk employing that power against. Lucia urged Joshua to disregard such concerns, reminding him of his relentless determination in the face of any adversary. She reminded him that his approach had always been to overcome every obstacle in his path. Hearing Lucia's words, Joshua reflected on his past triumphs. He had conquered seemingly insurmountable challenges, even demolishing an impregnable castle. Regardless of the opponent, Joshua was resolute in his identity as Joshua Sanders. As Jack hurled the searing fireball toward Joshua, the latter responded with a masterful invocation of his magic spear art, unleashing Stage 3, Path of Azura. The air crackled with energy as Joshua became enveloped in a shimmering blue aura, signifying the formidable power he wielded. With precision, he launched the spear towards Jack, the projectile slicing through the fiery assault with uncanny accuracy. Caught off guard by Joshua's prowess, Jack invoked a swift blink spell, narrowly evading the oncoming spear. However, to his disbelief, Joshua swiftly reappeared from an unexpected angle, delivering a devastating blow that sent Jack reeling. As Jack crumpled under the force of the attack, a sharp pang of pain coursed through Joshua's body, a stark reminder of how close the battle had been. Reflecting on the narrow victory, Joshua couldn't shake the realization that Jack's lapse in defense could have easily spelled his own demise. Grateful for his stroke of luck, 
Joshua watched as Jack's body began to radiate with a crackling aura of lightning, pushing Joshua back with its sheer intensity. As fatigue weighed heavily upon him and his eyelids threatened to close, Lucia's urgent voice pierced through the haze. Joshua, hurry. Cultivate your mana before Bronto devours Jack's therapy's mana circles and unleashes chaos, urged Lucia. Responding to her plea, Joshua focused his efforts on cultivating his mana, feeling its power coalesce around him in a swirling vortex. With a surge of energy, the gathered mana erupted in a spectacular explosion, marking the end of the intense confrontation. The scene transitions to the hallowed halls of the Academy's faculty meeting room, where a gathering of esteemed professors convenes to deliberate upon matters of special admission. Such clandestine admissions have long been conducted under veiled secrecy, but in the case of Joshua Vaughn Agnes, the atmosphere crackles with an unusual tension. Baron Sigurdin, a venerable figure among Avalon's academic elite, addresses the assembly, his voice weighted with concern. He points out the unprecedented nature of Joshua's situation, noting that never before has a student so brazenly flaunted their familial ties, causing discord among their peers. A dissenting voice interjects, suggesting that if Joshua indeed hails from the esteemed lineage of the Duke Agnes, the Academy may be compelled to tread lightly. However, Professor Sigurd encounters, asserting that the student body clamors for transparency, undeterred by potential repercussions. Moreover, he underscores the perilous implications of sweeping these special admissions under the rug. To do so, he warns, would only serve to tarnish the Academy's reputation irreparably, plunging it into the depths of disrepute. As the weight of these deliberations hangs heavy in the air, Professor Sigurdin turns his gaze towards Count Steinein Albert, the venerable headmaster of Avalon Academy, awaiting his decisive stance on the matter. Professor Sigurdin directs his attention to Headmaster Stein articulating the concerning reality that families wield undue influence in securing special admissions for children unrelated to them. Headmaster Stein acknowledges the validity of Sigurdin's argument, though he harbors doubts that this issue will escalate beyond a mere complaint. Yet, the crux of the matter lies in the entanglement of twelve prominent families in this quagmire. Proposing a bold course of action, Sigurdin advocates for Joshua von Agnes' expulsion as a symbolic gesture to uproot the systemic issue of special admissions. However, his suggestion is swiftly met with opposition from Professor Keane, who dismisses it as nonsensical. Keane asserts that the matter could be resolved through academic service, a viewpoint that frustrates Sigurdin. In a tense exchange, Sigurdin rebuffs Keane's stance, attributing the magnitude of the problem to the leniency of past disciplinary measures. Keane counters, highlighting the lack of clarity surrounding Joshua's motives for participating in the special admission process. Furthermore, he contends that there isn't sufficient cause to expel Joshua summarily. Professor Sigurdin presses Professor Keane, emphasizing that the Academy possesses more than enough justification for action, citing Joshua von Agnes's severe injury inflicted upon Varenshin Villas. Sigurdin asserts that such a grievous offense cannot be ignored. In response, Professor Keane counters with a pointed insinuation, suggesting that rumors of Marquis Villas's intentions to introduce Sigurdin to central politics may have clouded his judgment. Keane questions whether Sigurdin's thirst for power has blinded him to the potential consequences of sacrificing a student's future. Turning to their fellow professors gathered around the table, Keane challenges them to voice their agreement or dissent with Sigurdin's stance. However, met with silence, Keane's surprise is palpable. Meanwhile, Sigurdin silently relishes the strengthening of his position, foreseeing advancement in central politics. As tension mounts, Keane directs his query to the headmaster, questioning whether even for a special admission, such actions are justifiable. Professor Keane vehemently asserts that no reputable academy on the continent would consider expelling a student without affording them the opportunity to present their case and explain their circumstances. He goes on to argue that not only should Joshua von Agnes be spared punishment, but he should also be commended for his courageous actions in thwarting the nefarious deeds of Circle Araxia and dismantling it entirely, eh, a feat that even the professors themselves couldn't achieve. In response, Professor Sigurdin admonishes Keane, cautioning him to speak only to what he can confidently stand behind. Sigurdin condemns Keane's remarks as not only bringing shame upon the professors, but tarnishing the Academy's reputation as well. Incensed by Sigurdin's rebuke, Keane fires back accusing Sigurdin of hypocrisy and urging the other professors to reflect on their complicity through their silence. He suggests that the allure of power has clouded their judgment, leading to harm being inflicted upon the very students they are meant to guide. 
Professor Keen directs a pointed question to the assembled professors, demanding to know how much longer they intend to remain silent. He emphasizes that as educators responsible for shaping the minds of students, such passivity is unacceptable. In response, Professor Sigurdin rebukes Keen, urging him to cease speaking nonsense. However, their exchange is abruptly interrupted as Count Stein and Duke Agnes make an unexpected entrance into the meeting room, causing a ripple of astonishment among those present. The headmaster, taken aback by their sudden appearance, inquires as to the reason for their presence, addressing both the Duke and Count with a mix of surprise and curiosity. Count Sten addresses the headmaster, explaining that the disturbance prompted his presence, indicating that he couldn't simply disregard such turmoil. Duke Agnes interjects, expressing that as a concerned parent, it is only fitting for him to be present if his child is involved in a matter of contention. In response to Duke Agnes's formality, the headmaster reassures him that such formality is unnecessary. However, Duke Agnes insists that decorum is essential, particularly in a place of profound importance like the academy, where future leaders of their empire are nurtured. He emphasizes that this meeting holds significance not only for the education of their children, but also for determining the appropriate consequences for any wrongdoing. Professor Sigurdin interjects, arguing against the notion of punishment. Count Sten concurs, asserting that special admissions are inherently flawed, regardless of the circumstances. With a solemn demeanor, Count Sten challenges Professor Sigurdin to consider whether he shares the same viewpoint. Professor Sigurdin was rendered speechless. Duke Agnes, sensing the tension, urges Count Sten to desist from further provocation. Count Sten defends his actions, stating that he merely posed a question to Professor Sigurdin. To the astonishment of all present, Professor Sigurdin responds with a pointed inquiry of his own, questioning Duke Agnes's motives for being present. The headmaster is taken aback by Sigurdin's audacity, cautioning him to choose his words carefully. However, Duke Agnes, unfazed, acknowledges the truth in Sigurdin's statement, admitting that his presence is indeed motivated by concerns regarding his son, Joshua. Professor Cecil interjects, reminding Duke Agnes of his earlier assertion that the academy serves as a nurturing ground for future leaders. Duke Agnes concedes the point, affirming that the academy is indeed a place designed to cultivate and groom the next generation. With Duke Agnes's presence, our choices will undoubtedly be swayed by his influence. Professor Cecil concedes that if Duke Agnes is here solely as a concerned parent accepting responsibility for his child's actions, then there is little room for objection. However, Cecil maintains that for matters involving special admissions, fault cannot solely be placed on the student. The headmaster acknowledges Cecil's implication but advises caution, warning that such frankness could jeopardize the academy's position. Professor Sigurdin aligns with Cecil's sentiment, suggesting that Duke Agnes's influential presence implies a predetermined outcome. Count Sten intervenes, noting Sigurdin's sudden change in demeanor. He accuses the professors of remaining silent when his own son was troubled by the group Araxia, only to speak up now that the circumstances have shifted. The professors were rendered speechless by Count Sten's revelation. Duke Agnes turns to the headmaster, correcting the misconception by asserting that his purpose for being there isn't to exert pressure on the academy regarding the recent incident. The headmaster, puzzled, queries Duke Agnes about his true intentions. Duke Agnes explains that he was informed of his son's alleged disrespectful actions towards the Stin family and had come to seek Count Stin's forgiveness. However, upon learning that Count Stin was en route to the academy, Duke Agnes rushed there, fearing trouble for Joshua. Count Stin, unmoved, declares that he has yet to forgive Joshua and warns that without the ability to substantiate his claims, Joshua may face dire consequences. In response, Duke Agnes expresses confidence in Joshua's capabilities suggesting that Count Sten will be surprised upon meeting him in person. Count Sten addressed Duke Agnes with a measured tone, expressing his anticipation of meeting Joshua face to face. Duke Agnes, however, diverted the conversation with a weighty declaration to the headmaster. He emphasized the gravity of the current special admissions debacle, asserting that it could have profound ramifications for the entire academy. Without hesitation, he remarked that severe punishment, even expulsion, would be permissible for Joshua. The headmaster and Professor Keen exchange stunned glances, grappling with the severity of the statement. Meanwhile, the scene shifted back to the forest, where Joshua lay wounded on the ground, grappling with his injuries. As he regained consciousness, he realized Jack Stropes had vanished. Contemplating his encounter, Joshua marveled at the unexpected courage he found within himself to oppose Jack. Reflecting on the potential confrontation, 
He acknowledged Jack as a formidable adversary, perhaps even surpassing a master-level opponent. Suddenly, pain surged through Joshua's body, disrupting his thoughts. Lucia's voice pierced through his discomfort, urging him to cease his lamentations and gather his resolve. She probed Joshua's emotions, questioning whether he sensed personal growth amid the turmoil. Joshua reflects on whether he has experienced growth, noticing that his hands feel larger. Curious, he asks Lucia if this could be attributed to Bronto's growth ability she mentioned earlier. Lucia confirms his suspicion, acknowledging that while unexpected, it appears that the primordial stone's power, including its devouring ability, has accelerated. Assuaging Joshua's concerns, Lucia reassures him that this doesn't mean he will age prematurely. Relieved, Joshua expresses gratitude. Lucia explains that Bronto's growth power stimulates growth optimally based on the user's body, ensuring Joshua's physical development occurs at an appropriate pace. Intrigued by the concept, Joshua queries Lucia further, wondering if such precise growth control is possible. Lucia elucidates that over the course of five years, Bronto's power can facilitate Joshua's bodily development flawlessly. Lucia advises Joshua to be vigilant in maintaining balance within his rapidly growing body. She then broaches a more pressing matter, expressing her concern about Bronto's tendency to consume its owner's lost power, a phenomenon likely linked to Joshua's sudden growth. Joshua inquires about the jewel embedded within Lucia. Lucia confirms that it represents Bronto's final form. She explains the rarity of a divine object like the primordial stone being housed within a human vessel, which typically requires mastery to unleash its power. However, thanks to Lucia's intervention, the curse that once hindered humans from accessing its full potential has been lifted. Lucia reminds Joshua of her pivotal role in this transformation, prompting him to acknowledge his gratitude. As Joshua reflects on the clash between the demigod and divine powers within him, he contemplates the potential consequences of their conflict. Joshua acknowledges Lucia's pivotal role in his transformation and poses a question that has long lingered in his mind. Who is Lucia? In response, Lucia counters with a query of her own, probing Joshua's confidence and potentially learning the truth about her identity. Puzzled by Lucia's cryptic response, Joshua seeks clarification. Lucia challenges Joshua's resolve, questioning whether he possesses the strength to bear the weight of her revelation. Joshua, resolute and unwavering, asserts that his decision hinges on Lucia's forthcoming disclosure. He refuses to blindly trust an enigmatic magical entity with unknown motives. Lucia, taken aback by Joshua's resolve, remarks on the familiar human tendency to repay kindness with suspicion. With a sigh, she agrees to reveal her true nature to Joshua, recognizing his curiosity and determination. Lucia unleashes her aura, boldly declaring herself as the greatest existence in the ultimate being. Joshua, unsettled by Lucia's assertion, decides to leave, expressing regret over ever involving himself with her. However, Lucia halts Joshua's departure, insisting that whether he chooses to use her or not is inconsequential. She reminds him that a contract has been forged between them, binding their fates together regardless of his wishes. Perplexed, Joshua questions Lucia about this supposed contract. Lucia explains that Joshua must have consented to it willingly, as such agreements cannot be formed otherwise. She reveals that the moment Joshua traveled back in time, the contract between them was solidified. The scene transitions to the academy, where Amaru confronts Agars, questioning whether he plans to flee once more. Agars brusquely dismisses Amaru's inquiries, questioning why he has suddenly come to bother him. Undeterred, Amaru warns Agars that if Joshua, despite his ties to the Agnes family, faces expulsion like Agars' own brother, it will be another source of regret. Reminding Joshua that he revealed his identity to save Agars from Circle Araxia, Amaru suggests that Joshua may regret his actions. Agars rebuffs Amaru's assumptions, reminding him of the pain and injustice his brother endured before being driven out of the academy. He chastises Amaru for presuming to understand Joshua's feelings and the overwhelming sense of powerlessness in the face of absolute authority. Momentarily silenced, Amaru then admits to harboring jealousy towards Agars since childhood. Amaru confides in Agars, delving into the complex dynamics within his own family. He shares the struggles he faced with his older brother, who, driven by ambition and the pressure of succession, constantly sought to restrain Amaru's potential. In stark contrast, Agars' brother, Simes, stood out as a beacon of fraternal love, displaying a rare and selfless devotion that transcended mere familial duty. Reflecting on his envy towards Agars for having such an exemplary sibling, 
Amaru emphasizes the importance of protecting the bonds of friendship. He urges Agars to cherish his relationship with Joshua Vaughn Agnes and take on the responsibility of safeguarding it. Offering his support and assistance, Amaru extends a hand of solidarity. Moved by Amaru's heartfelt plea, Agars acknowledges the significance of their friendship and the need to protect it at all costs. With a newfound sense of purpose, he accepts Amaru's offer and pledges to stand by Joshua. Energized by their exchange, Agars departs, his mind buzzing with ideas sparked by Amaru's insights and encouragement. The scene unfolds outdoors, where Count Stin engages Duke Agnes in conversation, expressing his astonishment at Duke Agnes's straightforward proposition regarding Joshua's potential expulsion. Count Sten finds amusement in the vivid reactions of the assembled professors, noting with a chuckle the sheer entertainment provided by Duke Agnes's unexpected declaration. He probes further, inquiring about Duke Agnes's contingency plans in the event that the professors follow through with their expulsion intentions. In response, Duke Agnes unveils a surprising revelation. Joshua has received an imperial decree to join the prestigious Imperial Knight Order. Count Sten's intrigue intensifies upon hearing this news, his mind buzzing with speculation about the Emperor's involvement in such a decision. Duke Agnes questions Count Sten's assertion that Joshua's talent alone is the reason for their conversation. He suspects Count Sten isn't entirely free, suggesting he may have received orders from the Emperor to depart for the Swallow Empire. Despite this, Duke Agnes reveals he won't be leaving immediately due to unfinished business. Count Sten acknowledges his own vested interest in the matter. He explains that he's made sacrifices to uphold his family's honor, disregarding his busy schedule because someone insulted the Stin family's swordsmanship. Duke Agnes feels a pang of embarrassment upon hearing this. Seeing Duke Agnes's discomfort, Count Stin agrees to drop the topic for now. He then brings up recent news from Thran, subtly changing the subject. Duke Agnes confirms hearing about the Swallow Empire's swift actions. Count Sten recounts to Duke Agnes the swift response of the Swallow Empire upon hearing of King Thran's passing. Together with Duke Altsma's army, totaling 200,000 soldiers, they marched to Thran. However, their expectations of an easy victory were shattered when they faced unexpected defeat. Even Duke Altsma himself, the esteemed general, suffered serious injuries in the battle. Duke Agnes expresses confusion at the outcome. Noting that Thran's army consisted of only 50,000 soldiers and lacked a master rank knight capable of challenging Duke Altsma, he struggles to comprehend what went wrong. Count Sten reveals the decisive factor a single man, the newly crowned master knight of Thran, Euravis. Duke Agnes is stunned by this revelation. Count Sten emphasizes that Euravis was the primary reason Thran was able to overcome the might of the Swallow Empire's vast army. Joshua called upon his weapon, Lucia. But to his dismay, the artifact remained dormant. He couldn't help but ponder if Lucia had decided to slumber after imparting only what she wished to convey. Lucia, Joshua's cherished artifact, was no ordinary weapon. She was a demon god armament, a creation of the formidable demon god. This deity, revered as the pinnacle among demon kings and deemed a god by their kind, surpassed all others in raw combat prowess rivaling even the mighty dragon lords. Joshua found himself grappling with the impossibility of explaining such a miraculous occurrence. Suddenly, the tranquil atmosphere shattered as students, including Icarus and Agars, rushed towards him at the academy. Bewildered by the sudden commotion, Joshua listened as Agars informed him of the uproar his presence had caused within the school. Determination gleamed in Agars's eyes as he declared his resolve not to flee any longer. Icarus chimed in, revealing that the students had united with a common purpose, though Joshua remained utterly perplexed by the unfolding events. Joshua was taken aback as Icarus revealed the true reason behind the gathering of students. They had united in opposition to the school's intended punishment of Joshua. Icarus explained that a petition was being prepared, a formidable document staunchly advocating against any punitive measures directed at Joshua. As the weight of the student's solidarity settled upon him, Joshua felt a mixture of astonishment and gratitude. The scene then transitioned to the headmaster's office, where Professor Seffergan confronted the headmaster about his decision to support Joshua's continued presence at the academy. In a tense exchange, Professor Seffergan questioned the headmaster's motives, highlighting the complexities of the situation. Despite Joshua's affiliation with the esteemed Agnes family, Professor Seffergan pointed out that there were three children from the twelve families within the school. With a sense of urgency, 
Professor Seffergan emphasized the gravity of their choices and hinted at personal gain tied to resolving the matter in a particular manner. Professor Seffergan leaned in closer to the headmaster, his tone grave as he unraveled the intricate web of political alliances. Count Villas has pledged his recommendation for your ascension to the role of the next chancellor, he began, his voice carrying the weight of significance. And Count Crombell is throwing his support behind us as well. Confusion etched across the headmaster's features as he sought clarification regarding Count Crombell's unexpected allegiance. Professor Seffergan wasted no time in elucidating the situation, delving into the recent dynamics of the commercial skirmish between the Crombell and Prontier families. The scales have tipped in Crombell's favor, thanks to the mercenary king aligning with them in the war for commercial rights, he explained. As a consequence, Professor Seffergan became aware that Count Prontier had personally dispatched young Lady Cheryl to the Agnes State. Upon considering the matter, the headmaster speculated that young Lady Cheryl had likely sought aid from the Agnes State. Confirming this suspicion, Professor Seffergan endorsed the notion. Henceforth, Professor Seffergan expressed the necessity for the headmaster to monitor the activities of the Agnes family closely. Silence hung heavy in the air as the headmaster grappled with the weight of the revelations. Professor Seffergan's voice resonated with authority as he reassured the headmaster, affirming that he could entrust the resolution of the matter to him. With a hundred formal complaints already lodged, Professor Seffergan exuded confidence in his ability to navigate the storm. Yet, their discussion was abruptly interrupted by the arrival of another professor, bearing urgent news of a student protest gathering outside. Professor Seffergan's initial incredulity morphed into a calculated assessment of the situation. He questioned the feasibility of anyone challenging the authority of the revered Twelve Families, especially considering the majority of students hailed from modest aristocratic backgrounds. Professor Seffergan's conviction in the Academy's justice system was unyielding, firmly believing that expelling Joshua von Agnes would rectify any perceived injustice. However, his certainty was swiftly shattered when the truth emerged. The students weren't rallying against Joshua's punishment, but were demanding accountability from the academic circle Araxia itself. Outside the imposing walls of the academy, Agars and Icarus, joined by a throng of fellow students, stood united in protest, their voices echoing the collective discontent brewing within the academy's halls. Observing the students from the window, Natasha entertains the thought that if she possessed magical abilities, she would have taken charge of all the students below. Meanwhile, Guang turned to the headmaster and Professor Seffergan, seeking answers on how they planned to handle the situation. With confidence, Professor Seffergan assured Guang that he could easily quell the growing unrest among the students. Their discussion was interrupted by the arrival of Professor Keen, accompanied by Joshua. A somber atmosphere settled over the room as Professor Keen delivered grave news. Araxia was on the brink of disbandment, with Professor Seffergan facing significant blame. Frustration etched across his face, Professor Seffergan demanded answers from Professor Keen. What right did he have to discuss disbanding Araxia? In response, Professor Keen recounted a tragic incident where a student's future was ruined due to Araxia's negligence highlighting the consequences of overlooking such matters. Professor Keen proposed a necessary change in the professor's approach moving forward. However, Professor Seffergan challenged him, stating that there was insufficient evidence to warrant such drastic action. In response, Professor Keen asserted himself as a witness to the injustices, citing the case of Siamese, whose future had been unjustly stripped away. Professor Seffergan, feeling the weight of accusation, rebuked Professor Keen for his sudden, moral high ground, reminding him of the times he remained inactive. Joshua interjected with a touch of irony, offering to shoulder the responsibility for his special admission. He vowed to cleanse Araxia's tarnished reputation before his departure. Gawang added fuel to the fire, insinuating that Joshua's status as an illegitimate child would not escape the notice of Duke Agnes, implying repercussions for his actions. Gawang's words pierced the air, his gaze fixed on Joshua as he urged him to consider the honor of his family name. In response, Joshua asserted that the matter transcended the Agnes legacy. With determination radiating from him, he declared his intent to hold all responsible parties to account, his aura intensifying as he listed off Natasha of the Briere Marquis family, 
Gawang of the Crombell Marquis family, and Varen of the Villa's Marquis family. Joshua's stern warning sent shivers down Gawang's spine, the pressure of his aura palpable. In a trembling voice, Gawang questioned whether Joshua truly believed the other families would stand idly by. Meanwhile, Professor Seffergan's incredulity mounted as he questioned the headmaster's passive stance. To his astonishment, the headmaster conceded, acknowledging the validity of Professor Keene's earlier assertions. In the esteemed academy, a place dedicated to enlightenment and knowledge, an unprecedented incident unfolded. As the headmaster arrived late to confront the situation, the weight of responsibility bore down upon him to restore order. Professor Seffergan wasted no time in addressing the headmaster, highlighting the severity of the matter at hand. The headmaster's tardiness could potentially jeopardize his esteemed position due to the gravity of what appeared to be a mere scuffle amongst students. Professor Seffergan questioned whether the headmaster was willing to sacrifice the prestigious chancellor position promised to him by the villa's family. In response, the headmaster contemplated the value of titles and positions, asserting that true greatness lay not in the accolades one held, but in the dedication to excel in whatever role one undertook. However, Gawang interjected, vehemently disagreeing with the headmaster's sentiment. To Gawang, societal status and position were paramount, a belief underscored by the harsh reality that even someone as talented as Joshua could be deemed unfit for inheritance due to his illegitimate birth. The looming influence of familial politics, including the Duke Agnes's reluctance to oppose the Gawang family, further emphasized the significance of status in their world. In a moment of unexpected arrival, Duke Agnes and Count Stin entered the room, causing a ripple of surprise among those present. Duke Agnes, known for his decisive demeanor, wasted no time in addressing the issue of succession. He declared that he was leaving the matter unsettled, deeming it a hassle that could shift at any moment. With a commanding presence, Duke Agnes emphasized the Agnes family's iron rule. Anyone with power had the right to aspire to the top. He stressed that proving one's skills was the ultimate confirmation of one's position. Turning to Gawang, Duke Agnes reminded him of his own acknowledgement of Joshua's superior talent, leaving Gawang momentarily speechless. Duke Agnes then asserted that matters among children should be resolved by children, adhering to the Academy's rules. He posed a pointed question to both Natasha and Gawang, questioning whether they intended to become hostile towards the Agnes family over such a trivial matter. The shock on their faces was palpable. Count Stin stepped forward, offering a different perspective. While he wasn't inclined to support Duke Agnes's statement, he provided Gawang with a piece of advice. Count Stin directed his attention to Gawang, advising him to refrain from actions that could potentially bring trouble to their family. Acknowledging their intelligence, Count Stin expressed confidence that Gawang and the others would comprehend his words. Both Natasha and Gawang, visibly concerned, assured Count Stin that they would heed his advice. With a solemn nod, Count Stin took his leave, cautioning Gawang and Natasha to steer clear of Amaru. Duke Agnes seized the moment, declaring that an agreement had been reached and it was time to attend to their own affairs. Turning to Joshua, he instructed him to accompany them. The scene transitioned to the Swallow Empire, where King Draxia inquired about Duke Altsma's condition to Gander. Gander reported that while Duke Altsma wasn't severely injured physically, he appeared to have suffered significant psychological distress. Contemplating the situation, King Draxia considered the possibility of personally offering consolation to Duke Altsma. Suddenly, Duke Albert, captain of the Imperial Knights of the Swallow Empire, interjected, dismissing Duke Altsma as nothing more than a defeated general. As Duke Albert's words resonated in the hall, other nobles of the Swallow Empire nodded in agreement. Duke Albert turned to King Draxia, explaining how Duke Altsma, a general of the Empire, had engaged in a one-on-one -on -one battle despite the overwhelming advantages the Swallow Empire possessed. Despite superior forces in terms of both quality and quantity, Duke Altsma's defeat shattered the morale of their soldiers, leading to significant losses. Duke Albert emphasized that Duke Altsma must bear the responsibility for this catastrophic failure. King Draxia pondered the situation, recognizing the underlying motives of the nobles in condemning Duke Altsma. He couldn't help but wonder what his brother, Demero, would do in such a predicament. However, he quickly dismissed the thought, 
realizing that as the current leader, the decision ultimately rested with him. Addressing those gathered, King Draxia shifted the blame from solely Duke Altsma, acknowledging the unexpected prowess of the enemy's master that surpassed even Duke Altsma's abilities. It was a sobering reminder that sometimes, even the most meticulous planning could be thwarted by unforeseen circumstances. King Draxia addressed the assembly, attributing the primary cause of the recent loss to the Swallow Territory's failure in gathering adequate information. Rather than assigning blame and punishment, he emphasized the necessity of devising a strategic plan of action. Duke Albert proposed a bold strategy, suggesting the dispatch of additional soldiers and multiple masters to the Thran territory for a decisive strike. He pledged to lead the charge if King Draxia gave the order. However, Gander intervened, deeming Duke Albert's proposal impractical. He pointed out that the Swallow Empire's failed surprise attack had drawn the attention of the entire continent necessitating a more cautious approach. Gander reassured King Draxia, advocating for patience and vigilance rather than rash action. He believed that waiting for the right opportunity would prove more effective in the long run. As Gander's suggestion resonated in the hall, King Daniel nodded in agreement, acknowledging the wisdom in exercising caution. Turning to Gander, King Draxia inquired about Thran's response to the recent events. Gander informed King Draxia that Thran was capitalizing on the situation to sow doubt among other nations regarding diplomacy with the Swallow Empire. By portraying the Swallow Empire as the aggressor who broke the peace treaty, Thran aimed to elevate its status. The mastermind behind this scheme had achieved legendary status as a magic swordsman after defeating Duke Altsma. Suddenly, a soldier burst into the room, his urgency palpable. King Draxia demanded to know the nature of the problem. The soldier relayed the shocking news. The Thran Principality had publicly announced their next king to the entire continent. The nobles of the Swallow Empire were taken aback by this revelation. King Draxia pressed for the identity of Thran's next ruler. The soldier revealed that Euravis, the Knight of Prominence, would succeed Anthony Duval Agrita III as the 17th King of Thran. Moreover, Euravis was set to have wedding with the daughter of the previous king in an upcoming ceremony. The scene transitions to a quiet room, where Duke Agnes addresses Joshua regarding the news of Joshua receiving an order from the emperor. Joshua confirms the information and explains his intention to quietly attend the academy. He apologizes to Duke Agnes for any inconvenience caused. Observing Joshua's demeanor, Duke Agnes notes the lack of enthusiasm in Joshua's expression. Interpreting Joshua's response, Duke Agnes decides that Joshua will comply with the Emperor's will and join the Imperial Knights. Joshua accepts the decision, acknowledging his status as a mere citizen of the Empire without influence. Duke Agnes smiles warmly, advising Joshua to prioritize his health. As Duke Agnes prepares to leave, Duke Agnes reassures Joshua that he understands Joshua's plans. Count Stin comments on the solemnity of the conversation between father and son before expressing his desire to speak with Joshua himself. Count Stin greeted Joshua warmly, remarking on their first meeting. He then questioned if Joshua knew who he was. Joshua confidently identified Count Stin as a proud knight of Avalon, recognizing him as Ari Braun Stin. As Count Stin hears Joshua's words, he acknowledges Joshua's familiarity with his identity and notices Joshua's relaxed demeanor. Joshua, in turn, calmly expresses that their meeting was inevitable, suggesting there's no point in attempting to avoid it. Count Sten admires Joshua's courage before projecting his commanding aura. He urges Joshua to stand by his statements and challenges him to address any doubts directly. Joshua responds by stating that while he doesn't believe the rapier is inferior, he firmly champions the superiority of the spear above all other weapons. Both Count Sten and Duke Agnes were taken aback by Joshua's assertion. Upon hearing Joshua's declaration, Count Sten intensified his aura, attempting to intimidate Joshua. Sensing the formidable presence of a master-ranked knight, Joshua acknowledged the overwhelming power but remained steadfast in his resolve. He summoned his own aura, overpowering Count Stins in a surprising display of strength. Joshua asserted that he didn't concern himself with others' disagreements, as he was determined to prove the superiority of the spear through his actions. Count Stin marveled at Joshua's audacity, perplexed by the ease with which Joshua navigated through his aura. 
Despite being merely 10 years old, Joshua exuded an aura reminiscent of legendary mana users. Count Stin contemplated the satisfaction of witnessing Joshua's future achievements, but resolved to withhold his current frustration. However, before the tension could escalate further, Duke Agnes intervened, urging them to cease their confrontation. Count Stin's demeanor eased, and Duke Agnes addressed Joshua, offering him the option to cease attending the academy if he so desired. Alternatively, if Joshua had resolved to join the Imperial Knight Order, Duke Agnes encouraged him to aim for at least the 3rd Battalion. Joshua accepted Duke Agnes's guidance, affirming his understanding and willingness to comply with his father's wishes. The scene then transitions to the Agnes Duchy, where Chiffon inquires if something is troubling Duchess Vanessa. Vanessa expresses her unease over Babel's sudden summons to the Imperial Palace, confiding in Chiffon about her unexpected concerns. Chiffon, determined to take action, suggests heading to Akadi. Vanessa reacts with surprise, cautioning Chiffon against acting without Duke Agnes's permission. Chiffon expressed concern to Vanessa, highlighting the potential futility of their plans if events unfolded unfavorably. She feared facing the Duke's wrath and emphasized the importance of seeing their plans through rather than waiting idly. Vanessa, mindful of the risks, urged Chiffon to proceed cautiously and ensure her safe return. The scene then shifts to Joshua's residence, where he diligently trained outside. Reflecting on Duke Agnes's directive to rise to the 3rd Battalion, Joshua speculated on the significance of achieving such a rank. He surmised that Duke Agnes intended for him to secure a noble title separate from the one associated with the Agnes Duchy, which was expected to pass to Babel. This implied Duke Agnes's desire for Joshua to establish his own legacy. Suddenly, Joshua sensed a presence nearby and suspected the presence of a spy. Reacting swiftly, he hurled his spear towards the entrance of the house, only to find no immediate threat. Joshua reconsidered his initial assumption, acknowledging the possibility of his heightened sensitivity. As footsteps approached, Zero entered the scene. Expressing admiration, Zero remarked on Joshua's ability to detect their presence, admitting surprise at being discovered this time. Taken aback by Zero's sudden appearance, Joshua inquired about Zero's unexpected visit. Joshua confronted Zero with a furrowed brow, questioning the unexpected arrival without prior notice. Zero, with a somber demeanor, explained there had been an urgent development regarding the topic Joshua had entrusted him to investigate. Joshua inquired about the nature of the issue, prompting Zero to disclose that he would have to depart from Akadi temporarily. This revelation led Zero to anticipate a delay in fulfilling Joshua's request for information, particularly since he was the sole individual capable of delving into the mysteries surrounding the battle god, Draxia Grace. Upon hearing this, Joshua astutely deduced that Zero's destination lay within the Thran Empire. Zero couldn't help but be surprised by Joshua's perceptiveness, marveling at how swiftly Joshua had pieced together the puzzle with only a handful of words. In response, Joshua revealed that Zero's timing couldn't have been more opportune. He confessed his intention to postpone the search for the elusive red coin, originally slated for a three-year endeavor, as circumstances had shifted. Joshua had been summoned by the Emperor to serve in the Imperial Knights, necessitating his relocation. Zero was taken aback by the news of Joshua's imperial summons, struck by the weight of the emperor's decree. In a moment of reflection, Zero realized the magnitude of the tasks looming ahead for both of them. With a calm demeanor, Zero assured Joshua that it was all right, acknowledging the limitations of their influence over Joshua's predicament. Zero pointed out that the Moon's Door organization would devote ample resources to aiding Joshua in procuring the red coin, ensuring his safety for the time being. As Zero handed Joshua the requested intel report, Joshua inquired about its contents. Zero cryptically hinted that the information would exceed even Joshua's expectations. Intrigued, Joshua eagerly pressed for details. Zero divulged that Draxia Velgrace, the formidable battle god, had ties to the Avalon Empire's imperial family, a revelation gleaned from Zero's sources. To Zero's surprise, Joshua remained unfazed by this revelation. Perplexed, Zero questioned Joshua's lack of reaction. Joshua calmly explained that he was already privy to this particular piece of information, leaving Zero momentarily taken aback. Surprised by Joshua's apparent knowledge, 
Zero couldn't help but inquire about how Joshua had come by the information regarding the relationship between the formidable Godraxia and Emperor Marcus. Joshua's expression mirrored Zero's astonishment, but he quickly surmised that Draxia's ties might not be with the fourth Prince Kaiser, as commonly believed, but rather with the current Emperor Marcus Van Britten. Joshua turned to Zero with a probing question, seeking confirmation from the Moon's Door organization regarding the credibility of this revelation. Zero admitted that the information carried significant weight, deeming it highly credible. Speculating further, Zero suggested that Draxia's lineage, particularly her father Dmero Velgrace's ties to the Swallow Empire's imperial family, could explain the legitimacy of the claim. Joshua's thoughts raced, connecting the dots swiftly. It seemed Emperor Marcus was maneuvering to influence affairs in the Swallow Empire, possibly aiming to depose the current Emperor Verona and install Draxia as the new ruler. Draxia's reputation as an undefeated battle god and a nearly peerless swordsman only added weight to the potential power shift. As the conversation unfolded, the scene shifted to Count Stin, situated in the heart of the Swallow Empire's territory, as the soldiers of the Swallow Empire charged towards Count Stin with menacing intent, he moved with fluid grace, swiftly dodging their attacks and retaliating with precise strikes that brought them down one by one. Recognizing the threat, the Swallow soldiers formed a defensive shield formation, enveloping themselves in a shimmering mana barrier that seemed impervious to Count Sten's assaults. Frustrated by the impenetrable barrier, Count Sten prepared to escalate his efforts when Duke Tremblin, one of Avalon's top three swordsmen, soared onto the battlefield. With a powerful slash, Duke Tremblin effortlessly shattered the Swallow Soldier's barrier, clearing the way for Count Sten to press his advantage. As the dust settled and the Swallow Soldiers lay defeated, Count Sten applauded Duke Tremblin's skill, his admiration evident in the rhythmic claps. Duke Tremblin, however, questioned Count Sten's relaxed demeanor in the face of such danger. Reminding Count Sten of their precarious position at the Empire border and the constant threat of enemy territory, Duke Tremblin urged him to take the situation more seriously. Count Sten, unfazed by the admonition, shrugged off Duke Tremblin's concern, dismissing any notion of worry. Count Sten suggests to Duke Tremblin that perhaps if the Emperor's orders were to infiltrate the Swallow Empire's Imperial Palace and remove Emperor Verona from power, it would justify their presence in the battle. However, he observes that their current engagement doesn't necessitate the use of their magical abilities. Duke Tremblin reminds Count Sten of the importance of always giving their best effort as knights. Upon hearing this, Count Sten privately finds Duke Tremblin's adherence to duty boring, despite recognizing his impressive skills. He contrasts Duke Tremblin's seriousness with what he perceives as the more entertaining demeanor of Duke Agnes. Duke Tremblin redirects the conversation, questioning why Count Sten mentioned Emperor Verona Velgrace. He wonders if Count Sten has forgotten the Emperor's cautionary orders. Count Sten, feeling defensive, asks when Duke heard about these orders, stating that he brought up Verona Velgrace because he dislikes the situation. He doesn't understand why Avalon would agree to what he views as Draxia's immature tactics. Count Sten doubts that the Swallow Empire would be susceptible to such a ploy. In response, Duke Tremblin reassures Count Sten that whether the Swallow Empire falls for the ploy or not isn't important. He emphasizes the significance of their own commitment to duty, regardless of external factors. Both Count Sten and Duke Tremblin are bound to obey their Emperor's orders and follow Draxia's plans. Count Sten wastes no time in agreeing with Duke Tremblin's assessment that time is short, urging them to act swiftly. Duke Tremblin, recalling Everglint's caution about Count Sten's unpredictability, understands the gravity of the situation. Meanwhile, at the Avalon Empire's Academy, Joshua contemplates bidding farewell to his fellow students. However, he questions Icarus about his commitment to accompanying him. Icarus reassures Joshua, expressing his desire to serve as Joshua's attendant despite his newfound noble status. Joshua is taken aback by Icarus's dedication, reflecting on the shift in his social standing and Icarus's unwavering loyalty. Icarus assures Joshua that if he's headed to the Imperial Palace, he'll accompany him. Curious, Joshua prompts Icarus to speak honestly, admitting that he senses Icarus doesn't truly want to become his attendant. Joshua questions Icarus about his true intentions. In response, 
Icarus reveals that he desires to stand by Joshua's side and prove his worth directly to him. He recalls Joshua's previous encouragement to disregard his noble lineage and serve Joshua personally. Believing in Joshua's potential to surpass even the esteemed Agnes name, Icarus feels compelled to demonstrate his value. He emphasizes that Joshua can judge him based on his actions. Hearing this, Joshua admires Icarus's integrity and feels reassured by the prospect of having him as a companion. However, with a gentle smile, Joshua declines Icarus's request, appreciating his offer but opting for a different path. In a moment of frustrated reflection, Icarus pondered why Joshua perceived him as having no utility as an attendant. Joshua's stance seemed puzzling to Icarus, for it would not diminish Joshua in any way to have him in such a role. Yet, Icarus hadn't broached the subject seeking reward. Rather, he harbored a deep-seated desire to prove his own merit to Joshua. However, Joshua's response was unexpected. He suggested that if Icarus truly wished to demonstrate his value, he should venture forth independently and enact change within the academy that Joshua had entrusted. Joshua even hinted that Icarus could leverage Joshua's family name if necessary. According to Joshua, remaining within the academy, with its vast reservoirs of knowledge, would be more beneficial to Icarus than serving as Joshua's attendant. Understanding Joshua's perspective, Icarus resolved to prove his worth within the confines of the academy. Meanwhile, in the Swallow Empire, the third princess, Yorona Bell Grace, found herself grappling with familial concerns. She approached her father, King Verona, seeking insight into his contemplations regarding Uncle Demero. Yorona's inquiry prompted a solemn response from King Verona, who entertained the notion of ceding the throne to his brother, Demero. As King Verona mulled over the potential ramifications of his decision, a pang of uncertainty gripped him. He couldn't help but wonder if the people of Swallow would have found greater happiness under the rule of his brother, Demero. Moreover, he speculated that such a shift in leadership might have even fostered better relations between Swallow and Thran. Yorona, sensing her father's inner turmoil, offered her perspective. Though her spiritual insights couldn't foresee every outcome, she adamantly expressed her belief that if Uncle Demero had ascended to the throne, the suffering of Swallow's citizens would have been far greater than it is now. King Verona was taken aback by her assertion. Recalling a poignant memory, Yorona recounted the day she first ventured beyond the palace walls with her father. She vividly recalled the genuine smiles adorning the faces of the Swallow people, their expressions brimming with sincere admiration for King Draxia. She reassured her father that his efforts thus far had been commendable. To her, King Verona was the very son of the Swallow Empire, and she couldn't help but swell with pride for him. Encouraging him to dispel his self-doubt, she emphasized that both she and the people of Swallow yearned to see him restored to his former self. With unwavering support, Yorona urged her father to cease punishing himself, assuring him that brighter days lay ahead under his continued guidance. King Verona expressed his gratitude to Yorona for her comforting words, yet the specter of Demero continued to haunt his thoughts. In moments like these, he couldn't shake the memory of Demero's steadfast reliability. Yorona gently reminded her father that Demero had been absent for over a decade, his whereabouts and even his survival uncertain. To her, it seemed that Demero had long forsaken any concern for the Empire. Suddenly, a soldier burst into the room, bearing urgent news from the border guards. King Verona anxiously inquired about the situation, and the soldier relayed the alarming report. The Thran Principality had launched an attack on the Baker Estate, resulting in the devastating loss of thousands of border guards. Shock reverberated through both King Verona and Yorona at this dire revelation. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to the quarters of Evergrant, the first mage of the Imperial Palace where he engaged in a magical communication with Ian Dunpere, the master of the Magic Tower. Evergrant sought reassurance from Ian that all was well, aside from the logistical challenges posed by Evergrant's sudden departure. Evergrant assured Ian that there hadn't been any notable issues during his absence. However, he conceded that he had no excuses for leaving without prior notice and offered a sincere apology to the Tower Master. Ian, concerned for Evergrant's well-being, inquired about the treatment he received from the emperor. 
Evergrant responded with unwavering contentment, expressing satisfaction beyond measure. Ian nodded in understanding, acknowledging Evergrant's acceptance of the Emperor's proposal. Yet, he voiced skepticism about Evergrant's ability to fulfill his ambitions under the rule of Avalon's Emperor. Ian surmised that Evergrant's support likely rested with the Fourth Prince, whom Evergrant believed to possess the greatest potential. Curiosity peaked, Evergrant questioned Ian about the possibility of delivering a lecture. However, Ian's response was unexpected. He conveyed his belief that Evergrant had erred in supporting the Fourth Prince, expressing doubt regarding the prince's suitability for the throne. Shock washed over Evergrant as Ian elaborated, suggesting that Evergrant reconsider his allegiances. Ian urged Evergrant to contemplate aligning with the first or second prince instead, implying that it wasn't too late to make a different choice. Upon hearing Ian's words, Evergrant's mind drifted back to the moment he first laid eyes on the fourth prince. A strange, inexplicable feeling had stirred within him, a sensation he couldn't quite articulate. Ian, sensing the gravity of the situation, revealed the true purpose behind his call. He disclosed the shocking news of the demise of Jack Therapies, the thunder seat of the Seven Magicians. Evergrant was utterly taken aback, struggling to comprehend how such a formidable figure could meet such a fate. Ian wasted no time in extending an enticing proposition, the offer of the vacant thunder seat to Evergrant. He emphasized that accepting this position would undoubtedly further Evergrant's ambitions far more than aligning with a prince whose future hung in uncertainty. Yet, Evergrant hesitated, unable to immediately accept Ian's proposal. He expressed his gratitude for the offer but explained that he couldn't abandon his commitment to the fourth prince. In response, Ian acknowledged Evergrant's dedication but highlighted the importance of other objectives Evergrant might hold dear. As the conversation unfolded, Ian alluded to the wealth within the Avalon Empire's imperial treasury, suggesting that opportunities beyond mere political alliances awaited Evergrant's consideration. Not the superficial treasury accessible to any Imperial Knight Battalion commander once a year, but the elusive vault harboring the coveted Jade Stones. This was the true treasure Evergrant sought. He pressed Ian on this matter, questioning whether Ian was aware of its existence. Ian nodded knowingly, remarking on the innate curiosity inherent in most mages, a relentless pursuit of truth. He reiterated his offer, assuring Evergrant that a seat would always be reserved for him, contingent upon Evergrant's word. Touched by Ian's unwavering support, Evergrant felt a swell of gratitude. But their conversation took a serious turn as Ian unveiled a request. Eager to hear more, Evergrant leaned in. Ian revealed that the final destination of Jack, the Thunder Seat, was a warp gate leading to Akardi, the capital of the Avalon Empire. He implored Evergrant to undertake an investigation to unearth the identity of Jack's assailant. The scene transitions to the grand halls of the Avalon Empire Palace, where Joshua, determined and resolute, encounters palace soldiers barring his entry. They demand proof of his identity, a pass or a plaque, to grant him access. Undeterred, Joshua calmly informs them of his intention to apply for the Battle of Bircher. The soldiers, taken aback by Joshua's audacity, burst into laughter, questioning if the young kid comprehends the weight of his words. Dismissing him with amusement, they urge him to depart and cease his pestering. However, Joshua's smile remains undimmed as he strides forward, undaunted by their mockery. With a flicker of determination in his eyes, he instructs the soldiers to make their report. Drawing upon the power of his dawn ring, a symbol of his lineage, Joshua commands the knight to announce his arrival in accordance with the decree of the emperor himself. The Battle of Bircher, a coveted privilege within Avalon, offers the chance for citizens or ordinary knights to ascend to the esteemed ranks of the Imperial Knight Order. By besting a current member in combat, one can claim their spot within the order. And for those who rise to the prestigious 1st to 3rd battalions, the highest echelons, the promise of a peerage awaits as a testament to their valor and skill. In this realm of competition, the Imperial Knights challenged in the Battle of Bircher know no mercy. They understand all too well that leaving their challengers alive would only invite further attempts on their position. Adding to the peril, overseeing this ruthless contest are the infamous 11th and 12th Battalions, 
more akin to mercenary bands than noble knights. But for Joshua, the allure of an imperial knight peerage holds little sway. His sights are set higher, on the coveted 10th seat of the esteemed 1st Battalion. There, he plans to ascend to the rank of battalion commander, seizing the opportunity to claim that, from the imperial treasury, the peerage, in Joshua's eyes, is merely a supplementary prize. Arriving at the designated battleground, Joshua is struck by its grandeur, akin to a palace blossoming like a brilliant flower. Reflecting on his journey, he realizes he's merely treading the familiar path carved by his past life, albeit arriving at a destination unforeseen. Joshua's thoughts briefly drift to the possibility of Cerceron still being trapped in this place, but he quickly pushes the notion aside. Now is not the time for such musings. There are matters demanding his attention first. As he prepares to depart, a voice pierces the silence, inquiring if someone is present. The voice introduces itself as Cerceron Van Britten, sparking recognition in Joshua's mind. Recalling his early days as a mercenary in Avalon's imperial palace, Joshua remembers Cerceron's kindness towards him, regardless of his status. Though his feelings towards her weren't romantic or longing, he harbored a deep sense of gratitude towards Cerceron for her kindness. Cerceron, seeking to put a name to the figure before her, prompts Joshua to reveal his identity. Without hesitation, Joshua responds with his full name, Joshua Sanders. Meanwhile, in the Swallow Empire, Duke Albert expresses his concerns to King Verona about the potential ramifications of overlooking a certain incident. He fears that other nations may mock the Swallow Empire, and worries that this could set a dangerous precedent. King Verona addresses Duke Albert, clarifying that he isn't suggesting the matter of the ambush be indefinitely postponed. Instead, he proposes that the Swallow Empire delay taking action until the true identity of the enemy is uncovered. Duke Albert counters, questioning whether the Swallow forces hadn't already confirmed the presence of the Thran crest at the scene of the ambush. Before further debate ensues, Prince Lucifer, husband of Throna Belgrace, the first princess of the Swallow Empire, enters the scene. Displeased with the apparent lack of progress, Lucifer criticizes the assembly for their single-minded focus on warfare. He approaches King Verona and pays his respects before addressing the nobles gathered. Lucifer explains that his urgency in coming to the palace stems from his frustration with nobles who merely occupy seats without contributing meaningfully. Duke Albert queries Lucifer's meaning. Lucifer asked Duke Albert which nation he thought would benefit the most from the situation. Duke Albert promptly answered that it was obviously the Thran Principality. Lucifer levels a pointed remark at Duke Albert, suggesting that the Duke is needlessly occupying his seat. He argues that the Thran Principality is currently preoccupied with internal matters, particularly with Euravis's seizure of the throne and efforts to stabilize their realm. Such circumstances render it highly improbable for Thran to launch a preemptive attack of this nature, risking a fatal misstep. In response, Duke Albert queries who else could have orchestrated the attack on the Swallow Empire if not Thran. King Verona interjects, asserting that the true beneficiaries of inciting conflict between the two nations are all other nations except Thran. With the exception of the Hubalt Empire, embroiled in its own election proceedings, Avalon emerges as the most likely culprit. The scene shifts to the grand halls of Avalon's Caltica Palace, where Jacon delivers news to Emperor Marcus. He reports that Duke Tremblin and Count Stin have successfully completed their mission and will soon return to Akardi. Curious about the situation in Swallow, the Emperor inquires further. Jaken informs him that the Swallow Empire has yet to make any notable moves. It appears that the Swallow Empire is taking a cautious stance for the time being, Jaken remarked, catching Emperor Marcus's attention. The Emperor found this development unexpected, considering the Swallowian's penchant for combat. He speculated that King Verona Belgrace might be behind this unexpected restraint, pondering if Demero Belgrace should have ascended the throne instead. Interrupting his thoughts, Jaken relayed another piece of news to Emperor Marcus. The Emperor leaned forward, curious about this new development. Jaken informed him of the death of Viscount Vigo, who had been overseeing the Lock Fief, a region in which they had sought the Emperor's cooperation. Upon hearing this, Emperor Marcus questioned whether Arden von Agnes had unraveled his plan. Jaken reassured the emperor, stating that based on their investigation, 
it didn't seem like Duke Agnes had caught wind of the emperor's intentions. Duke Agnes had been in Accardi at the time of Viscount Vigo's demise. Furthermore, when the news of Viscount Vigo's death reached the main house at a later date, their response appeared confused and disjointed. Looking at it objectively, there seemed to be no indication that Duke Agnes had deduced the emperor's scheme. Emperor Marcus's expression turned serious as he pressed Jaken further, asking if the identity of the killer had been confirmed. Jaken's admission left Emperor Marcus momentarily stunned, prompting Jaken to apologize for his perceived shortcomings. However, the emperor quickly dismissed the apology, assuring Jaken that even someone as renowned as the Black Wind couldn't be expected to possess information that eluded the Agnes family, especially when the event occurred within their own domain. Regaining his composure, Emperor Marcus resolved to take matters into his own hands. He declared his intention to meet with that person personally, as the matter had been a personal request, and they might possess insights that eluded him. Intrigued by Jaken's next revelation, Emperor Marcus's surprise was palpable. Jaken disclosed that his daughter had enrolled in the Avalon Academy under the alias Anna Beck Stake, but her true identity was Annabelle Grace. The scene transitions to the grandeur of Duke Agnes's mansion, where Kane diligently hones his swordsmanship under the watchful eye of the Duke himself. With a fervent charge, Kane lunges towards Duke Agnes, his every movement fueled by determination. Yet, the seasoned Duke effortlessly parries Kane's assault, remarking that Kane still has much to learn. Undeterred, Kane asserts that his onslaught is far from over. Swiftly altering his tactics, he launches a flurry of strikes from various angles in a seamless sequence. However, Duke Agnes remains unruffled, effortlessly thwarting each blow. With a measured tone, the Duke admonishes Kane, noting that his attacks lack the crucial element of force behind their speed. Amidst their training, the Duke's butler interrupts, delivering news of the young Lord Joshua's unexpected departure for the Imperial Palace. Duke Agnes's composure falters at the revelation, his shock palpable. Seizing the opportunity presented by the Duke's distraction, Kane presses forward, seeking to exploit the momentary lapse. Yet, his intentions are met with a surge of fury from Duke Agnes, fueled by the news of Joshua's departure. In a swift and decisive motion, Duke Agnes unleashes a devastating strike, bringing Kane to his knees with a single blow. As Kane crumbles under the force of the attack, Duke Agnes approaches him with purpose, his expression reflecting a blend of disappointment and determination. Duke Agnes reveals that Joshua, Kane's liege, has caused chaos at the academy before abruptly departing for the Imperial Palace without so much as a word to the Duke. Seeking Kane's insight, Duke Agnes probes for the young swordsman's thoughts on Joshua's actions. Caught off guard, Kane attempts to deflect the gravity of the situation, suggesting that their sparring session is merely a friendly exchange. However, Duke Agnes swiftly dispels any illusions of levity, reminding Kane that this training session was a direct request from Joshua himself. Confounded by his liege's motivations, Kane struggles to comprehend why Joshua would involve Duke Agnes in such matters. Undeterred by Kane's hesitation, Duke Agnes asserts his authority, declaring that if Kane won't approach him, then he'll take matters into his own hands. In a swift and decisive motion, Duke Agnes wields a wooden training stick, swiftly incapacitating Kane with a single, precise strike. As Kane crumples to the ground, the Duke's butler interjects, expressing concern that Kane may not be the appropriate outlet for Duke Agnes's frustration. Acknowledging his butler's wisdom, Duke Agnes redirects his ire towards the true source of his agitation. With a steely resolve, he queries his butler about the members of the twelve families who have suffered at Joshua's hands, indicating his intent to address the situation head-on. With a composed demeanor, the butler informs Duke Agnes that while the reactions from two of the families involved are subdued, the Marquis family of Villas is on the brink of lodging a formal protest. Their heir, the sole successor, has been injured, prompting them to consider sending an official letter of grievance imminently. Turning to Duke Agnes for guidance, the butler seeks his thoughts on the matter. Deliberating carefully, the butler stresses the importance of a measured response from the Agnes family. While the likelihood of the Villas family resorting to outright conflict is minimal, the potential repercussions of ignoring their grievances could prove significant. 
Should the Villas family choose to escalate the matter to the Great Noble Conference, Duke Agnes would find himself in an uncomfortable position, forced to offer explanations for his liege's actions. As Duke Agnes contemplates the implications, the butler muses privately on the potential consequences of such a scenario. For a figure esteemed as one of the nine stars of nobility, the prospect of having to provide excuses for Joshua's behavior would be a profound humiliation indeed. Duke Agnes leans in, his voice carrying a measured tone as he addresses his loyal butler. I don't see any harm in that, he begins, a hint of paternal pride coloring his words. While I may not always be the most attentive father, I see no reason to reprimand my son for his commendable deeds. With a determined nod, Duke Agnes resolves to handle the matter with the Marquis family of Villas personally. Confident in Joshua's ability to handle any residual fallout, he reassures his butler of the Agnes family's capability to manage the situation. Acknowledging his master's decision, the butler assures Duke Agnes of his understanding before delivering a piece of urgent news. Duke Agnes's curiosity piqued, he eagerly inquires about the latest development from the main house. The butler's revelation leaves Duke Agnes momentarily stunned. His Majesty, the Emperor, has expressed a desire to witness the growth of the empire's treasure, Babel. And to Duke Agnes's surprise, Babel is en route to Icardi, escorted by none other than Knight Captain Chiffon. The scene transitions to the interior of a carriage, where Chiffon and Babel sit in quiet conversation. Chiffon, with an air of anticipation, informs Babel that they are nearing their destination. The Imperial Palace lies just ahead. As they journey towards their destination, Babel shares a moment of introspection with Chiffon. It's my first time returning here since my days at the Academy, Babel admits, a tinge of nostalgia in his words. Chiffon offers reassurance, explaining that the Emperor's interest lies solely in observing Babel's growth, a testament to their status as the greatest genius on the continent. Despite the encouraging words, a shadow crosses Babel's expression, betraying a deeper sadness. Sensing Babel's inner turmoil, Chiffon imparts a heartfelt message, reminding them of the unwavering support from countless vassals, including Chiffon himself. Babel's smile, though tinged with melancholy, reflects gratitude for Chiffon's comforting words. However, the mood shifts as Chiffon adopts a more serious demeanor. He poses a hypothetical scenario, probing Babel's thoughts on a sensitive matter. What if Duke Agnes, your father, isn't your biological father? Chiffon's question hangs in the air, catching Babel off guard. Intrigued yet puzzled, Babel seeks clarification. Chiffon reveals that one of his knights has recently discovered a similar truth about their own parentage after decades of ignorance. The revelation casts a weighty shadow over the carriage, prompting Babel to contemplate the implications of such a revelation. In response to Chiffon's revelation, Babel's empathy shines through. It must have been incredibly jarring for that night, Babel acknowledges, genuine concern etched in their voice. They then inquire if there's any way they can assist the knight in navigating this newfound truth. Chiffon hesitates, realizing the complexity of the situation. Internally, he chides himself for inadvertently stirring up such a delicate matter. However, he expresses doubt regarding any specific actions Babel could take to aid the knight. Undeterred, Babel muses aloud, contemplating the potential impact of the revelation on the knight's life. Despite the shock, Babel wonders if fundamentally, the knight's path remains unchanged. They propose that continuing to excel and strive for greatness, as they always have, could serve as a beacon of fulfillment for both the biological father and the one who raised the knight. Impressed by Babel's mature perspective, Chiffon smiles warmly. He acknowledges the wisdom in Babel's words, recognizing the young lord's growth and resilience. As the carriage rolls to a stop, they've arrived at their destination. The grandeur of the imperial palace awaits. The narrative shifts to Joshua, who reveals his full name, Joshua Sanders, to Cerceran. Cerceran's reaction is one of surprise upon hearing Joshua's name. Sensing Cerceran's astonishment, Joshua remarks casually, noting Cerceran's apparent assumption that he hailed from nobility due to the absence of a middle name. In response, Cerceran offers a compliment, remarking on the beauty of Joshua's name. They explain that they came across it in a book, 
describing a rare flower found only in the Trifia district at the eastern edge of the continent, called Sanders. Despite its breathtaking beauty, Circean muses, there lies a poignant sadness in the flower's significance. However, Joshua interrupts, urging Circean to halt their musings. With a somber tone, he redirects the conversation, suggesting that Circean is the one with a tragic fate. Joshua recounts the ruthless ascent to power of Emperor Marcus, known as the Sovereign of Blood, who eliminated any opposition from his own kin, including brothers, cousins, and even distant relatives with the surname Britain. As a consequence, there are no longer any male heirs with the Britain surname, leaving a chilling legacy of bloodshed and power in Emperor Marcus's wake. As the narrative unfolds, it becomes evident that the imperial family has dwindled to a mere handful of individuals, primarily those closest to Emperor Marcus, his trusted allies who cowered in fear. In a desperate attempt to solidify their power, they made a fateful decision, one that history would later condemn as the Avalon Empire's gravest error, the tragedy of Britain. From this dark political maneuvering emerged Princess Circean Van Britain, a pawn in Emperor Marcus's grand scheme to achieve his ambitions. Though born of pure blood, Circean's birth was marred by tragedy. She entered the world blind. Yet, her affliction did not deter the emperor's vigilance. He kept a watchful eye on Circean, for she possessed a unique gift, the mind's eye, an ability to perceive truths even beyond the grasp of those in the master realm. Contemplating the weight of Circean's burden, Joshua ponders whether he, too, could shoulder such a responsibility. But as Circean senses Joshua's inner turmoil, she confronts him, her voice tinged with sorrow. She implores him to reveal the extent of his knowledge about her, prompting a moment of introspection and vulnerability between the two. The tranquility of Circean's chamber is disrupted as her maid, Ellen, enters, concern etched upon her features. Ellen gently inquires about Circean's tears, but Circean brushes off the concern, assuring Ellen that all is well. With a nod, Ellen informs Circean that it's time for them to depart for the palace. As Circean and Ellen prepare to leave, Joshua muses quietly, sensing that their paths will cross again in due time. Though the moment may not be opportune now, he harbors a silent certainty of their eventual reunion. Meanwhile, in the opulent halls of Emperor Marcus's villa, a newcomer introduces herself to the ruler. Anna, daughter of the legendary war god, Draxia Belgrace, stands before the emperor. Marcus wastes no time inquiring about a gift he had sent to Swallow's border, curious if Draxia approved. Anna graciously acknowledges her father's appreciation for the emperor's generosity. However, Marcus's demeanor turns somber as he addresses the complexities of the situation. He hints at unrest within Swallow Empire, suggesting that even Draxia Belgrace may struggle to navigate the challenges ahead. With a cryptic reference to powerful figures on both sides of the conflict, Arden von Agnes in Avalon and Prince Lucifer in Swallow Empire, Marcus implies that Anna's father faces formidable adversaries, including the newly emerged Prince Lucifer. Emperor Marcus's inquiry cuts through the tension like a blade. He demands to know if Anna's father has formulated a plan to navigate the turbulent waters ahead. Anna hesitates, revealing her father's uncertainty. In response, a dark cloud seems to gather around the emperor, his anger palpable. As Marcus's aura intensifies, Anna finds herself overwhelmed, succumbing to the pressure and collapsing to the ground. The emperor's voice is sharp with reproach as he chastises Anna for her father's wavering resolve. He reminds her of the unwavering confidence they had both expressed before, assuring him of the plan's feasibility. Disgust creeps into Marcus's tone as he accuses Anna and her father of betrayal, likening their actions to those of spies within the Avalon Empire. Anna, visibly shaken, offers a heartfelt apology, vowing to ensure such transgressions never occur again. The Emperor's tone softens slightly as he proposes a new arrangement, offering a ducal peerage in lieu of the Marquis peerage previously promised. Anna's surprise is evident, but Marcus assures her that her father, with his experience, understands the perils of uncertainty better than most. With a final admonition about the dangers of doubt, Marcus dismisses Anna, leaving her to contemplate the weight of her father's decisions and the consequences of straying from the path of certainty. Upon hearing Emperor Marcus's proposition, 
Anna's thoughts swirl with suspicion. She contemplates the true intentions behind Marcus's actions, wondering if Avalon's aggression towards Swallow Empire was merely a game for the Emperor's amusement. Doubt gnaws at her as she questions the sincerity of Marcus's offer. Summoning her resolve, Anna addresses the Emperor, acknowledging the extraordinary opportunity presented to her and her father. However, she voices her concern about her father's reaction to such an offer. In response, Marcus exudes confidence, proclaiming his impending dominion over Avalon and dismissing any potential opposition. Assured by Marcus's assurances, Anna relays his message to her father, promising him that Marcus poses no threat. With the plan in disarray, Marcus insists on swift action, urging Anna and her father to devise a new strategy without delay. With a sense of urgency, Anna bids farewell to Marcus and departs, her mind consumed with the weight of her responsibilities. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to a forest where Jaken, accompanied by his subordinate Theta, investigates. Theta notes the anomaly in the soil, prompting Jaken to correct him. It's not dirt. Theta instructs Jaken to trust his instincts and focus on the collision of the winds. With a sense of trepidation, Jaken complies, closing his eyes and allowing his senses to attune to the elements. To his astonishment, he perceives a disturbance, a void in the mana. Theta explains the rarity of such an occurrence, noting that mana voids typically manifest either through supernatural means at the dawn of time or when a mage of class 6 or higher meets their demise, resulting in a catastrophic event within a one-kilometer radius. Realization dawns upon Jaken as he considers the implications. If Thunderseat Jack Sterapis's final destination was Akardi, there is a strong likelihood that he was slain by an individual wielding Bronto, a powerful artifact. With this revelation, they have a lead to follow. The traces of Bronto will lead them to the culprit. The scene transitions to the Imperial Palace, where Cerciran's mind whirls with disbelief at Joshua's apparent omniscience. She turns to her maid, Ellen, seeking answers. Curiosity piqued, Cerciran asks Ellen if she's heard of someone named Joshua Sanders. Ellen nods, confirming that the name rings a bell. Cerciran presses for more information, prompting Ellen to reveal that Joshua's name has been circulating among the knights lately. Rumor has it that he's a rising star within the Avalon Empire. Intrigued, Cerciran questions Ellen further, pondering the significance of being referred to as a little star. Ellen explains that individuals with exceptional talent, like young Lord Babel von Agnes, are often dubbed as such. However, she notes a sense of skepticism among the nobles regarding this matter. Perplexed, Cerciran seeks clarification. Ellen elucidates, explaining that the appearance of two potential little stars within the same family has sparked unease among the nobility. The prospect of such extraordinary talent concentrated within a single lineage has stirred feelings of apprehension and wariness among the elite circles of Avalon. Ellen's revelation sends a jolt through Cerciran as she learns that Joshua's full name is Joshua von Agnes, the second son of Arden von Agnes, a figure revered as the pride of the empire. The unexpected connection leaves Cerciran reeling with surprise. The scene transitions to the bustling drill hall of the Imperial Knights' 11th and 12th Battalions. Joshua's gaze sweeps over the familiar surroundings, noting the unchanged nature of the place. Knights spar with one another in rigorous combat drills, their movements a testament to their skill and discipline. Joshua strides into the hall, drawing puzzled glances from the seasoned soldiers. Bewildered by the presence of a child in their midst, they question how Joshua came to be there. Undeterred, a soldier advises Joshua to leave, deeming the hall an unsuitable playground for a youngster. With a resolve evident in his eyes, Joshua decides to make his presence known. Activating his dawn ring, he conjures the imposing armor of the Agnes Duchy, assuming a commanding presence. Addressing the soldiers, he declares his intent to participate in the Battle of Bircher. The soldiers, taken aback by Joshua's proclamation and the sight of him in the Agnes armor, exchange stunned glances. Joshua issues a challenge, inviting any who dare to face him to step forward. His name echoes through the hall, leaving the soldiers to contemplate the audacity of the young von Agnes's declaration. The soldiers within the hall recognize Joshua as the newfound little star of Avalon, their astonishment palpable. 
They speculate on Joshua's potential, marveling at the notion of a ten-year-old possessing the skill to wield mana, a feat unheard of in the continent's history, a prodigy of unparalleled magnitude. Amidst the murmurs of awe, a soldier steps forward, addressing Joshua with a query regarding the Battle of Bircher. Joshua responds with a calm demeanor, elucidating the rules set forth by Emperor Marcus Van Britten himself. He explains that participants in the Bircher battle have the chance to ascend to the coveted position of Imperial Knight upon victory, regardless of their current rank. Conversely, those who accept the challenge risk losing their esteemed title as an Imperial Knight. Joshua emphasizes the gravity of the situation, asserting that any mishaps or consequences that arise during the battle are the sole responsibility of the involved parties. He underscores the importance of accepting the outcomes, prohibiting any acts of revenge. Failure to adhere to these terms would be deemed treasonous. Upon hearing Joshua's unwavering resolve, the soldiers are taken aback. They question whether Joshua still intends to proceed despite the risks and implications laid out before him. Joshua's voice cuts through the air like a blade as he raises his tone, commanding attention. With authority in his words, he declares his intent to participate in the Battle of Bircher, mandated by the Emperor's decree. He insists that the soldiers of the 11th and 12th battalions must comply with the emperor's orders. Despite Joshua's determination, the knights are hesitant, fearing the consequences should anything befall the young lord. Disdain flickers across Joshua's features as he observes their trepidation. How could these individuals call themselves knights if they lacked the courage to fulfill their duties? Determined to spur them into action, Joshua decides to offer some much-needed motivation. Addressing the assembled knights, he admonishes them for their lack of initiative. He asserts that they are merely nobodies who falter in the face of adversity, paralyzed by fear when confronted by someone of slightly higher rank. His words strike a nerve, igniting a simmering anger among the knights. One knight, named Kutches, steps forward, his resolve evident in his gaze. With a dismissive wave, Kutches admonishes Joshua to cease his meaningless banter deriding him as a privileged child who has everything handed to him on a silver platter due to his fortunate birth into a wealthy household. Drawing his sword, Kutches boldly declares himself as Joshua's opponent for the Battle of Bircher, warning Joshua not to hold the knights accountable should he suffer serious injuries. Joshua's response is one of acceptance, acknowledging Kutches' challenge with a calm demeanor. As Kutches prepares to unleash his full strength, the gathered knights rally behind him, their cheers echoing through the hall. Undeterred by the overwhelming odds, Joshua braces himself for the impending confrontation. Another knight steps forward, attempting to dissuade Joshua from facing Kutches, citing the vast disparity in their ranks. However, Joshua refuses to yield, asserting that his rank is not what it seems. With unwavering resolve, Joshua releases his aura, summoning forth Lucia, a manifestation of his inner power. The sight leaves the assembled knights in awe, stunned by Joshua's unexpected display of strength and determination. Observing the artifact nestled in Joshua's grasp, Kutches couldn't resist remarking that Joshua appeared to be merely a novice, leaning on the legacy of his lineage with little substance to show for himself. Joshua, unfazed, challenged Kutches to put his doubts to the test, daring him to discern whether it was true aura or mere facade. In a moment of revelation, Joshua pointed out Kutch's apprehension, realizing that Kutch's had underestimated him as a mere Sirank knight. Frustrated by Joshua's insight, Kutch's lunged forward, intent on proving his superiority. However, Joshua effortlessly wielded his aura, brandishing Lucia in a swift strike. The onlookers gasped in astonishment as the dust settled, revealing Kutch's unharmed. Yet, their attention shifted to the intervention of Viper Bison, the vice captain of the 12th Battalion, who intercepted Joshua's attack. Undeterred, Joshua reminded Bison of the rules, emphasizing that even as vice captain, he had no authority to halt a Bircher challenge. Bison, impressed by Joshua's knowledge, acknowledged his understanding of protocol. Joshua, intrigued by Bison's reputation as the Crimson Bison within the Imperial Knights, acknowledged his fame. Bison, in turn, expressed his admiration for Joshua, the rising star of the empire. Curious about the regulations concerning the Battle of Bircher, 
Joshua found himself at a loss when Bison brought it up. Bison explained that for the battle to proceed officially, at least one vice captain must be present. Joshua, taken aback, questioned whether Bison intended to call off the battle at this juncture. However, Bison emphasized that the Battle of Bircher was the decree of Emperor Marcus himself, an edict not to be flouted. Hence, Bison declared himself as Joshua's opponent instead. The announcement sent shockwaves through the gathered knights. Kutches intervened, asserting that the duel was meant to be between Joshua and himself. He implored Bison to allow him to face Joshua to the end. Yet, Bison, recognizing Kutch's efforts, insisted he step back, preserving his knightly pride. Reluctantly, Kutch's acquiesced, pleading with Bison to let him retain his dignity as a knight. Throughout his tenure, Bison had always instilled in his knights the importance of maintaining the bare minimum pride of a knight, even in the face of unreasonable circumstances. Now, Faced with the gravity of the situation, Bison implored Kutches to prioritize what truly mattered. Calmly, Bison reminded Kutches that there was something greater at stake than mere pride. Kutches' position as a knight hung in the balance. He emphasized the responsibility Kutches held for his daughter's well-being. Should he lose in the Battle of Bircher? Bison challenged Kutches, questioning whether his pride as a knight outweighed his duty to his family. Kutches found himself at a loss for words confronted with the weight of Bison's argument. Sensing the tension, Joshua began to applaud Bison's selflessness, acknowledging his sacrifice to protect a fellow knight. Bison turned to Joshua, noting his confidence. Joshua boldly affirmed his belief in his own victory, pointing out the gap in skill between them. The evidence of Joshua's prowess became evident as a crack appeared on Bison's blade from blocking Joshua's attack. One of the knights couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to young Lord Joshua's mana than met the eye. He sensed a power beyond the strike Joshua had displayed earlier, something formidable lurking beneath the surface. Moved by Bison's sacrifice, the other knights offered to take his place as Joshua's opponent. However, Bison graciously declined, affirming that he alone was capable of this task. He explained that he never viewed the knights of the 12th Battalion as mere subordinates. To him, they were brothers and comrades. For Bison, protecting his comrades was paramount, far outweighing any titles or status. Joshua couldn't help but admire Bison's unwavering resolve. In his previous life, Bison had always stood by Joshua's side at the vanguard, clearing obstacles with steadfast determination. To Joshua, Bison was not just a superior officer, but also a dependable ally whom his subordinates could trust implicitly. One of the driving forces behind Joshua's decision to enlist in the Imperial Knights was his longing to once again stride across the battlefield alongside Bison. As they faced off, Bison reminded Joshua of the significance of his victory extending beyond mere promotion to vice-captain. He emphasized the importance of Joshua's skills being recognized not just by their battalion, but also by the prestigious chivalric orders of higher echelons. Joshua, however, challenged Bison's perspective, pointing out the discrimination they faced due to their battalion's pride. Bison was taken aback by Joshua's bold assertion. Undeterred, Joshua declared his ambitious vision. Within five years, he vowed to elevate the 11th and 12th battalions to the pinnacle of strength within the Avalon Empire. With a surge of aura, Joshua demonstrated his determination, shocking Bison with the power of his aura blade. Turning to Bison, Joshua posed a question. Would Bison stand with him? Meanwhile, the scene shifted to the throne room, where Babel greeted Emperor Marcus. Emperor Marcus turned his attention to Babel, inquiring about the young knight's age. With a hint of pride, Babel replied that he would turn 15 this year. The emperor's gaze softened as he reflected on Babel's remarkable progress. Emperor Marcus recounted how even Arden, Babel's illustrious father and the greatest knight in Avalon's history, hadn't achieved the rank of C at the tender age of 15. Yet, here stood Babel, on the cusp of b rank status, a feat unprecedented in history. However, the emperor acknowledged that this accomplishment might have eluded Babel were it not for Joshua's influence. Babel was stunned by this revelation, his thoughts racing as he processed the weight of the emperor's words. Marcus continued, expressing his concern that Babel, as Avalon's treasure, must always surpass expectations. Just then, 
Jacon entered the chamber bearing an elixir. Emperor Marcus announced it as a gift for Babel, an elixir designed to augment his mana reserves. With a mixture of apprehension and curiosity, Babel hesitated, uncertain about the implications of consuming such a potion. Emperor Marcus's tone grew somber as he issued a command for Babel to drink the elixir. Feeling the weight of the emperor's authority, Babel accepted the vial and, with a sense of resolve, consumed its contents. As Babel consumed the elixir, a sudden weakness overtook him, causing him to collapse to the ground. Emperor Marcus swiftly approached. He reminded Babel of their shared history, acknowledging that Babel's memories had been wiped, but assuring him of their numerous encounters. The emperor emphasized the importance of Babel's promise, now ripe for fulfillment, and stressed that Babel must never cede his position of succession to Joshua, no matter the cost. Addressing Babel by his full name, Marcus declared him as his son, Babel Van Britten. With a sense of duty and reverence, Babel responded, affirming his allegiance to Emperor Marcus. The scene then transitioned to five years later, where Joshua had ascended to the role of commander over the 11th and 12th battalions. As Joshua journeyed across the tranquil expanse of the Igrant continent, an illusion of peace enveloped the land. Yet, beneath this veneer of tranquility, insidious conspiracies began to take root and flourish. The Igrant continent was home to three mighty empires, revered as the continent's superpowers. Among them stood the Avalon Empire, ruled by Emperor Marcus Van Britten, a figure whose ambitions were shrouded in secrecy. In the shadows, Marcus clandestinely allied himself with Draxia Belgrace, a formidable knight of the Swallow Empire, another of the continent's superpowers. Together, they orchestrated schemes to stoke tensions between the subordinate nations of Swallow and the Thran Principality, their ultimate goal being to incite conflict and ignite the flames of war. However, their machinations did not go unnoticed. Emperor Verona, astute and vigilant, uncovered their treacherous plot. With resolute determination, he thwarted not only the impending war with Thran, but also prevented Avalon from seizing the opportunity to plunge the entire continent into chaos. Yet, as Verona strove to maintain the delicate balance of peace, dissent began to brew among those who opposed his policies. Swallow became a hotbed of unrest, where murmurs of rebellion echoed through the streets. Meanwhile, within the Holy Kingdom of Hubalt, the third superpower of the Igrant continent, Amidst the swirling currents of political intrigue, a fierce power struggle unfolded between the emperor and the Vatican, each vying to secure their candidate for the coveted position of emperor. But as the present moment unfurls, Joshua gathers his knights, expressing a hope that they have not arrived too late. Today marks the grand celebration of the first prince of the Avalon Empire's birthday, a banquet filled with pomp and ceremony. Meanwhile, atop the palace roof, an enigmatic figure cloaked in an elfin guise gazes down upon the festivities, a mask veiling her features from prying eyes. Elsewhere, within a carriage en route to the palace, Count Cox imparts words of encouragement to Cheryl, urging her to exude confidence and demonstrate the enduring strength of the Pontier Duke family. Cheryl reassures him, adamant that she will not yield to the pressures of the Cromwell family, not even amidst the splendor of the banquet hall. As Cheryl approached the entrance of the Grand Banquet, her path intersected with Natasha and Gawong, who stood poised before the palace gates. Cheryl's companions voiced their concerns about her carefree demeanor amidst the Pontier family's precarious situation. Natasha questions whether Cheryl even received an invitation from the palace. Observing their interactions, Count Cox muses on Cheryl's stoicism, pondering whether beneath her composed exterior, a tempest of emotions rages. As they neared the palace, Count Cox observed Cheryl's composure with a mixture of concern and admiration. He knew she couldn't afford to lose control of her emotions, especially not here. To everyone's surprise, Cheryl broke the tension by warmly greeting Gawong and Natasha, acknowledging them as the esteemed children of the Marquis family. She inquired after their well-being as Cheryl stepped away from Gawong and Natasha. Gawong's voice carried to the Imperial Knight. If memory serves me right, Go Wong began. My father entrusted you with the special duty of safeguarding the palace tonight. Upon hearing this, the knight turned to Cheryl and requested verification of her identity or an invitation letter. Cheryl's frustration simmered, 
as she absorbed the request. Count Cox's patience wore thin as he intervened, scolding the knight for disrespecting Lady Cheryl, a member of one of Avalon's esteemed five duke families. He ordered the knight to step back immediately. Gawang's pointed remark about the Pontier family's precarious position ignited Cheryl's anger, and she prepared to confront him. In that pivotal moment, Joshua strode forward, confronting the knight who dared to obstruct the path of the Pontier family, officially invited guests of the prince. With unwavering authority, Joshua commanded the knights to return to their posts, assuring them that he would handle the situation. However, the knights hesitated, citing Lord Gawang's instructions. Undeterred, Joshua's gaze hardened as he made it clear that he would not issue the command again. Shocked by Joshua's resolve, the knights reluctantly retreated, leaving the path clear. Observing his knights' departure, Gawang called them back, but it was too late. Joshua turned to Cheryl, offering to escort her personally to the palace, determined to uphold her honor and dignity. Gawang, sensing a shift in the dynamics, warned Cheryl about the potential consequences of involving the Agnes family and doubted her ability to overcome the Cromwell family's formidable mercenary king. He even suggested that Joshua, abandoned by his own duke family, was now insignificant. However, Joshua and Cheryl paid Gawang's words no heed, continuing on their path towards the palace, undeterred by his threats. Frustrated and fueled by a desire for retribution, Gawang vowed to bring Joshua down. Cheryl, taken aback by Joshua's transformation, confessed that she hadn't recognized him at first glance, marveling at how much he had grown. Joshua, with a hint of melancholy, acknowledged that his journey had been a lengthy one. Though he had escorted Cheryl thus far, he felt it was time for her to find her own way from this point onward. As Joshua departed, Cheryl couldn't help but feel a pang of disappointment at his seemingly cold demeanor. Nevertheless, she gathered her resolve and extended an invitation for him to dance at the ball. Regrettably, Joshua declined, explaining that his duty to guard the castle precluded such indulgences. He also revealed his new affiliation with the Sanders Baron family, severing ties with the Agnes Duke family. Outside, Joshua contemplated Cheryl's predicament. The looming threat of the mercenary King Barbarian, allied with the Cromwell faction, endangered the Pontier estate. Despite the urgency of the situation, Joshua understood that now was not the time for him to intervene. There were other matters demanding his attention before he could confront such formidable adversaries. Joshua's mind buzzed with the urgency of the impending events, knowing he had to address them before anything else. Alone, he called out into the silent night, a challenge to whatever hidden dangers lurked in the shadows. In response, the masked elf emerged suddenly launching herself at Joshua with ferocious intent. However, Joshua effortlessly deflected her attack, causing her to recoil. Intrigued, the elf questioned how Joshua had detected her presence. Joshua revealed her identity as Alicia Sestrophy, admonishing her foolish attempt to assassinate the first prince. Shocked by his knowledge, Alicia demanded to know how Joshua had learned her name, a secret she had shared with no human. She pressed him further, seeking his true identity. Joshua assessed Alicia's demeanor, realizing she wouldn't be easily swayed. With a deep breath, he unleashed his dragon aura, a manifestation of his true power. Alicia, awestruck by the sight, recognized it as the legendary dragon fear. Suddenly, she shifted her stance, bowing before him. In a tone tinged with reverence, she addressed Joshua as the master of the great mana. Alicia's voice trembled as she confessed that the notion of Joshua being the Black Master hadn't even crossed her mind. She beseeched Joshua for forgiveness, addressing him as Lord Black Dragon. Joshua's expression softened, though he couldn't ignore the gravity of Alicia's actions. Acknowledging her mistake, Joshua expressed his desire to reprimand Alicia for her two attempts on his life. Yet, he ultimately chose to extend his forgiveness recognizing that she had acted in ignorance of his true identity. However, he reiterated his earlier command for her to cease her attempts to assassinate the first prince. Alicia acquiesced to Joshua's directive, submitting to his authority. However, Joshua's next words carried a sense of urgency and warning. He informed Alicia that once news of her failed assassination spread, the Black Wind would begin tracking her. 
Concerned for her safety, Joshua advised Alicia to leave Acardi immediately. Alicia, however, reassured Joshua, claiming that his concern was unnecessary. But Joshua's patience wore thin as he demanded obedience. He admonished Alicia for defying his order and insisted that she depart from Acardi without delay, lest she face dire consequences. As Alicia departed, Joshua's expression shifted to a smile tinged with amusement. He couldn't help but marvel at her predictable recklessness, a trait that seemed to endure despite the passage of time. It amused him that she had believed him to be the Black Dragon, unaware of her own impending destiny as the future Assassin Queen. Alicia had undertaken a dangerous mission to assassinate the First Prince during his birthday banquet, only to fail and be scarred irreparably. Joshua pondered the identity of the individual who had assigned her this task, unwilling to tarnish her illustrious career with a stain of failure. Despite their recent encounter, Joshua harbored no ill will towards Alicia. He owed her a debt of gratitude for the assistance she had provided him before his regression. As she vanished into the night, Joshua felt a sense of certainty that their paths would cross again someday. As Alicia raced through the shadows, her mind churned with disbelief at the revelation that Joshua was the true Black Dragon. She speculated that whoever had assigned her the mission couldn't have anticipated such a variable, especially the presence of the Master of Mana in the Avalon Empire. This unexpected turn of events, she realized, worked in her favor, though she would undoubtedly be pursued for a time. Alicia found solace in the fleeting sense of freedom it afforded her. Back at the palace, the nobles mingled and conversed amongst themselves. Some caught sight of Cheryl and couldn't help but wonder why a member of the Pontier family, rumored to be in financial straits, was in attendance. Rumors circulated about the exorbitant cost of rebuilding the Pontier estate, particularly due to their territorial dispute with the Cromwell Marquis family. Cheryl's spirits sank as she overheard their whispers, feeling the weight of their scrutiny. Suddenly, the atmosphere shifted as the first prince of the Great Empire, Kisser Van Britten, and Princess Cerceren Van Britten made their grand entrance, commanding the attention of all present. As Kisser Van Britten and Princess Cerceren made their grand entrance into the party, Kisser extended his gratitude to all the attendees for joining in the celebration. The noble women, enamored by the presence of the first prince, vied for the opportunity to be his partner for the evening. Meanwhile, a maid approached Cerceren, informing her that Joshua Sander was not on the guest list once again this year. Cerceren's thoughts drifted to Joshua, realizing it had been five long years since they last spoke. She couldn't help but wonder where he was now. Concerned, Kisser noticed Cerceren's preoccupied expression and inquired if she was feeling well. Cerceren assured him that she was fine, concealing her inner turmoil. Kisser, however, sensed her unease recalling that it had been quite some time since Cerceren had ventured beyond the confines of the brilliant Flower Palace. Spotting Cheryl Pontier standing alone, Kisser made his way over to her, expressing his delight at seeing her there. Cheryl, respectful as always, greeted Kisser with a formal address. Kisser, though appreciative, urged Cheryl to relax, admitting that he could never quite get accustomed to such formalities from her. Kisser's words carried a somber note as he addressed Cheryl, acknowledging the unfortunate circumstances surrounding the Pontier family. Despite the challenges she faced, Kisser expressed his desire to see Cheryl, his invitation to dance catching everyone off guard. Murmurs of disapproval rippled through the crowd as they questioned Cheryl's suitability as a dance partner for the esteemed First Prince. Internally, Cheryl wrestled with the implications of accepting Kisser's offer. She knew that taking his hand would invite envy and suspicion from the other nobles, potentially exacerbating the already delicate situation with the Crombell family. With a heavy heart, Cheryl declined Kisser's invitation, apologizing for her inability to join him on the dance floor. Undeterred, Kisser pressed Cheryl for an explanation, prompting her to reveal the reasons behind her refusal. However, before Cheryl could respond, Joshua intervened announcing himself as Baron Joshua Sanders. Kisser, intrigued by the newcomer's sudden appearance, sought to learn more about him. Cerceren was taken aback by the mention of Joshua's name, her mind racing with the knowledge that he was one of the rising stars of the empire. 
The revelation sent shockwaves through the room as everyone processed the presence of the renowned figure who had single-handedly transformed the Imperial Battalion in a mere five years. Joshua's reputation as a prodigious knight, consistently claiming the Empire's youngest titles, preceded him. Speculation swirled among the attendees, with many assuming that Cheryl had sought out Joshua for a favor. Kisser, recognizing Joshua's significance, extended his respect to the esteemed figure. In turn, Joshua reciprocated the gesture, expressing his own honor at meeting the first prince in person. However, Joshua informed Kisser that Cheryl and he had prior arrangements, politely requesting the prince's understanding. Surprised by this revelation, Kisser turned to Cheryl for confirmation, who affirmed that indeed, she and Baron Joshua had plans together. Before further discussion could ensue, Gawang interjected, accusing Baron Joshua of arrogance. Kisser inquired about Gawang's meaning, prompting Gawang to apologize for his interruption, acknowledging Kisser as the focal point of the evening. Before Gawang could continue, Joshua intervened, asserting that Gawang should recognize his place if he understood true discourtesy. The other noblewomen echoed Joshua's sentiment, affirming that Cheryl's dance partner had already been decided. Joshua advised Gawang to avoid further embarrassment by dropping the matter. Kisser reassured Gawang that he was not offended, emphasizing that the ball was meant for everyone's enjoyment. Joshua then apologized to Kisser for his own discourtesy, recognizing the importance of Kisser's intentions in selecting Cheryl as his partner. Kisser turned to Cheryl, acknowledging that his actions nearly caused discourtesy to both her and Joshua. Despite the circumstances, Kisser accepted Cheryl's existing arrangement and requested the opportunity to dance with her at a future ball. Cheryl graciously accepted Kisser's invitation, bidding him farewell as he departed. Turning to Joshua, Cheryl expressed her gratitude for his assistance, her hand slipping comfortably into his. She couldn't help but wonder why Joshua had intervened on her behalf, knowing it could potentially lead to trouble for him as well. Joshua offered a simple explanation, suggesting that perhaps it was a lingering sense of guilt for forgetting a promise made five years ago. Cheryl, taken aback by this revelation, confessed that she had believed Joshua had long forgotten about that promise. She recalled how significant it was for a noble lady to entrust someone with a symbol of her family, pondering why Joshua had never visited her since. With a heavy heart, Joshua explained that he couldn't offer Cheryl the help she sought at the moment, still bound by his obligations as a member of the Imperial Knights. Cheryl, understanding, simply expressed her curiosity about Joshua's rapid growth before they began to dance. Meanwhile, outside the palace, Cain, appearing drastically different from his former self, approached Joshua. However, a knight intercepted him, denying him entry. As the dance concluded, murmurs of admiration filled the room, with attendees praising Joshua and Cheryl's graceful performance. Natasha and Gawang, however, simmered with frustration at the sight. Expressing her gratitude, Cheryl bid farewell to Joshua before departing with a contented smile. Observing her departure, Joshua couldn't help but remark on Cheryl's characteristic impatience. Approaching Joshua, Cerceron inquired if he was the same Joshua Sander she had encountered across the wall five years prior. Joshua confirmed silently through telepathy, promising to visit the brilliant Flower Palace soon. He reassured Cerceron that the medicine to cure her illness was nearing completion. As Joshua prepared to leave, Cerceron attempted to stop him, but he departed nonetheless. Telepathically, Joshua explained to Cerceron that repaying a bond from a past life was his motive. Shocked by his revelation, the scene shifted to the Avalon Academy, where students eagerly awaited the arrival of their boss. As Icarus from the Harvest Baron family arrived, they lined up in anticipation, ready to greet him. Amidst congratulatory cheers, Icarus was hailed for his early graduation from the Academy. However, Icarus humbly expressed his discomfort with such attention, prompting one student to remind him of the profound changes he had brought to the Avalon Academy. Curious about his future plans, another student asked Icarus where he intended to go next. With a determined resolve, Icarus revealed that he had long ago decided to seek out Joshua. Meanwhile, in the battalion's office, knights barred Kane from entering, citing the prohibition against outsiders. Spotting Kane, Joshua welcomed his presence, 
expressing gratitude for Cain's initiative in seeking him out. Frustrated and angry, Cain confronted Joshua, questioning why Joshua was enjoying the comforts of the imperial palace while Cain had suffered under Duke Agnes's control, relentlessly training until his hands gave out, all in service to Joshua. Joshua offered a heartfelt apology to Cain, acknowledging the hardships Cain had endured. Overwhelmed with emotion, Cain broke down in tears, expressing his gratitude for Joshua's understanding. Joshua then inquired about Cain's arrival, suggesting that Cain must have reached a significant milestone. With unwavering confidence, Cain affirmed his strength, asserting that he wouldn't lose to anyone but Joshua. Witnessing Cain's transformation over the past five years left Joshua pondering the events that had led to this change. Their conversation was interrupted by a knight's entrance, bearing news of a special guest waiting outside the palace. Joshua was taken aback by the revelation, and as he stepped outside, he was met with the unexpected sight of Icarus. Both Joshua and Cain were surprised by his presence. Approaching Icarus, Cain expressed admiration for his achievements, noting Icarus's remarkable academic record and strategic prowess. Cain then introduced himself as Joshua's first knight, underscoring the significance of their bond. Icarus's confusion was evident as he beheld Cain's unexpected presence. Sensing the tension, Joshua swiftly intervened, urging Cain to refrain from causing any trouble. Addressing Joshua, Icarus reminisced about their past encounters, recalling the promise they had made to each other during their time at the academy. He reminded Joshua of his own commitment to prove himself worthy, a promise Icarus claimed to have fulfilled. Now, it was Joshua's turn to uphold his end of the bargain. With a hopeful gaze, Icarus asked Joshua if he would accept him. Joshua, touched by Icarus's dedication, revealed that he had intended to seek out Icarus himself if Icarus hadn't come. He acknowledged the void left by the absence of a strategist and affirmed that Icarus was the perfect candidate to fill that role. Their agreement was sealed with a fist bump, joined by Cain, who expressed his readiness to entrust himself to the newly appointed grand strategist. Icarus welcomed the title with a smile, while Joshua proposed that they discuss their future plans. He outlined his intentions to meet with the king and then travel to Reinhardt before revealing his decision to send both Icarus and Cain to aid the Pontier family. The unexpected announcement left Cain and Icarus stunned. The scene transitions to the grandeur of the imperial palace of the Avalon Empire, where a gathering of nobles surrounds Emperor Marcus. With a solemn countenance, Marcus addresses the assembly, expressing his profound dismay at the absence of volunteers for the prestigious master battle in Avalon. He laments the potential mockery that would befall their revered empire, renowned for its chivalry and martial prowess, should they fail to uphold their reputation. Emperor Marcus, driven by unwavering determination, asserts that Avalon must maintain its preeminence as the paramount nation on the continent. Turning to Duke Arden Agnes, he seeks counsel on the matter, questioning the ramifications of forsaking the opportunity to showcase Avalon's supremacy in the upcoming battle hosted in Rian Hearth. Duke Agnes, rendered speechless by the weight of the emperor's words, struggles to formulate a response. In that pivotal moment, Joshua strides into the chamber, declaring his intent to partake in the master battle. Emperor Marcus, his expression tinged with a mix of surprise and satisfaction, remarks upon Joshua's timely arrival, acknowledging his resolve. Amidst the dignified assembly of the imperial knights, a figure strides forward, the very emblem of their pride, Battalion Commander Joshua. With a respectful nod, Joshua offers his greetings to Emperor Marcus, whose puzzled expression prompts Joshua to clarify his intent. He will indeed participate in the upcoming master battle. Emperor Marcus, with a mixture of astonishment and skepticism, cautions Joshua about the gravity of the tournament held in Reinhardt. Curiosity piqued, Marcus inquires about Joshua's age this year, to which Joshua, with unwavering confidence, reveals that he is a mere 15 years old. A smirk tugs at Marcus's lips, contemplating the audacity of a 15-year-old aspiring to enter such a prestigious contest. Acknowledging Joshua's unconventional nature, Emperor Marcus challenges him to demonstrate his worthiness before the gathered nobles. Undeterred, Joshua, with a hint of resolve in his voice, sets forth a condition before accepting the emperor's challenge. 
A collective gasp ripples through the gathered nobles at Joshua's bold declaration. With unwavering determination, Joshua asserts to Emperor Marcus that he will only participate in the master battle if the emperor agrees to his conditions. The unexpected turn of events leaves Marcus visibly taken aback. Before the tension can escalate further, a noble steps forward, accusing Joshua of disrespect towards the emperor. However, Emperor Marcus interrupts sharply, commanding the nobles to cease their admonishments. The room falls silent, apprehension palpable among the gathered assembly. Emperor Marcus, his expression a mix of curiosity and concern, addresses Joshua directly, offering to fulfill any request except for Joshua's departure from the Imperial Knights. Yet, Joshua remains silent, prompting Marcus to express his suspicion that Joshua intends to leave the knighthood. Asserting his authority, Marcus insists that Joshua must remain under his watchful eye. In response, Joshua calmly reminds Emperor Marcus that those who entered the ranks through the Battle of Bircher are entitled to leave at their discretion. Enraged by Joshua's words, Marcus dismisses them as nonsense, his temper flaring in frustration. Undaunted by Emperor Marcus's imposing presence, Joshua remains steadfast in the face of pressure. Observing Joshua's composure, Emperor Marcus decides to impose his own condition. When questioned about it, Marcus abruptly draws his aura sword and launches a ferocious attack towards Joshua, causing a thunderous explosion within the chamber. The startled nobles struggle to comprehend the sudden turn of events. To their amazement, Joshua swiftly counters the assault using his artifact, Lucia, effectively deflecting the emperor's strike. Witnessing Joshua's prowess, Emperor Marcus can't contain his amusement, breaking into laughter. Turning to Duke Arden Agnes, Marcus confesses a rare sentiment of jealousy, admitting that he had never envied Arden before. However, for the first time, he finds himself envious of Joshua's remarkable skill. Emperor Marcus elucidates that his intention was to test Joshua's mastery of the Aura Blade, but he never anticipated that Joshua had already attained the level of the Mind Sword. This advanced stage allows a knight to manipulate their sword purely through the power of their mind, a feat beyond the reach of most A-rank knights. With this revelation, it becomes evident that Joshua has ascended to the realm of a master. Emperor Marcus grants Joshua permission to participate in the master battle, promising to heed Joshua's request upon his return with satisfactory results. Joshua vows to exceed the emperor's expectations, setting the stage for his journey. The scene transitions to the Pontier Palace, where Cheryl sits in her office, engrossed in her duties. A knock interrupts her concentration, and Count Cox announces a guest's arrival. Icarus and Kane enter, offering greetings to Lady Cheryl. Grateful for their visit, Cheryl expresses her appreciation for their journey. Icarus introduces himself as a member of the Harvest Estate, akin to Pontier in the southern regions. Cheryl, taken aback by the presence of the renowned intellect, inquires about his unexpected visit. She feels honored, having long desired to meet Icarus in person. Cheryl's attention then shifts to Kane's armor, adorned with the crest of the Agnes Duchy, prompting further intrigue. Cheryl directs her attention to Kane, questioning whether Duke Agnes dispatched him to aid the Pontier family. Kane clarifies that this isn't the case. Both he and Icarus have arrived to assist Cheryl on behalf of Baron Joshua Sanders. Cheryl is taken aback by this revelation, her astonishment evident. The scene shifts back to the Imperial Palace, where Joshua stands outside. Joshua considered himself satisfied with the discreetness of his departure from the Imperial Palace, confident it would avoid raising any undue suspicion. Yet, to his astonishment, Duke Agnes intercepted him. With a stern countenance, the Duke reminded Joshua that he had not visited Agnes Duchy for half a decade. Moreover, today Joshua attempted to leave without so much as a word to the Duke. Duke Agnes then inquired of Joshua whether he harbored any resentment towards him for selecting Babel as the successor instead of Joshua. Admitting to his feelings, Joshua acknowledges his initial resentment but clarifies that it wasn't directed at the succession matter. Rather, he understands the wisdom in Duke Agnes's decision, recognizing his own actions as unsuitable for inheriting the Agnes family name. Joshua insists that he doesn't hold a grudge for such a decision. However, Joshua candidly expresses his hurt at Duke Agnes's treatment of both him and his mother. 
feeling as though they were disregarded and forgotten. Despite Duke Agnes's considerable power, Joshua assures him that he no longer harbors any resentment. He explains that seeing his mother regain her brightness has softened his feelings, prompting Joshua to express his heartfelt gratitude for the Duke's teachings and care. Joshua also extends his thanks in advance for their future interactions. Duke Agnes reciprocates Joshua's sentiments, expressing that he should be the one thanking Joshua. As the Knights of the 11th and 12th Battalions rush to Joshua upon hearing the news of his departure from the Imperial Knights, Duke Agnes takes his leave. Bison approaches Joshua, questioning why he intends to leave without informing anyone and suggesting that it seems like Joshua is abandoning his subordinates. Joshua clarifies, explaining that Bison misunderstands the situation, as he never considered the knights of the 11th and 12th battalions to be his subordinates. The knights are taken aback by Joshua's revelation, but he quickly reassures them, affirming their significance as his cherished comrades. With a sense of relief washing over them, the knights find solace in Joshua's words. Joshua then explains that his departure from the Imperial Knights is due to a personal matter. He instructs the knights to return and assures them that he will reunite with them soon. Bison, having observed Joshua closely over the past five years, expresses his certainty that Joshua has a valid reason for leaving, one that may involve risks even for the knights of the 11th and 12th battalions. Recognizing Joshua's sacrifice, Bison expresses his gratitude. In a display of unity and respect, all the knights stand in formation and raise their swords in salute to their esteemed external commander, Baron Joshua Sanders. Touched by their gesture, Joshua smiles warmly before bidding them farewell. Joshua reflects on his accomplishments within the Imperial Palace, acknowledging that he has achieved nearly all his objectives except for one crucial aspect, becoming a battalion commander of the Imperial Knights. Despite this, he managed to reclaim the Obsidian Earring, a cherished relic from his past life, during his annual visit to the secret storage accessible to battalion commanders. Moreover, he successfully secured a new peerage under the name of Sanders, distancing himself from the Agnes lineage. Encounters with figures like the Assassin Queen, whose past injuries he helped heal, and the formation of a loyal force within the palace have added to his achievements. Yet, Joshua's focus remains on Kaiser Van Britten, whose influence he aimed to dismantle but ultimately failed. However, Joshua's investigation uncovered a mysterious third power protecting Kaiser, a revelation absent in his previous life. The rise of the seemingly powerless fourth prince to emperor through cunning strategies remains a perplexing anomaly to Joshua. Joshua contemplates the fact that he had no awareness in his past life of the individual who exposed him to enemy lines. With the moon door situated in Rian Hearth, he realizes the urgency of familiarizing himself with all the changes that have occurred. He understands that lurking threats may be concealed in the shadows, unbeknownst to him. Meanwhile, in the Hubalt Empire, Christian, the paladin revered throughout the realm, engages in prayer. Jean Sebastian, one of the esteemed nine stars and a master of the empire, approaches him. Sebastian imparts words of caution to Christian urging him to prioritize his safety. He reassures Christian of his unparalleled strength, acknowledging that few, aside from the nine stars or the elite superhumans, pose a threat to him. Grateful for Sebastian's guidance, Christian attributes his prowess to Sebastian's teachings. However, Sebastian emphasizes the need for extra vigilance should Christian encounter the Knight of Providence, Euravis. Sebastian warns Christian about Euravis's unique abilities, revealing that even the magic tower keeps a vigilant watch over him. Christian assures Sebastian that he has no intention of meddling in the conflicts between the Swallow Empire and the Thran Principality. Sebastian acknowledges Christian's stance, but informs him about the master battle scheduled in Reinhardt and offers to arrange transportation for him. Christian, however, reveals his plan to visit the border before heading to Reinhardt. Sebastian inquires if Christian means the Avalon territory, to which Christian confirms. Despite the dangers, Christian feels compelled to investigate rumors of a lich's appearance there. He believes it's his duty as a knight to confirm such reports, even amidst the significance of the master battle. Sebastian is taken aback by the mention of a lich, recognizing them as powerful mages whose bodies deteriorate over time due to their obsession with magical research. In solemn tones, 
Christian elaborates on the sinister nature of liches, explaining that they offer their souls to become undead through the dark arts of black magic. Such beings, categorized as undead and practitioners of black magic, are deemed enemies of the continent irrespective of their nationality. Christian reveals that this insight comes directly from Archpriest Harold, whom he considers a highly reliable source. Sebastian, intrigued and concerned by this revelation, presses Christian for details regarding the Lich's whereabouts. Christian discloses that the Lich is said to dwell at the eastern edge of Avalon, specifically within the Trifia district. The scene transitions to the Pontier territory, where Cain and Icarus are preparing to depart. Cheryl enters, her expression troubled, and informs them of a complication. The Cromwell family has also sought assistance from the Magic Tower. Confused, Kane seeks clarification from Cheryl, who explains that they are unable to utilize the Warp Gate. With no alternative, the Pontier family must traverse the mountains directly. Next, the scene shifts to the capital Accardi's Warp Gate. An elder mage addresses Joshua, informing him that there is no direct Warp Gate connecting Reinhardt and Accardi. Instead, the mage will warp Joshua to Highbury Castle in the Trembling Duchy, the closest point to Reinhardt. The elder mage maintained his intense stare at Joshua, prompting Joshua to finally inquire if there was something on his face. He suddenly apologizes, revealing that Joshua reminds him of a talented young mage from his past. The elder mage shares with Joshua the tale of a young mage who, like Joshua, showed natural talent in a particular field of magic. Unfortunately, an unfortunate incident befell this young mage, leaving behind a mystery that has remained unsolved for the past five years. Surprisingly, the Magic Tower is also participating in Reinhardt's master battle, seeking clues they have long been unable to uncover. Joshua is taken aback by this revelation, prompting the elder mage to remark that he may have said too much before transporting Joshua to Highbury Castle. Upon arrival at the Tremblin Duchy's Highbury Castle through the Warp Gate, Joshua ponders whether the Magic Tower is still searching for Jack's therapies. Considering that Bronto vanished alongside Jack, Joshua finds it reasonable. Soon, Count Highbury greets Joshua, expressing surprise at the Lord himself receiving Joshua. Count Highbury reveals that it's at the behest of His Majesty, who issued an imperial order for corresponding families to extend generous hospitality to Baron Joshua Sanders, the pride of the Empire, as he heads to Reinhardt. Joshua harbors a sense of unease, suspecting that Emperor Marcus lacks confidence in him, evident by the widespread dissemination of information about his whereabouts. Aware of the heightened exposure of his movements, Joshua realizes the potential risks involved. Count Highbury suggests they proceed inside the castle instead of lingering outside. Joshua appreciates the gesture, but explains he has urgent matters to attend to first. Count Highbury insists that it's Emperor's order expressing his desire to at least treat Joshua to a meal as a gesture of hospitality. However, Joshua politely declines, apologizing as he emphasizes the pressing nature of his current obligations. He promises to visit Highbury Castle by dinner time. Curious, Count Highbury inquires about Joshua's immediate destination. Joshua reveals his intention to visit the mercenary guild. Meanwhile, in a secluded cave, a masked man converses with another expressing surprise at the former's return to Emperor Marcus alive despite the failure of their plan in Swallow. Masked Man 2 remarks on the apparent favor Masked Man 1 holds with His Majesty, implying that there must be a significant agreement between them. Without needing to hear the specifics, Masked Man 2 speculates that Masked Man 1 plans to dismantle the Agnes family using Babel's influence. This strategy would remove Duke Agnes, the main obstacle to Emperor Marcus's advance against Swallow. Anticipating a new opportunity arising from this plan, Masked Man 2 offers his assistance within the Imperial Palace. He assures Masked Man 1 of his unwavering support to the best of his abilities and encourages Masked Man 1 to reach out whenever needed. However, Masked Man 1 maintains his independence, affirming that he will never become Masked Man 2's subordinate. Despite abandoning his country, Masked Man 1 retains a shred of pride refusing to subordinate himself to another. Masked Man 2 proposes a different dynamic, suggesting that instead of Masked Man 1 becoming an underling, they should consider each other as comrades. Masked Man 1, however, expresses concern for Masked Man 2's father's safety. 
Masked Man 2 dismisses this worry, explaining that Emperor, consumed by his thirst for war, has never taken Masked Man 2's father into consideration. Assuring Masked Man 1 that his offer of assistance remains steadfast, Masked Man 2 extends a standing invitation. As the conversation unfolds, we learn that Masked Man 1 is Draxia Belgrace, and he acknowledges Masked Man 2's remarkable abilities, especially considering his young age. We then discover that Masked Man 2 is none other than Kaiser Van Britten. The convergence of these two figures, whose actions in Joshua's past life led to his demise, marks the beginning of their clandestine meeting. The scene shifts to the Hybri Mercenary Guild, where Joshua queries the receptionist, Aiden, about his inability to obtain a silver plaque. Aiden explains that Joshua must first complete a hundred two-star requests and earn a bronze plaque. Joshua affirms his understanding of the requirements, setting the stage for his journey within the guild. Before delving into his tasks, Joshua seeks a swift path to obtaining the silver plaque. Aiden, the receptionist, responds by questioning why he should grant Joshua, a noble of Avalon, a plaque without knowledge of Joshua's intentions. Joshua challenges this practice, questioning when the mercenary guild began scrutinizing recipients' intentions for plaques. He demands to know how Aiden perceives him. In response, Aiden identifies Joshua as Baron Joshua Sanders, renowned across the continent for his exceptional talents. Aiden suggests that most requests would be effortless for someone of Joshua's caliber, given the rumors surrounding him. Perplexed, Joshua questions why Aiden denies him the silver plaque despite acknowledging his capabilities. Aiden admits to lacking trust in Joshua, prompting Joshua to assert that mercenaries simply offer their skills in exchange for payment. Joshua admonishes Aiden, urging him not to disregard the principles laid down by the founding mercenary king, Deus Dembaba. Perplexed, Aiden questions Joshua's sudden reference to history. Joshua emphasizes that mercenaries operate solely on contractual agreements and requests, without being bound by anything beyond these reward-based relationships. He asserts his desire to provide his services in exchange for appropriate compensation, questioning what more reason Aiden could possibly need. Acknowledging Joshua's perspective, Aiden agrees to provide a request that would enable Joshua to earn a silver plaque. Delighted by this news, Joshua assures Aiden that he will execute the task flawlessly, regardless of its nature. However, Aiden reveals that the difficulty level of the request he intends to assign Joshua is a daunting five stars. Joshua is taken aback by this revelation, realizing that such tasks are as challenging as searching the dragon lairs. Aiden reassures Joshua, explaining that the request is a straightforward relief supply transport with some scouting involved. He inquires if Joshua is willing to undertake the task. Although Joshua finds it odd that a seemingly simple scouting mission is ranked as a five-star request, he agrees to accept it. Curious about the departure time, Joshua queries Aiden, who informs him that he will be leaving immediately for the Trifia district in the east, formerly part of the Rubrica County. The specific instructions are detailed in the scroll Aiden hands to Joshua, urging him to thoroughly review them. Before Joshua sets off, Aiden entrusts him with the task and addresses him as Baron Joshua Sanders. However, Joshua asserts his new identity as a mercenary named Ash. Aiden expresses admiration for Joshua's chosen mercenary name, prompting Joshua to caution against using the five-star request as a test without adequate compensation. Upon hearing this, Aiden queries Joshua if there's a specific reward he desires. Joshua responds by expressing his hope for a reward that matches the difficulty level of the five-star task. He assures Aiden that he will reveal his desired reward upon successfully completing the request.